When Theresa May uh, stood down, she she uh, got quite emotional. She didn't have a big crowd of people, but Boris Johnson likes to perform to a crowd. So this is slightly different to have such a big band of MPs and then his staff there. I haven't seen Harry Johnson, his wife. It might be that, as uh, other partners have done in the past, uh, she comes out and stands behind him. Uh, let's see, I, I, I imagine we will see it today, but we have to see they came back to number 10 last night. Thank you. Thank well. Well, this is this is it, folks. Thank you, everybody, for coming out so early this morning. In only a couple of hours, I will be in Balmoral to see Her Majesty the Queen, and the torch will finally be passed to a new Conservative leader. The baton will be handed over in what has unexpectedly turned out to be a relay race. They changed the rules halfway through, but never mind that now. And through that lacquered black door, a new Prime Minister will shortly go to meet a fantastic group of public servants. The people who got Brexit done. The people who delivered the fastest vaccine rollout in Europe and never forget. 70% of the entire population got a dose within six months faster than any comparable country. That is government for you. That's this Conservative government. People who organised those prompt early supplies of weapons to the heroic Ukrainian armed forces, an action that may very well have helped change the course of the biggest European war for 80 years. And because of the speed and urgency of what you did, everybody involved in this government, to get this economy moving again from July last year, in spite of all the opposition, all the naysayers, we have and will continue to have that economic strength to give people the cash they need to get through this energy crisis that has been caused by Putin's vicious war. And I know that Liz, Truss, and this compassionate Conservative government will do everything we can to get people through this crisis, and this country will endure it, and we will win. And if Putin thinks that he can succeed by blackmailing or bullying the British people, then he is utterly deluded. And the reason we will have those funds now and in the future is because we Conservatives understand the vital symmetry between government action and free market capitalist private sector enterprise. We're delivering on those huge manifesto commitments, making streets safer, neighbourhood crime down 38% in the last three years, 13,790 more police on the streets, building more hospitals, and yes, we will have 50,000 more nurses by the end of the decade, and 40 more hospitals by the end of, 50,000 nurses by the end of this parliament, I should say, 40 new hospitals by the end of the decade, putting record funding into our schools and into teachers' pay, giving everybody over 18 a lifetime skills guarantee so they can keep upskilling throughout their lives, three new high-speed rail lines, three including Northern Powerhouse Rail, colossal road pro programs from the Pennines uh, to Cornwall, the rollout of gigabit broadband up over the last three years, I am proud to say, since you were kind enough to elect me from 7% of our country's premises having gigabit broadband to 70% today. And we are, of course, providing the short and the long-term solutions for our energy needs, and not just using more of our own domestic hydrocarbons, but going up by 2030 to 50 gigawatts of wind power. That is half our, this country's energy electricity needs from offshore wind alone. A new nuclear reactor every year. And looking at what is happening in this country, the changes that are taking place, that is why private sector investment is flooding in. More private sector, more venture capital investment than China itself. More billion pound tech companies sprouting here in the UK than in France, Germany, and Israel combined. And as a result, unemployment, as I leave office, unemployment down to lows not seen since I was about 10 years old and bouncing around on a space hopper, my friends. And on, on the subject of, 
on the subject of bouncing around in future careers. Let me say that I am now like one of those booster rockets that has fulfilled its function and I will now be gently re-entering the atmosphere and splashing down invisibly in some remote and obscure corner of the Pacific. And like Cincinnatus, I am returning to my plough. And I will be offering this government nothing but the most fervent support. This is, I'll tell you why, this is a tough time for the economy. This is a tough time for families up and down the country. We can and we will get through it and we will come out stronger the other side. But I say to my fellow Conservatives, it's time for politics to be over, folks. It's time for us all to get behind Liz Truss and her team and her programme and deliver for the people of this country. Because that is what the people of this country want, that's what they need, and that's what they deserve. I'm proud to have discharged the promises I made to my party when uh, you were kind enough to choose me. Winning the biggest majority since 1987, the biggest share of the vote since 1979. Delivering Brexit, delivering our manifesto commitments, including, by the way, including social care, reforming social care, helping people up and down the country, ensuring that Britain is once again standing tall in the world, speaking with clarity and authority from Ukraine to the AUKUS pact with America and Australia, because we are one whole and entire united kingdom whose diplomats, security services and armed forces are so globally admired. And by the way, as I, believe, I, as I leave, I believe our union is so strong that those who want to break it up, they'll keep trying, but they will never, ever succeed. Thank you to everybody behind me in this building. Thank you to all of you in government. Uh, thank you to everybody who's helped look after me and my family over the last three years, including, including Dylan, the dog. And I just say to my party of Dylan and Larry, can put behind them their occasional difficulties, then so can the Conservative Party. Above all, thanks to you, the British people, to the voters for giving me the chance to serve, all of you who worked so tirelessly together to beat COVID, to put us where we are today. Together, we have laid foundations that will stand the test of time, whether by taking back control of our laws or putting in vital new infrastructure. Great, solid masonry on which we will continue to build together. Paving, paving the path of prosperity now and for future generations. And I will be supporting Liz Truss and the new government every step of the way. Thank you all very much. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. So Boris Johnson there uh, with Harry, his wife, uh, he has made the speech, he's uh, said farewell uh, to his uh, parliamentary and political back. As you can see, Ben Wallace, big applause and cheers, and he's got into the car, uh, and that is it. There you can see them. Uh, the children not there, they're, they're small, toddler and, and baby, Romy, yes, less than a year old, uh, and that's it, the end of the Boris Johnson regime, Gene, he and Harry Johnson in the car to see the Queen. Fulsome applause in the street, in Downing Street, from his uh, parliamentary, his political supporters, his allies, his sister, Rachel Johnson, Nadine. There's sadness here, uh, there's uh, hugs, uh, and that's it. Boris Johnson is leaving Downing Street uh, for the final time 
as Prime Minister. We'll come on to what you said in a moment, Beth, but just reflecting, it's a remarkably human moment, isn't it? Looking around, you saw some faces that were really, really upset and, and hurt by, by what they were facing, sadness. Yeah, genuine sadness, and actually, I, I, I mean, Jacob Rees-Mogg, I could see him out in the distance. He looked upset. I mean, a lot of people here upset. Boris Johnson did command fierce loyalty from those who supported him, and you saw that in the way that they defended him, some of his cabinet, uh, to the very end. But it is over. And what it was, a, I, I would say, a, a, a classic Boris Johnson mm -hmm. speech there. Uh, there was a serious message injected uh, with humour at the end where he talked about if you can unite Dylan the dog and uh, Larry the cat, uh, the two uh, pets, actually Larry's just um, emerged from Downing Street there, uh, then you can unite the Conservative parties. He called for colleagues uh, to come together. As I thought, he went through his greatest hits. Mm -hmm. You just heard that. He talked about the vaccine rollout. He talked about the war in Ukraine and, and Britain's role in leading uh, the world and its responses. He talked about, you know, he got applause uh, for some of that, but also you could sense the bitterness in the beginning of that speech, done in a very Johnson way. Uh, but when he talked about, it was a relay race, he said, and the rules halfway through changed. And but that... We raised our eyebrows at that we moment. We did, because it was almost... It, it's a reflection of, I won a confidence vote. You remember, there was a confidence vote, which he won, mm -hmm. and still uh, the party wanted him out, uh, and then that precipitated the resignations and the threat of a second confidence vote. And he, to the very end, thought he could fight on, and it was only when his closest political allies said, you'll either uh, get forced out by Cabinet and colleagues or you will face another confidence vote and get forced out that he knew the game was up. But a little swipe there, really, at a parliamentary party that forced him out of office when he certainly didn't want to go. What did he say about the energy crisis? Because that is what the country really care about at the moment. He said that the government will give people the cash they need to get through the energy crisis. Uh, and he said... Uh, if Putin thinks he can succeed, uh, he, against the British people, they are utterly deluded. Echo in that sense that he gave last week about urging the public uh, to stick with it, uh, that the price worth paying is worth it for the freedom of Ukraine. But, of course, when people are facing such crippling energy deals, worried about their own livelihoods and their own families, uh, expecting action on that. Um, what did he say about party unity? He said it's time for politics to be over, and he said, it's time to get behind Liz Truss and her programme and deliver for the country. And the issue about the programme is actually the difference in economic approach of the Sunak camp versus the Truss camp. It's going to be a big issue over the autumn as she does record levels of borrowing, potentially, in order to fund first uh, energy price freezes in some form, potentially. And then those promised tax cuts. Yeah. And what does it do to the markets? You've seen the pound devaluing now at near three-decade lows as investors get nervous about the economic credibility of the UK. She has a hell of a job on her hands, both to reassure the public and investors in these first few days. We expect the energy packet by, package potentially Thursday by the end of the week. Yeah, and Beth, as you say, it seems classically Johnsonian in, in his speech. Some laughs for some people and a, and a serious message as well. But I, I think it's worth reflecting as the street starts to clear because, you know, Boris Johnson and, the, and his wife Carrie have now left on their way to see the Queen at Balmoral. Reflecting on his legacy, reflecting on uh, the country that he will leave after three, year, three and a bit years in office. Boris Johnson has been one of the shortest serving prime ministers in modern history, which given that he won, as he said himself, the biggest electoral majority since the days of Margaret Thatcher, uh, you expected him to have a long run at the premiership. We expected, I remember talking about it on the night he won that election, that he had won the power to reshape this country with a majority uh, that David Cameron nor Theresa May never enjoyed when they were prime ministers. He had it within his power to really change the country. And in, a, in the end, as I said, you know, at the time, in the end, it was his own mistakes, missteps that brought himself down, that brought to an end uh, to his reign, but he is a consequential prime minister. 
it might have been a short tenureship, but it was so impactful in terms of Brexit. He delivered one of the biggest economic and political changes to this country this century, uh, the ramifications of which will last for decades to come. He then had to handle a pandemic and deliver the vaccine rollout. He then was hospitalised himself, uh, nearly put into intensive care, potentially. Uh, he managed to stay off a ventilator, but he was very ill, gravely ill at that time. Um, and I think when history looks back on him, uh, the fact that he was the man that campaigned for Brexit and then delivered it, it makes him a consequential uh, Prime Minister, despite all the flaws that eventually drove him out of office. Yeah, consequential can have a, a double meaning, kind of. So, I Beth, really appreciate that analysis. Thank you so much for that. Uh, let's get more reaction, of course, to what we've heard from the outgoing Prime Minister. Now, joining me is the Conservative MP and Chair of the Defence Select Committee. That's Tobias Elwood. Good morning, uh, Tobias Elwood. Thank you so much for being with us this morning as we look at pictures of Boris Johnson's Range Rover departing Downing Street for the final time. What are uh, your reflections on what you just heard? Yeah, it's certainly an emotional day. I think you've got to bear in mind many MPs that were there uh, were reliant on Boris Johnson and his energy to get elected. But we enter a new chapter. It isn't just in the interest of the party, of the government, to show unity. I would argue it's actually in the interest of the nation as well, given the scale of challenges that you've been speaking about. The cost of living crisis is arguably as crippling, if not more, than COVID. It's going to require some smart intervention by government to support businesses, pubs and restaurants and so forth, as well as households. We all need to give the space to this prime minister to provide some of those solutions. There won't be another prime minister, let's hope not, until the next general election. Uh, it's then up to us to make sure we provide a short-term solution to get us through this difficult winter, a longer-term strategy to make sure we don't repeat this and that we can see the economy uh, grow. And then it'll be up to the electorate in 2024 to recognise whether we've answered those solutions, whether we move the country forward or whether we've been buried by them. And we'll come on to what Liz Truss may well be doing, but let's just stay uh, a little moment longer, if we can, with what we heard from, from Boris Johnson. I mean, did you get a sense from that speech that that's the, the final time we've seen Boris Johnson in frontline uh, politics? Um, I think we uh, see him recognising straight away that we have to unify behind uh, Liz Truss. There's absolutely, that is the, the prerogative. I don't think it'd be helpful for him to comment from the sidelines. Um, I think it's very, very important that uh, he recognise that Liz Truss needs to be given the space to provide the authority, the command, the leadership that we want to see around the cabinet table uh, to deal with these big challenges that you and I and, and all of us have been discussing and everybody is so aware of. In fact, that we've been delayed, you know, had a summer of delay because of that leadership contest which only focused perhaps on the minute issues uh, rather than the bigger picture, simply because of the nature of the contest itself. And now you will have seen the reporting this morning, Mr. Elwood, about the, the size of the package being considered by the Prime Minister. Your feelings on that, is that going to be sufficient? I mean, that may well, some people see, be uh, an undervalued amount. It's £100 billion. Yes, it is. It's a huge economic uh, intervention. Uh, I, you know, I, I dismissed perhaps the, the, uh, the loss of the summer, but clearly teams under Nadim Sahawi and others have been looking at the various options for the new prime minister to now consider and understand that we will get some major announcements this week, not a moment too soon. I think the country will welcome that. But if I can just link that to what uh, the outgoing prime minister also focused on, our armed forces and indeed Ukraine. And the prime minister, the, the former prime minister, Boris Johnson, can be commended for what Britain has done to support that country. But I make it very, very clear this didn't come up in the leadership contest. You know, our world will continue to become more dangerous, not less. You know, the, the West remains too risk averse in standing up to Putin and his uh, uh, agenda. Many of the challenges, oil, gas, indeed food prices, because the grain can't get out of Odessa, uh, will remain or indeed get worse. It requires international leadership. It requires countries to come together, NATO to be a bit more assertive if we're going to change the direction of travel, what Putin is trying to achieve. That is something that I hope that we will now focus on. OK, Tobias Elwood, Chair of the Defence Select Committee. Appreciate your thoughts this morning. Thank you very much for being with us.
All right, now, as I said, down the street has started to clear out Boris Johnson, has left on his way to Balmoral to see the Queen to officially tender his resignation. But speculation is swirling about the makeup of Liz Truss's cabinet as she deals with multiple crises while trying to restore unity to her Conservative Party after what has been a long, bruising and bitter leadership race. Well, joining me now is the former head of the civil service, that's Lord Kerslake. Uh, Lord Kerslake, good morning to you and thank you for being with us. Uh, before I talk to you about the processes that uh, will be coming into place once Liz Truss assumes office, just reflect, if you can, on, on what you heard from Boris Johnson. Well, it was a typically uh, upbeat speech from Boris. Uh, he rightly, I guess, wanted to make the most of what he felt he had achieved in office. But we can't deny the fact that we have major challenges and those challenges are going to be inherited by a successor, Liz Trust. So the kind of speech you would always expect to see from Boris, he must reflect, I guess, that given his huge majority and uh, the achievement of Brexit, he might have achieved more. But we are where we are, uh, we move on, and now Liz Trust has to pick up some very, very big issues. Yeah, she certainly does. And where does she begin? You will have seen the report this morning about that huge package that's being uh, proposed. Um, I'll get your thoughts on it, if, if you don't mind, uh, Lord Kerslake. I mean, what? do you think that seems to be enough? £100 billion pounds being proposed to try and help households and potentially businesses? Well, look, uh, it's absolutely right that the immediate priority is the question of the cost of living and the cost of fuel. It's clear that the war in Ukraine is going to, I'm afraid, drag on. Prices are going to remain sky high as far as particularly gas is concerned. And there's no question that urgent action is needed. Time's really been lost over the summer. Uh, it's hard to say whether 100 billion will be enough, and we don't yet know the details of this package. What I think is clear is that there has to be some way of containing the price increase, both for ordinary people, if you like, and for businesses. If we don't do that, then I think the consequences as we move into the winter are going to be catastrophic. The price is high, but the consequences of not doing something of this scale, I think, are, are, are literally unacceptable. Uh, Lord Kerslake, you mentioned there's two months that you described as, as time lost, time wasted, that uh, some may feel for um, trying to deal with this crisis. But in your uh, former role as head of the civil service, how much work will have already been going on to make sure that uh, whoever assumed office, and now we know, of course, it's going to be Liz Truss, has got all the details, all the plans in place so they can start being implemented immediately? I'd say time lost uh, for other people to judge whether it was wasted, but it undoubtedly was time lost. And... Yes, a huge amount of work will have been done to prepare the options for an incoming government. And indeed, the business of government on the day-to-day -day, uh, issues carried on. The problem here was that there was a very fundamental difference of view between the two competing candidates, uh, Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss, about the right way forward. And in that situation, you had to wait until the winner was known before you could move. But yes, there will be a lot of detailed calculations of different options uh, having been prepared. And the conversations will have happened with uh, the people who are likely to take up key roles. We've known for a little while that Kwasi Kwarteng is almost certainly going to be the new Chancellor of the Exchequer uh, and so on. So I think, yes, those conversations have happened, but now they've really got to move ahead, press ahead on the detail. And what I'd say to you is that the challenge for Liz Truss here is that there are very big and competing issues that she has to address here. So if she puts money into tackling the fuel issue, that in turn impacts on the public finances. Okay. Uh, and at the same time, she's got the issue of the tax cut and what that does, and the NHS and the need for more funding there, particularly for care. I'm afraid I didn't agree with Boris Johnson that he sorted social care. He hasn't. There are major challenges still there to be addressed. OK, Lord Curzley, I do appreciate your expertise this morning. Thank you very much for being with us. Let's bring back in our political editor, Beth Rigby, who's still with us. So, Bob Curzley, they're laying out just the challenges facing uh, Liz Truss, of course. Uh, we've heard Boris Johnson's farewell speech. He is now gone, so look ahead to us. What we are going to expect to happen in the next hours. Yeah. Well, the key thing, clearly, is the energy crisis, people's bills, both families and 
businesses and what will she do about that? We could hear as early as Thursday what the plan is. She has quasi Kwantan, currently the business secretary, to become the chancellor, working on this along with Nadim Zahari, currently the chancellor. It's expected that he will move to the cabinet office. So her key lieutenants are in government already working on the plan. What might it look like? Look, the details are still being worked out, but it's fair to say that it will be, to quote one of my uh, sources in the Trust Camp, a shock and all moment. A big and bold plan is how Penny Morden, who's also expected to go into Cabinet, put it. What might it look like? Well, Labour have promised an energy price freeze, freeze in household bills at the levels set, the cap set in April 2022. Uh, will they freeze uh, bills in October 2022? Uh, it will cost, the IFS expects, about £38 billion. She might also decide uh, to freeze the wholesale price of energy and gas. That will help business as well. Look, in the round, we don't know the detail. What we do know is it's going to be a multi-billion pound package uh, and it will be a big, bold moment and it could define whether she succeeds or fails in these early months as Prime Minister. We've well, got about 40 seconds left, Beth. So just give us your final reflections on Boris Johnson after what we've heard this morning. He's on his way to see the Queen's safe. On Goodbye. the way to see the Queen, a, a politician who was full of potential that he never quite realised. Uh, clear disappointment there, anger a bit that he's been pushed out of office. He says he's going to go and land in a remote corner of the Pacific, but let's see what he does next. He is loved, he is loathed, uh, but he will go down in history as the Prime Minister that delivered Brexit, and that is quite a legacy. Okay, uh, Beth, uh, thank you so much for that analysis. As we look at these pictures of Boris Johnson and his wife, Carrie Johnson, saying goodbye to the assembled Conservative MPs who came to say their farewell. Boris Johnson is on his way to see the Queen. Plenty more throughout the morning here on Sky News Breakfast. Stay with us. I'm Yvan Bourgnon, I'm a sailor. I spent uh, half time of my life on, on, the, on the sea. We have a factory who can convert this plastic to energy. And so after, at the end, we can minimize the footprint carbon of the boat.
Hello and good morning. It is 8 a.m. That's it, folks. The words of Boris Johnson a short time ago here on Downing Street giving his farewell speech to the nation after leaving number 10. He called on the Conservative Party to get behind his successor, Liz Truss, and is now on his way to Scotland to officially tender his resignation to the Queen. Thank you. Thank you. Well, well this, is, this is it, folks. Thank you, everybody, for coming out so early this morning. In only a couple of hours, I will be in Balmoral to see Her Majesty the Queen. And the torch will finally be passed to a new Conservative leader. The baton will be handed over in what has unexpectedly turned out to be a relay race. They changed the rules halfway through, but never mind that now. And through that lacquered black door, a new Prime Minister will shortly go to meet a fantastic group of public servants. The people who got Brexit done. The people who delivered the fastest vaccine rollout in Europe and never forget. 70% of the entire population got a dose within six months faster than any comparable country. That is government for you. That's this Conservative government. People who organised those prompt early supplies of weapons to the heroic Ukrainian armed forces, an action that may very well have helped change the course of the biggest European war for 80 years. And because of the speed and urgency of what you did, everybody involved in this government, to get this economy moving again from July last year, in spite of all the opposition, all the naysayers, we have and will continue to have that economic strength to give people the cash they need to get through this energy crisis that has been caused by Putin's vicious war. And I know that Liz, Truss, and this compassionate Conservative government will do everything we can to get people through this crisis, and this country will endure it, and we will win. And if Putin thinks that he can succeed by blackmailing or bullying the British people, then he is utterly deluded. And the reason we will have those funds now and in the future is because we Conservatives understand the vital symmetry between government action and free market capitalist private sector enterprise. We're delivering on those huge manifesto commitments, making streets safer, neighbourhood crime down 38% in the last three years, 13,790 more police on the streets, building more hospitals, and yes, we will have 50,000 more nurses by the end of the decade, and 40 more hospitals by the end of, 50,000 nurses by the end of this parliament, I should say, 40 new hospitals by the end of the decade, putting record funding into our schools and into teachers' pay, giving everybody over 18 a lifetime skills guarantee so they can keep upskilling throughout their lives, three new high-speed rail lines, three including Northern Powerhouse Rail, colossal road programmes from the Pennines uh, to Cornwall, the rollout of gigabit broadband up over the last three years, I am proud to say, since you were kind enough to elect me from 7% of our country's premises having gigabit broadband to 70% today. And we are, of course, providing the short and the long-term solutions for our energy needs, and not just using more of our own domestic hydrocarbons, but going up by 2030 to 50 gigawatts of wind power. That is half our, this country's energy electricity needs from offshore wind alone. A new nuclear reactor every year. And looking at what is happening in this country, the changes that are taking place, that is why private sector investment is flooding in. More private sector, more venture capital investment than China itself. More billion pound tech companies sprouting here in the UK than in France, Germany, and Israel combined. And as a result, unemployment, as I leave office, unemployment down to lows not seen since I was about 10 years old and bouncing around on a space hopper, my friends. And on, on, the, subject of, on the subject of bouncing around in future careers, let me say that I am now like one of those booster rockets that has fulfilled its function 
and I will now be gently re-entering the atmosphere and splashing down invisibly in some remote and obscure corner of the Pacific. And like Cincinnatus, I am returning to my plough. And I will be offering this government nothing but the most fervent support. This is, I'll tell you why, this is a tough time for the economy. This is a tough time for families up and down the country. We can and we will get through it and we will come out stronger the other side. But I say to my fellow Conservatives, it's time for politics to be over, folks. It's time for us all to get behind Liz Truss and her team and her programme and deliver for the people of this country. Because that is what the people of this country want, that's what they need, and that's what they deserve. I'm proud to have discharged the promises I made to my party when uh, you were kind enough to choose me. Winning the biggest majority since 1987, the biggest share of the vote since 1979. Delivering Brexit, delivering our manifesto commitments, including, by the way, including social care, reforming social care, helping people up and down the country, ensuring that Britain is once again standing tall in the world. Speaking with clarity and authority from Ukraine to the AUKUS pact with America and Australia. Because we are one whole and entire United Kingdom whose diplomats, security services and armed forces are so globally admired. And by the way, as I, believe, I, as I leave, I believe our union is so strong that those who want to break it up, they'll keep trying, but they will never, ever succeed. Thank you to everybody behind me in this building. Thank you to all of you in government. Uh, thank you to everybody who's helped look after me and my family over the last three years, including, including Dylan, the dog. And I just say to my party, if Dylan and Larry can put behind them their occasional difficulties, then so can the Conservative Party. Above all, thanks to you, the British people, to the voters for giving me the chance to serve, all of you who worked so tirelessly together to beat COVID, to put us where we are today. Together, we have laid foundations that will stand the test of time, whether by taking back control of our laws or putting in vital new infrastructure. Great, solid masonry on which we will continue to build together, paving, paving the path of prosperity now and for future generations. And I will be supporting Liz Truss and the new government every step of the way. Thank you all very much. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. So there we have it. In the last uh, 40 minutes or so, Boris Johnson delivering his farewell message to the nation, comparing himself to a uh, booster rocket that was now going to come down somewhere in the Pacific. But there was some more sort of highbrow uh, descriptions that he used about himself as well. Yeah, it was, it was, for me, a vintage Johnson speech there. It had jibes, it had jokes. There was an element of seriousness uh, in it. There was also a sense of uh, self-congratulation in what he had achieved, and quite typical of Boris Johnson, not much acknowledgement of things he might have got wrong. It's been a characteristic of his leadership ever since I have followed him uh, from that Brexit referendum in to number 10. In terms of uh, the legacy, the Boris Johnson legacy, uh, he talked about COVID, the vaccine rollout. He talked about the role of the UK in Ukraine and it was something that he certainly feels that he led the world on and actually has been acknowledged by President Zelensky as one of uh, Ukraine's closest allies. And then, of course, he talked about Brexit. Now, on the politics, there was a clear dig there saying that uh, people had changed the rules and uh, he was forced out of office. That the, the anger he feels and the injustice of being forced out of office, there is still pretty plain mm. to see. No acknowledgement of mistakes that he made and his own conduct uh, that contributed to the building scandal that eventually tipped so many of his supporters, his own backbenchers, his own cabinet, over the edge to force him out. But no acknowledgement there of that. What he did say was it's time to put the politics behind us and get behind Liz 
trust. And on that as well, he talked about energy bills, trying to assure the public that there will be, as he put it, cash in their pockets mm -hmm. uh, to help on bills. We should hear about that potentially on Thursday. And then just finally a bit on his future. He talked about Cincinnati, uh, who was a, a Roman statesman who uh, helped the empire and then went back to his plough. Uh, he taught, he described himself as that, but will he make a return? That is the thing that is still hanging in the air when it comes uh, to Boris Johnson. Finally, he thanked his family. He lended with that joke, didn't he, that if Dylan, his dog, and Larry, uh, the cat, can get along, so should the Conservative Party. And with that, uh, he was off into a band of supporters. He's always been the politician that wants to show his party that he is the man that can connect when he's on his best form uh, to parts of the electorate that others can't. But despite the support down there, uh, the party did not want him anymore, and he ends his reign as Prime Minister, one of the shortest serving uh, Prime Ministers in modern history. He had it in his gift uh, to be one of the most consequential of this decade. Beth, really appreciate that analysis. Thank you so much for that. All right. Um, well, the thoughts of Beth will be there, as I said, just uh, 40 minutes after hearing from Boris Johnson. Let's bring in now the deputy leader of the Labour Party. That's Angela Rayner. Uh, Angela Rayner, good morning to you. Thank you very much for being with us. So you will have listened to Boris Johnson's speech there. And I do wonder, have you just lost your most uh, potent electoral asset now Boris Johnson's out of office? I mean, it was a classic Boris Johnson speech, completely deluded about what's happened over the last couple of years and the crisis that people are facing. High tax under the Conservatives, under Boris Johnson, the highest tax rate for decades, high inflation, lower living standards, businesses that are facing absolute bankruptcy because of the situation on business rates, done nothing on that, done nothing to support UK industry. And I just felt that there was no acknowledgement of how the scandal and sleaze that has engulfed his party and his government over the last couple of years, whether that was him supporting the scandal around Owen Patson, supporting Chris Pincher with the situation with sexual harassment, whether that was the absolute billions of pounds that was wasted on money that was given to mates um, through the global pandemic, and, of course, the partying that happened when the UK public were told that they had to go into lockdown and had to follow the rules. I think it was completely deluded and it stunk of all the hallmarks of somebody who's had a privileged background who thinks that they can just do what they like. I mean, Angela Ren, you made that very clear as to how you felt about it. You didn't actually answer my question because now that he is gone, after all of those scandals that you laid out, you've got Liz Truss to face, who's already perhaps got a proposal that goes way beyond the Labour Party's plan to deal with the energy crisis that we're facing. Well, I've not seen any proposal that goes beyond Labour's plan. Labour's been calling for a freeze on the energy bills and that we've said it should be paid for by a windfall tax on oil and gas companies. Liz Truss hasn't said that. She thinks that working people should foot the bill for that. Um, she said that she would reverse the national insurance contribution rise, which she voted for. Let's be clear, Liz Truss has been part of the Cabinet and has been part of the decisions that have been made that has propped up Boris Johnson and got the country in the mess it's in now. So, yes, it's great that Boris Johnson has left. Anyone would think that he's left of his own fruition when that's clearly not true. Uh, but we've seen a Conservative Party that are behind the curve constantly on the crisis that is engulfing many people and many businesses in the UK today. And I don't think they're in touch with what's happening on the ground in the UK. They're completely deluded. The GP situation, the NHS situation, the social care situation, trying to get a passport, trying to get your driving licence, it's complete backlog because of the Conservatives have not been doing their job. Yeah, and the reporting this morning, uh, Ms Rayner, is that some £100 billion is going to be spent and that would bring in a freeze in energy bills and the reporting in uh, Conservative leading newspapers suggests that that's going to come in until 2024. Now, as you know, the Labour policy was £28 billion for only six months, so I put it to you again that the Conservatives have outflanked you on this one. 
Well, no, because we can't just, quite frankly, keep pouring money in. The Conservatives have raised the national debt. We've seen inflation at its highest rate. Labour has said that we've got to have a medium-term plan where we look at renewables, we look at home insulation, and that we boost a long-term strategy around how we deal with our energy crisis. The government have been in power for 12 years. And again, Boris Johnson talked about jam tomorrow. It was, oh, we're going to get these nuclear power stations, one every year. That's tomorrow, not tomorrow today. There's been 12 years of Conservatives where they failed to deal with these issues and now we're at a crisis point. We do have to have a long-term solution to this. Labour's put that plan forward and we can't just keep going from one crisis to the next. We have to have a long-term plan from the government about how we're going to use renewables and how we're going to insulate homes and how we're going to get these good skilled jobs into the UK so that instead of levelling down, which is what we've seen, Boris Johnson talked about rail investment Northern Rail has been scaled down. The people of Greater Manchester, the only reason we're getting um, changes to transport is because of our Labour mayor in Greater Manchester. We're making a difference on the ground. The government have levelled down and have not delivered on the promises that they made to the people of the UK. And a, a thought on the potential makeup of the, of the top team that Liz Truss is putting in place. It looks like it's going to be one of the most diverse uh, great uh, states, office, um, states of office um, in history, with not one white man in that grouping. I mean, as the Labour Party, you had the first uh, black MP. Uh, is it shameful that the Conservative Party beat you to having such a diverse cabinet? Well, I welcome diversity in politics. I've been talking about that for a very long time, both on social economic but also on ethnicity and of people from up and down the UK being involved in politics, and I think it's important that we do that. But it's also important about what people do. And Liz Truss has been part of the Cabinet that has got us into this situation in the first place. And now we need to see action to make sure that people of Britain can see real change that will help them with their living standards. Now, Liz Truss, throughout this leadership campaign, has not been talking about the issues that are really facing the people of the UK. She's been talking about tax cuts as opposed to really dealing with the cost of living crisis that businesses and households are facing at the moment. So I think it's more about what you do in government that is really important at the moment to people of the UK. But diversity is always welcome. We need more diversity in politics and in the executive boardrooms in all of our UK top companies. Right. And, and Angelina, finally then, um, you would have heard in Boris Johnson speak, he talked about uh, Liz Truss being uh, the leader uh, of the whole of the UK, but you'll know that there is, of course, that um, independence movement in Scotland, and there is reporting now that Liz Truss is going to bring in new legislation to try and make it even more difficult for the SNP to, to go for independence. I mean, democratically, how dangerous is that if new legislation is going to come in? I know that you perhaps don't support independence for Scotland, but how dangerous democratically is that new legislation going to be for that movement? I think one of the most dangerous things that we've seen in the UK, and it applies to Scotland as well as parts of England that feel left behind, is the inequality that's growing in, in the UK. And I think that is the most dangerous risk to the union at the moment, is people need to see that real investment. Not jam tomorrow, not broken promises, but investment across the United Kingdom, and that devolution so that people have more control over what's happening in their lives locally. And I think if we're able to do that, and people can see that respect is given to all parts of the UK, and opportunity is given, then I think that will solve some of these issues. But until that happens, then of course people are going to be frustrated. Just as people in the north of England have been frustrated, I can see why people in Scotland are frustrated. And the only way really we can change all of that is by changing the government and having a Labour government that are willing to invest in all parts of the UK. OK. Angela Rayner, Deputy Leader of the Labour Party, appreciate your time this morning. Thank you for being with Thank us. Thank you. Now, in a formal sense, at least, the most significant event today is going to take place some 500 miles away in Scotland at Balmoral. That is where the Queen is spending her summer holiday and where Boris Johnson is going to offer his formal resignation and recommend that Liz Truss is asked to form a new government. Now, shortly after that, the new Conservative leader will arrive for the process which is called the kissing of hands. All right, let's go to uh, outside of Balmoral now and bring in our royal correspondent, Rhiannon Mills, who's live for us. Rhiannon, good to have you with us. So what's the choreography? Boris Johnson's left here, left London. I guess he's on his way to the airport. When did you two arrive up there? 
So it's going to be a few hours before he arrives here in Scotland. And I think what is going to be particularly striking about today is usually we see the kind of ceremony, the circus of this power handover all play out where you are, that short distance between Number 10 and Buckingham Palace. And the whole process is wrapped up in less than a couple of hours. Today, it's going to be a lot more strung out and the theatre is all moving here to the, I'd say, more dramatic, certainly more remote setting uh, of the Highlands. It has to be said, for the first time, I think, both Number 10 and the Palace, both with their eyes on the sky, certainly looking at the weather forecast, which may well change the timings slightly. But while the logistics have had to change, it's all been because of the Queen and simply from a practical perspective. Last week, the decision was made. Yes, the Queen is hugely important today, but she isn't the only important person for today. And it's all been about making sure that everyone knew what plan was in place in terms of what was going to happen uh, today. As you mentioned earlier, the formalities are going to look very much the same as they are when it's all carried out at Buckingham Palace. So Boris Johnson is due to arrive here at about 10 past 11. And a lot was made, wasn't it? That first speech that he made in Downing Street where he announced that he was stepping aside. He didn't mention that word resignation. Today, though, he will formally resign in front of the Queen. Also, at that moment, he will advise that the Queen calls Liz Truss uh, to form a new administration. Of course, she is already on her way. She will be already on her way. She will then arrive for that very special first audience with the Queen, described as the kissing of hands in the court circular. No kissing involved, instead a handshake, a bow or a curtsy. And yeah, for Liz Truss, it will be the start of a very important relationship for her. Prime Minister's past and certainly into the future have described how important that relationship has been. There is only one person like the Queen that they can really open up to, share everything with, and know that all those conversations uh, are going to stay in that room. I also think in terms of the optics of today, yes, it's caused difficulties, potentially people travelling all the way here up to Scotland, but I think everyone knows that it's important that the Queen is seen to be carrying out those constitutional duties. As Boris Johnson alluded to, tough time economically, tough time for many families up and down the country, and some would say a time of political instability. And so for some up and down the country, I think the Queen continues to be that reassuring presence. And once again today, the palace ultimately being practical, being very common sense about it, saying, look, the 96-year-old monarch travelling down south just was not going to be practical. And so today we will still see her carry out that key, really important constitutional role. OK, Rhiannon in Balmoral, appreciate that. Now, what you're looking at now, viewers, is a private jet. That is... RAF Northolt, where we believe the Prime Minister is on his way to, as I say, just about 40 minutes ago. He left Downing Street in a Range Rover, flanked by outriders with his wife, Carrie Johnson. He's going to fly up to Balmoral, as uh, Rhiannon was saying, to formally tender his resignation to the Queen. This is uh, live pictures from RAF Northolt, where a private jet is awaiting to take the outgoing Prime Minister to formally resign to the Queen. The Queen will then meet. The incoming Prime Minister, she's flying up as well, but in a different plane for security reasons, and she will officially uh, become Prime Minister. Now, private jet uh, nerds will know exactly what kind of craft that is. I don't know, but uh, it looks like a fast one. And it'll be up there before lunchtime. Now, Liz Truss grew up in Leeds. Uh, let's find out a little bit about her hometown and uh, what they want to hear now from the incoming Prime Minister. Our reporter Fraser Maud is in Leeds uh, for us this morning. Fraser, good morning again to you. So as I said, uh, Liz Truss grew up in Leeds. She, she tells us a lot about her story and her uh, essentially quite normal beginnings. So what do people in Leeds uh, want to hear from the incoming Prime Minister? Yeah, good morning. This is where Liz Truss grew up from about the age of 10. She said it was a reasonably humble uh, start to her life. This is where she studied and people here are hoping that she will have an eye on the north when it comes to taking over as Prime Minister. I can have a chat with Andrew Ormond from a fantastic charity, homeless charity here in Leeds, St George's Crypt, that helps hundreds of people with a whole range of issues. What could Liz Truss do for you, could do to help the people that you help? I think it's going to be very, very difficult. I think, as you know, we're, we're in a cost of living crisis. We've just come out of a pandemic. I think there's going to be all sorts of things on her plate. But I think, as you say, have an eye on the north, have an understanding for the most vulnerable people in our society and have that compassion with her 
that she can look to us and she can look to the kinds of people that we work with and we serve and and make sure that that we don't fall into into any more poverty than we already are and that's the danger is that we're hearing a lot about fuel poverty she's promised to to tackle head on the energy cost crisis i mean that could be a big help for people couldn't it preventing people from becoming homeless in the first place and i think that's one of the biggest things i think as we were talking about i don't think that there's going to be much of a problem with funding for people who are actually homeless, but it's the people who are on the, on the line, on the poverty line, people who are entering into homelessness, people who are, are not earning that much and people who can't make their bills, people who can't make, buy their food, people who are, are in food poverty and fuel poverty. They're people who are in desperate need now and who are going to be hitting that line now. So I think it's, it's, there's, there needs to be an awful lot of focus there. Okay, well, thanks for talking to us, Andrew. I know you've got a, a busy day ahead, so uh, troubled times ahead, potentially. Uh, this trust needs to get a grip on the cost of living, needs to get a grip uh, on listening to communities like those here in Leeds. OK, Fraser, for now, thank you very much for that. Um, we're still staying with these pictures here from RAF Norfolk, where that jet is continuing to taxi on the tarmac. It will be carrying the Prime Minister and his wife Carrie up to Balmoral so he can um, officially tend his resignation to the Queen. There it is, coming through the security fence there. Boris Johnson expected in Scotland in the next couple of hours and of course once he does arrive there we'll uh, bring the very latest. Now after he has tendered his official resignation to the Queen, um, Liz Truss, the incoming Prime Minister, will also meet the Queen. There's the ceremony called Kissing of the Hands. And as we've been telling you this morning, they don't actually kiss hands. It's probably going to be a formal handshake uh, where she is officially asked to form the next government. She will then make her way back here to London, where she's expected to give her first address as Prime Minister uh, sometime this afternoon. And we're expecting her to give that address just outside number 10 if the weather remains set fair as it is this morning. All right, well, let's just... Uh, get the thoughts of uh, the Liberal Democrats as we continue to watch that plane at RF Northolt. The, the thoughts of the Lib Dems and the leader of the Lib Dems, who was, of course, listening into the Prime Minister's outgoing speech there. And I'm pleased to say we can bring in uh, Sir Ed Davey, who is joining us now live uh, for more on the final days of the Prime Minister and the new PM who is coming in. Uh, Sir Ed Davey, good morning to you and thank you very much for being with us this morning. I'll get you, first of all, if you can, just to reflect on what you heard from Boris Johnson there in his outgoing uh, speech. Well, what Boris Johnson failed to mention was our economy is in a, an MS. Um, we uh, are the lowest growth uh, projections of any industrial country bar Russia. Uh, energy bills are going through the roof. People are really worried about food prices. They're worried about the crisis in the NHS. And that's all happened under his premiership. Um, and so, you know, what Liberal Democrats are saying with the new Prime Minister is uh, we need to hear real plans. And I've been listening to Liz Truss and the Conservatives over the summer, over their leadership contest. And what alarmed me, and I think must have really worried millions of families and pensioners, um, is that she didn't seem to put forward a plan at all, uh, whether it's on the energy bills or the NHS. And um, it, either they don't get it or, or they don't care. Well, she's pivoted now, hasn't she, Sir Ed? As you'll know, the report in this morning suggests that she's preparing a package worth at least £100 billion to try and help with the energy crisis. Well, there are reports, but the ones I'm reading are, are quite worrying. Liberal Democrats argued for a freeze on the cap so people's bills wouldn't go up this autumn and that should be paid for by a one-off tax on the oil and gas companies who are making huge profits. That's our position. And what we're hearing from these reports is that she's going to announce a sort of loan system, uh, dressing it up as a freeze, but it won't be a freeze, it will be a loan and uh, families and pensioners and businesses will be asked to pay that back over the next uh, few years, uh, paying later. What Liberal Democrats say is actually, given these oil and gas giants are making tens of billions of pounds of profit, they never expected to, because President Putin invaded Russia, that we should be asking them to make a fair contribution and, and not putting it um, onto families. Uh, and as part of the reported plans of this going to be an expansion of uh, extraction of, of fossil fuels from the North Sea and also uh, perhaps um, a renewing of fracking in parts of the country? Well, there's been a lot of dishonesty about fracking. Um, the reality is that it's not going to reduce the price of gas. 
um, and it's energy bills we need to cut for people. People are struggling. We need they want to see their energy bills lower, and the way to do that um, actually is to invest in renewables and insulation. They are uh, have the potential to bring down people's energy bills because uh, electricity generated by wind and solar is so much cheaper than electricity generated by burning gas. I mean, Sir Red Davies, it's all very well and good for you to say this now, but you were part of a coalition government that stopped those new nuclear power plants being built. Uh, you're wrong, I'm afraid. Um, I was the first energy secretary in a generation to uh, announce a new nuclear power station, which is being built as we speak. And not only did I do that, but um, Liberal Democrats quadrupled renewable power. We saw a massive expansion in solar and wind and became the world's leader in offshore wind. We insulated over a million homes. The problem was in 2015, after those excellent Liberal Democrat policies, which uh, were really helping getting bills down, the Conservatives changed the policy. They didn't invest in insulating people's homes. They didn't invest properly in renewables and they haven't done anything on nuclear. So it's been the failure of the conservative energy policies that have got us into this mess. Uh, well, um, Sir Red then you must be pleased then to hear, as Boris Johnson said in this speech, that they're going to be building a new nuclear power plant every year. Uh, it's just not going to happen, unfortunately. He hasn't got any serious plans. Uh, if we want to make a difference it now and in the next few years, the best way to do that is to take on the Liberal Democrat record and build on that with uh, onshore wind, offshore wind and solar and really insulating people's homes. That is the way we can cut people's bills. That's what Liberal Democrats want. We want to cut people's bills. Uh, and unfortunately, the proposals from Boris Johnson on nuclear would put up people's bills. Nuclear actually is very, very expensive, far more expensive than wind and solar, and obviously a lot more expensive than insulating people's homes so people don't have to use the energy in the first place. So I'm really worried that the Conservative energy policy, which have been a disaster for so long, can continue to be a disaster because they're going to go after the most expensive options when what people want is much cheaper uh, energy. All right, Sir Ed Davey, leader of the Liberal Democrats, do appreciate your time this morning. Thank you for being with us. Now, Boris Johnson, as I've said, has delivered his final speech as Prime Minister, calling for the Conservative Party to get behind his successor, Ms Truss. Well, the new Conservative Party leader will take over as PM later today. She is going to meet the Queen at Balmoral at around lunchtime. Ms Truss will then address the nation in Downing Street this afternoon before appointing her first cabinet. Uh, let's bring in our political correspondent, Tamara Cohn, who's been with us throughout the morning for more on what we've seen in the past hour or so. Tamara, lovely to have you with us again. So let's just reflect a little bit on what we heard from Boris Johnson, first of all. That's all, folks, he said. It was jovial, it was never emotional. That's not the outgoing Prime Minister's style. There was the tiniest dollop of bitterness. It wasn't as bitter as the speech that we saw in July when he was obviously full of raw bitterness about how he was forced from office mm -hmm. by resignations from within his party. He said it turns out it was a relay race and they changed the rules halfway through, but he said, never mind that now. He's mm. had a couple of months to think on it and he wanted to talk about his achievements. Of course, we heard about the vaccine rollout, about the military to Ukraine. Not that much about Brexit, given that was the reason that he came into power. Of course, about the 80-seat majority. Also, uh, some of what he hoped will be written up as achievements, the 40 new hospitals, which he says will happen by the end of the decade, if indeed they really will, and the 50,000 nurses that he promised. Some of those, history will judge whether they were really domestic achievements. But Boris Johnson said he talked about himself as a rocket booster that had fulfilled its usefulness mm -hmm. and he would land in the Pacific somewhere. Can we really believe uh, that's true or will he hang around the political scene? He said he would fo offer his full support to Liz Truss as Prime Minister, coming in at a difficult time and with the challenge of energy bills. And he finished with a line which I think we will be mulling over most of the day. He said, like the Roman Emperor Cincinnatus, he would be returning to his plough, returning to his farm. But I think there is some debate about whether Cincinnatus, in fact, made a bit of a comeback later on. So he's yeah. leaving us to think on that one. Entirely open-ended, wasn't it? And, and he'll know that because he's a classic. He knows exactly buff. what so he's... He, so we'll, we'll think about whether 
whether that is what he means, but I think you saw him trying to secure his place in history with what he believes his achievements are with his characteristic bullishness and colourful language. Okay, so take a little listen to some of what he had to say. This is a tough time for the economy. This is a tough time for families up and down the country. We can and we will get through it and we will come out stronger the other side. But I say to my fellow Conservatives, it's time for politics to be over, folks. It's time for us all to get behind Liz Truss and her team and her programme and deliver for the people of this country. Well, tomorrow, uh, that was Boris Johnson giving his, his final thoughts. And he, to the end, tried to remain optimistic, which is his character trait, isn't it? He doesn't apologise and he doesn't explain. There was no remorse, there was no real self-reflection about the sequence of events, Partygate, the Chris Pincher affair, which brought him well, down. We expected to hear him say sorry for some of that stuff. I think we expected it more in July when he was forced out from office to say something to his party about it. But he's always found that side of things difficult. Uh, he now wants to dwell on his achievements. Labour and the Liberal Democrats, we just heard there, think it's delusional, but of course he was the most electoral success, electorally successful Prime Minister for 30 years and it's pretty clear that he's saying to Liz Truss, look, I'm going to be a hard act to follow. Yeah, and crack on with it and make sure you follow on. Okay, tomorrow I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Now, of course, during the leadership race, which lasted for, for two months, Liz Truss set the tone for what could potentially be more strained relations with the leaders in Scotland by referring to the First Minister Nicola Sturgeon as an attention seeker who should be ignored. Let's get the thoughts now on the SNP's Westminster leader, that's Ian Blackford. Ian Blackford, good morning to you. It's nice to have you with us. Um, I mean, good morning. we heard what Liz Truss said about... Um, about Nicola Sturgeon, and I know you've commented on that. I want, first of all, for you to reflect on what you heard from, from Boris Johnson as he was going out. As I put to Angela Rayner, now that he's gone, have you lost an electoral asset in the fact that you've seen the back of him? No, look, I mean, I will today. I'll wish him all the best, him and his family, for the future, but I'm, I'm glad he's gone because we need to remember the reasons why he had to leave office. He, he had the first Prime Minister in history that broke the law, one that's lied to Parliament, one that illegally shut down Parliament. So I'm glad that's over, and I hope that Liz Trust learns some of the lessons from that because the language that you talked about, saying that the First Minister of Scotland was an attention seeker, we need to have a relationship where the government in London and the devolved administrations, when it's a Appropriate can work together. We, we face what is the biggest economic crisis the, that we've had since the 1970s and we have a responsibility to make sure that we can reassure the public and reassure businesses that we'll deal with the cost of living crisis. That's the priority that we have today. We need to make sure that we can cap energy prices but there's going to be a big debate as to how this is paid. It can't be done on the way of just deferring bills for people. We need to make sure that government accepts its responsibilities. We're in the situation we're in in no short measure because of the Ukraine war and of course we stand with Ukraine and the illegal war that Putin has engaging on against them. But there's a price to be paid for that. And government needs to recognise that we need to have a windfall tax that fairly taxes those that have benefited from this. And we need to make sure that government puts its hand in its own pocket and pays for the cost. And, and crucially, if we do this, we can probably knock about four percentage points off inflation. So let's make sure that we do the right thing. Let's support consumers. Let's support businesses. But now is not the time for having a debate about tax cuts. That would be the wrong thing to do. And I'm looking forward to having that engagement, that debate, with the Prime Minister over the course of the next day or two. Well, that's engagement and debate. That's a, a very um, magnanimous way to put it. Are you expecting there to be a little bit of a reset then after what was said during the leadership um, campaign? But there has to be, because I think there's, there's got to be a, a recognition that the government in Edinburgh has got its job to do, and we need to have appropriate communication with all the devolved administration, indeed with the opposition parties as well. We will have very clear political differences, but there are times that we need to make sure that when things are happening in Westminster like this, that's going to affect the devolved administrations, affect their budgets no less, that there's a, appropriate communication that's taking place. But secondly, I think there's got to be respect for the devolved administrations, and if you take the position that we are in, that we stood on a commitment of delivering an independence referendum in the first half of this parliament, the first half of the Scottish parliament, and Liz Truss has got to respect democracy and has got to respect the right of the Scottish parliament to allow people in Scotland to have a say on their constitutional future. Now, of course, there are reports this morning that uh, this trust is planning some kind of change to legislation to make it more difficult for an independence referendum to be held. Of course, there is going to be a hearing at the High Court all about uh, the legality of a, a next uh, independence referendum. Uh, where do you stand on, on what you're hearing these reports about um, this trust and her potential plans? 
well, let, let me say it's barking mad. It's, I think, what we refer to as gerrymandering. When you stand for an election and when you have a referendum, you put your case, you encourage the electorate to vote, and, of course, you want to have the highest turnout possible. But the idea that somehow or other you can change the rules... I think people in Scotland, whether or not they agree with us or not, are going to reflect on what is, you know, a style of behaviour which is just completely unacceptable. And if you think about the, the rules that uh, Liz Truss and our government are thinking of putting in place, that means, for example, that Brexit wouldn't have happened because you weren't able to clear that hurdle. You'd be left in a situation where those on the electoral roll that sadly may have passed on would effectively be counted as a no voter in such a contest. It's not right, it's wrong, and this should be put to bed. We should simply not be tolerating or considering these things. What we need to recognise is the Scottish Parliament has a mandate to deliver a referendum. My message to Liz Truss is she needs now to sit down with the First Minister of Scotland and negotiate the terms of that referendum to make sure it can take place in the timeline that the Scottish Government has indicated, which is a referendum in October 2023. I regret that we're having to go to the Supreme Court, but we're having to go to the Supreme Court because the government in London won't recognise that people in Scotland have that right to determine their own future. Yeah, and the courts will make that ruling in due course, won't they? But, I mean, I'll pick you up on this, Mr Blackford. You know, we've gone from this sort of reset, where you hope that the regulation is going to be better, to describing the plan as, as barking mad. And there's obviously, there's a bit of friction there, isn't there? And there is a coming to heads, coming to a head pretty soon, between uh, you guys and the incoming Prime Minister. Well, it's about democracy and it's about fair play. And the idea that you can gerrymander the rules for a, a referendum is simply not right. And I think people, not just in Scotland, but right across the United Kingdom, will, will recognise that. And I think there has to be a, a degree of common sense and rationality when we're having these discussions. Now, Mr Blackford, of course, uh, Liz Truss says that she wants to keep the union together, and that is her stated position. Uh, so, I mean, how do you expect this to play out? I, I respect anybody that wants to argue the case for the union, and they should do that. And that's a, a much more rational debate. Whether it's Liz Truss or the Scottish Conservatives or Scottish Labour, let them lay out their case as to how they see Scotland in the union. And I want to have that debate, because I want to be able to showcase what we can deliver with independence. I want to make sure that we can accelerate our green energy production. And I do that for the purpose of making sure that we can generate the investment that's required to deliver a green industrial future for Scotland. Now, of course, we need to deal with the problems for Brexit, it and we're paying a price for that and for us uh, I mean the clear demonstration of the will of the people of Scotland is to be back in the European Union so I look forward to having that debate let's have that respectful debate of what is in the best interest of the people of Scotland but let's not have this this silly debate about changing the electoral rules let's treat people with respect actually let's have that debate about how we improve the lives of people that live in the country of Scotland OK. Uh, Ian Blackford, uh, the SNP's leader in Westminster, do appreciate your time this morning, sir. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. All right, well, that was, of course, the view uh, of people from Scotland. Let's cross to Northern Ireland now, where, of course, uh, the incoming Prime Minister is going to face... Well, I'm actually being told we can't go to Northern Ireland, so let's bring in uh, the histori historian, Anthony Selden, for a, an overview of what we've heard this morning, what we can expect to come in the coming hours, days, months and weeks. Of course, ahead. Uh, Anthony Selden, good to have you with us this morning. Um, thanks for being with us. Um, your reflections first on Boris Johnson's uh, final address to the nation. Well, um, interesting about that reference to Cincinnatus, wasn't it? My memory, but I may be wrong, is that Cincinnatus returned. Now, if that is indeed correct, Boris Johnson wouldn't have made a mistake with that, and that is would be one of the, if not the most um, provocative uh, farewell statements ever uttered by a Prime Minister outside Downing Street about their intention to come back. Uh, so who knows? Uh, that needs to be uh, stress tested. But it wasn't a contrite speech, was it? I think Boris Johnson would have uh, done better to have acknowledged uh, the uh, problems in the economy uh, with the unions, uh, with the cost of living, uh, it, it, it wasn't. Uh, it was the kind of speech that one would have delivered before one came to power, full of the things one was going to do, uh, rather than a dignified uh, speech on exit. So I think he will reflect um, and maybe think that it would have been wiser to have been a, a more compassionate uh, and thoughtful and considered speech rather than a boosterish one. That's just my sense of it. 
Fascinating, Sir Anthony. I mean, thank you for clearing that up. When I was uh, crouching down here listening to that, I heard return to my plan, which I guess we kind of get to the same point that he's left it open, that he wants to return it at some point in the future. I mean, you have, of course, uh, reflected on uh, Boris Johnson's premiership and, and the way that it's affected the sort of democratic processes in this country. I mean, how do you think he's going to be viewed by history um, in, in 10 years' time? Well, in 10 or 50 or 100 years' time, he will be viewed as the person who got Brexit done. And uh, that, therefore, uh, put to bed a, a terrible three years of indecision after the referendum. Whatever people thought of Brexit, the country clearly voted for Brexit, and clearly it had to happen. He got that achieved. He did win a landslide. Uh, prime ministers rarely achieve landslides, uh, some 20 or less in the whole entire history of the premiership. The question that historians will want to know is, did he make the most of that incredible opportunity he had in December 2019 to remake Britain, to get Brexit done, to show all the benefits, to level up the country, uh, to make it fairer, more prosperous, uh, and to have that rebirth of Britain as a uh, sovereign country outside Europe. Uh, they'll also reflect on, on COVID, um, and people will always argue about COVID, but there were many positives, not least uh, the vaccine rollout, and they'll remember his very strong, and I think very personal, stance uh, uh, on uh, the Ukraine. So there are many uh, positives there, uh, and it's everything with Boris Johnson. It's all in technicolour, in bright lights, uh, some very strong positives and some equally very strong negatives. More flaws, indeed, in his character than uh, the London Shard, which he uh, uh, which oversaw City Hall, where he had been mayor for eight years. <laughs> Comparing his character to the London Shard, Sir Anthony Selden, uh, always with a turn of phrase. We we'll appreciate your time. More from you, I hope, throughout the morning. Thank you very much for that for now. But um, we can now view us across to Northern Ireland, where, of course, the incoming Prime Minister's trust is going to face a bunch of challenges, uh, not least um, working out how to make Brexit work. And let's bring in David Blevins, who is in Northern Ireland for us this morning. David, uh, good morning again to you. So just take us through. Uh, she got a huge intro facing her when she walked into number 10, but uh, she got a, another mountain of problems facing her in Northern Ireland. Yes, and wasn't it interesting this morning to hear Boris Johnson talk about having got Brexit done and Sir Anthony there describing that as his legacy. But as far as Northern Ireland is concerned, Brexit isn't done because there's still such dispute over the Brexit trading arrangement that established a border in the Irish Sea to avoid there being a need for one on this island. In fact, that Northern Ireland protocol is the reason the Unionists will not return to the power-sharing government here at Stormont three months after the election. So there is no devolved government. Now, remember, it was Sinn Féin who won that election, and they say that Liz Truss needs to stop pandering to the DUP, needs to get Stormont back up and running, because there are more pressing concerns, like the cost-of-living crisis. So we expect the new Prime Minister to be here very quickly to try and address this political vacuum, but it isn't going to be an easy issue to resolve quickly. OK, David Blevins and Stormont, appreciate that. Thank you very much for that reporting. All right. Let's go back, of course, to the only story this morning that we're discussing. Liz Truss is about to become Prime Minister today after winning the Conservative Leadership Contest. She's the UK's fourth Prime Minister in just over six years. And someone knows plenty about working inside that building and dealing with Prime Ministers. The former Director of Communications at Number 10, that is Alistair Campbell. Alistair Campbell, good morning to you. Thank you very much for being with us. And let me start you off by getting you to reflect on what you heard from Boris Johnson earlier. Well, I, look, he arrived in that building as a as a liar and a fantasist, and he's leaving it as a liar and a fantasist. I mean, the, the, the disconnect between the country that he was describing and the country that he has actually helped to preside over was enormous. And, you know, you just heard there from David Blevins, his big claim about getting Brexit done, Brexit in Northern Ireland, is proving to be something of a, a catastrophe, and the chances are that Liz Truss has got no plan to deal with that. So, look, Boris Johnson has always been about boosterism, he's always been about the fancy line, he's always been about getting people to talk about his, you know, superficial knowledge of Greek mythology and all the rest of it. The country is in a worse state than it was when he took over. 
you can't get a passport, you can't get a driving test, you've got industrial action, and all the stuff that's happening. That I accept that COVID was very difficult, the war in Ukraine was very difficult, but these are things that prime ministers have to deal with. That is their job. What we've had from Boris Johnson is the systematic debasing of, this, of our standards in public life, the debasing of the office, the debasing and undermining of the rule of law, and not a hint of humility or contrition as he left, not any acceptance, even talking about the rules being changed, rather than the fact that his party finally faced up to the fact that they put in a liar and a charlatan inside Downing Street. So I'm afraid he left exactly as he arrived, as somebody who should never have been there in the first place. Right. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Mr Campbell. Now, just tell us about the challenges that then we'll be facing uh, Liz Truss, not, not just in, in the politics and, and the policies, but I'm, I want to talk about the, the running of, of the number 10 operation. Of course, you famously ran a, a pretty tight ship um, with uh, Sir Tony Blair. So what kind of um, running of number 10 do you think you'll see from Liz Truss? It's very hard to work out because I, I don't know her that well. Um, those people who worked for her before, I do a podcast with Rory Stewart, who was one of her ministers, and the impression you get from people who have worked closely with her is that she tends to ignore advice. She tends to adapt fairly sort of idiosyncratic approach to policy making and decision making. But we'll have to see. I think there was a very interesting interview yesterday with Gus O'Donnell, the former cabinet secretary, and he made, I think, a very important point. Since, frankly, right through the 12 years of this government, there has been a fairly systematic undermining of the civil service. And I think if she had any sense at all, she would put a stop to that. She's facing massive challenges. She's going to need the support of the civil service. And I think she should do two things. One, try to bring her divided party together. If the, if the reports of the, the reported uh, cabinet, new cabinet are true, then she's clearly not going to do that. And the second thing is to understand that she won't be able to do that much unless she gets the civil service machine up and running properly. So it will depend on her personality, but I, I do think that our experience of the civil service was, was if you give them clear direction, they know genuinely what your priorities are, you trust them and you respect them to work with them properly, then you can get a lot done. <clears throat> if she goes in and just does the same gaslighting and populism approach that we've seen from Johnson, then I'm pretty sure that she'll fail and she'll fail pretty quickly. I mean, but don't you have any optimism that she would have learned from those mistakes? I mean, we saw Boris Johnson have to replace his team two or three times because of, of errors in judgment, errors that um, he put in place himself. So you can't expect Liz Truss to having, having seen that with the team around her to make those similar mistakes. And perhaps she will uh, reinvigorate the civil service. Well, the only thing I'd say about that is that I, it has been extraordinary to watch this, this leadership contest over the last few weeks where they seem to have forgotten that they got rid of Boris Johnson because he was becoming a catastrophically bad leader. Liz Truss has, met, has spent most of her leadership campaign and indeed her speech yesterday saying what a marvellous prime minister he was and how he, quotes got the big cause right and so forth. She, she is carrying on, to my mind, with a policy where... She accepts that she, she is dishonest about a lot of the things that she says and does. She says, for example, just to give you one example that came out through the thing, she says the whole time that she's going to be straight with people and level with people, and yet at the same time refuses to acknowledge that Brexit is causing any difficulties in relation to Northern Ireland or in relation to trading and so forth. So these big problems... She's got to face up to the reality of the problems, not the mythology of the Conservative Party. And I think that she's actually, she's become, you know, uh, my friend Jan Fyortov, the ex-footballer, he actually tweeted recently, this is look, be, beginning to look a bit like Doris Johnson. She tells lies, she gaslights, she doesn't actually confront the problem that's in front of her, she c confronts the problem that she wants to see in front of her. That is not a way to govern the country. OK, Alistair Campbell, you're talking about Fyotov. Listen to your podcast and you, you bring him up every chance you get. Thank you very much for your analysis. Thank you. Then, you. Alistair Campbell. All the rest is politics. I already got a plug-in for his podcast as well. I maybe shouldn't have mentioned it. Tomorrow, all right, just reflect on what we've had for the, the past hour or so. We've heard Boris Johnson's uh, farewell speech. Alistair Campbell thinks it was completely unapologetic. There was no sort of sense of humility. Nick, Boris Johnson's critics say that he has played fast and loose with the truth. Uh, you know that Labour politicians say he's demeaned the office of Prime Minister with everything he did with Partygate and so on. But there's little doubt that Boris Johnson, as he dwells on in his speech there, 
has a force of personality, which we will remember for a long time. He won an 80-seat majority against all the odds. He realigned politics effectively, winning over seats that had been Labour for decades. And yes, that is a challenge to Liz Truss, because you hold that all together. But he changed politics in a major way. He is a prime minister of consequence, although uh, he either let it slip from his grasp or had it pulled from his grasp desperately unfairly, depending on who you talk to. I thought you heard in his speech, he couldn't resist a dig at his colleagues. Turned out to be a relay race, he said, and they changed the rules halfway through. Didn't hear much humility or remorse, as Alistair Campbell was saying. That is not Boris Johnson's style. Uh, but he was saying that he, it's time for him to go. He will give his fervent support, he said, to Liz Truss. I felt like maybe there was just a hint that he would stay on the political scene at the end there, talking about Cincinnatus, the Roman senator who may have made a comeback. Well, Historians are divided. Sheldon, it's confirmed that Cincinnatus did, in fact, make a comeback. Yes, I, re I, I, read, I, I, I would defer to his superior knowledge I, on that subject. Me too, yeah. So, um, left the door open, as we predicted he, he may well do. I, mean, I think we can bring up some of the pictures of the scene here as he came out, because it was there was a, a bunch of people, the number 10 staff who came out said outside number 11, and then all the Conservative uh, MPs down the end there, Tamara. And I was taken with sort of how human it all felt, because every there was some real sadness, actually, yeah, amongst the people around. can be brutal. I mean, political careers end either, you know, in, on election night in a town hall at 4am, or they end when you leave Downing Street, your belongings have all been packed up. He'd said goodbye to his staff last week, formally gone around all the different areas of Number 10 to say goodbye to his staff, and that's it. As he said, that's all, folks. Him and his wife, Carrie, got into a car and they will never come back here. Barely a backwards glance you're allowed as you leave office and they after going to Balmoral will be brought back to London to be dropped off at wherever the location is they will begin their life post office their normal home not living above the shop if you like with an army of staff to do everything and I think prime ministers take a long time to get over that yes Boris Johnson has had a, couple, a strange couple of months because we've been in parliamentary recess he's been on holiday not much has been going on in parliament as for example it was you know for Theresa May when she resigned she was busy every day doing things having state visits and so on so he's had a couple of months to let it sink in uh, those close to him say it's been almost like a grieving process sort of coming to terms with with how it all ended and by tonight someone else will be in there with a new team and they'll be beginning a new a new era yeah a turn a new chapter in the uh, political dynasty. OK, Tamara, I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Royal. That is all from this hour of Sky News Breakfast as we watch the car departing, carrying Boris Johnson and Carrie Johnson to RAF Northolt, uh, flanked by outriders, the <laughs> outgoing Prime Minister on his way to Scotland <laughs> to formally tender his resignation to the Queen. The jet carrying him has taken off. We saw that in the last hour. And then once he has resigned, Liz Truss is going to meet the Queen and be asked to form a new government. Once she has done that, she will return here to London, to Downing Street, where, as Tamara said, all her stuff will be in and she will give her address to the nation. Stay with us. Plenty more to come after the break. I'm Yvan Bourgnon, I'm a sailor. I spent uh, half time of my life on, on, the, on the sea. We have a factory who can convert this plastic to energy. And so after, at the end, we can minimize the footprint carbon of the boat.
everyone, and good morning from Downing Street. It is 9 a.m. That's it, folks. The words of Boris Johnson earlier before taking off for Scotland, where he will officially tender his resignation to the Queen. In his farewell speech, he called on the Conservative Party to get behind his successor, Liz Truss, who will enter number 10, facing the toughest conditions of any Prime Minister in decades. Now, the Labour Party's Angela Rayner accused Mr Johnson of being deluded. Here's what Boris Johnson had to say at around 7.30 a.m. Thank you. Thank you. Well, well this, is, this is it, folks. Thank you, everybody, for coming out so early this morning. In only a couple of hours, I will be in Balmoral to see Her Majesty the Queen. And the torch will finally be passed to a new Conservative leader. The baton will be handed over in what has unexpectedly turned out to be a relay race. They changed the rules halfway through, but never mind that now. And through that lacquered black door, a new Prime Minister will shortly go to meet a fantastic group of public servants. The people who got Brexit done, the people who delivered the fastest vaccine rollout in Europe and never forget, 70% of the entire population got a dose within six months faster than any comparable country. That is government for you. That's this Conservative government. People who organised those prompt early supplies of weapons to the heroic Ukrainian armed forces, an action that may very well have helped change the course of the biggest European war for 80 years. And because of the speed and urgency of what you did, everybody involved in this government, to get this economy moving again from July last year, in spite of all the opposition, all the naysayers, we have and will continue to have that economic strength to give people the cash they need to get through this energy crisis that has been caused by Putin's vicious war. And I know that Liz, Truss, and this compassionate Conservative government will do everything we can to get people through this crisis, and this country will endure it, and we will win. And if Putin thinks that he can succeed by blackmailing or bullying the British people, then he is utterly deluded. And the reason we will have those funds now and in the future is because we Conservatives understand the vital symmetry between government action and free market capitalist private sector enterprise. We're delivering on those huge manifesto commitments, making streets safer. Neighbourhood crime down 38% in the last three years. 13,790 more police on the streets building more hospitals, and yes, we will have 50,000 more nurses by the end of the decade, and 40 more hospitals by the end of, by, 50,000 nurses by the end of this parliament, I should say, 40 new hospitals by the end of the decade. Putting record funding into our schools and into teachers' pay, giving everybody over 18 a lifetime skills guarantee so they can keep upskilling throughout their lives. Three new high-speed rail lines, three including Northern Powerhouse Rail, colossal road programmes from the Pennines to Cornwall, the rollout of gigabit broadband up over the last three years, I am proud to say, since you were kind enough to elect me from 7% of our country's premises having gigabit broadband to 70% today. And we are, of course, providing the short and the long-term solutions for our energy needs, and not just using more of our own domestic hydrocarbons, but going up by 2030 to 50 gigawatts of wind power. That is half our, this country's energy electricity needs from offshore wind alone. A new nuclear reactor every year. And looking at what is happening in this country, the changes that are taking place, that is why private sector investment is flooding in. More private sector, more venture capital investment than China itself. More billion pound tech companies sprouting here in the UK than in France, Germany, and Israel combined. And as a result, unemployment, as I leave office, unemployment down to lows not seen since I was about 10 years old and bouncing around on a space hopper, my friends. And on, on the subject of, 
on the subject of bouncing around in future careers. Let me say that I am now like one of those booster rockets that has fulfilled its function and I will now be gently re-entering the atmosphere and splashing down invisibly in some remote and obscure corner of the Pacific. And like Cincinnatus, I am returning to my plough. And I will be offering this government nothing but the most fervent support. This is, I'll tell you why, this is a tough time for the economy. This is a tough time for families up and down the country. We can and we will get through it and we will come out stronger the other side. But I say to my fellow Conservatives, it's time for politics to be over, folks. It's time for us all to get behind Liz Truss and her team and her programme and deliver for the people of this country. Because that is what the people of this country want, that's what they need, and that's what they deserve. I'm proud to have discharged the promises I made to my party when uh, you were kind enough to choose me. Winning the biggest majority since 1987, the biggest share of the vote since 1979. Delivering Brexit, delivering our manifesto commitments, including, by the way, including social care, reforming social care, helping people up and down the country, ensuring that Britain is once again standing tall in the world, speaking with clarity and authority from Ukraine to the AUKUS pact with America and Australia. Because we are one whole and entire united kingdom whose diplomats, security services and armed forces are so globally admired. And by the way, as I, believe, I, as I leave, I believe our union is so strong that those who want to break it up, they'll keep trying, but they will never, ever succeed. Thank you to everybody behind me in this building. Thank you to all of you in government. Uh, thank you to everybody who's helped look after me and my family over the last three years, including, including Dylan, the dog. And I just say to my party, if Dylan and Larry can put behind them their occasional difficulties, then so can the Conservative Party. Above all, thanks to you, the British people to the voters for giving me the chance to serve. All of you who worked so tirelessly together to beat COVID, to put us where we are today. Together, we have laid foundations that will stand the test of time, whether by taking back control of our laws or putting in vital new infrastructure. Great, solid masonry on which we will continue to build together. Paving, paving the path of prosperity now and for future generations. And I will be supporting Liz Truss and the new government every step of the way. Thank you all very much. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Boris Johnson there taking about seven minutes and 40 seconds to sum up uh, three and a bit years of a premiership. Um, this is the live picture now from RAF Northolt. So just a short while ago, we saw the jets that we believe were carrying Boris Johnson up to Balmoral departs. And this is the second jet that will be carrying the incoming um, Prime Minister, Liz Truss, who will go to Balmoral to meet the Queen once uh, she, the Queen has finished speaking to Mr Johnson. As you can see there, the uh, steps just folding up onto that jet. So it will be, uh, do they still do trucks away? But that jet will be... Uh, taxing around the runway and, and Liz Truss will be making her way to Balmoral very shortly and she will likely be there meeting the Queen at around lunchtime uh, before coming back to London to give her remarks to the nation. Now, of course, the opposition parties have this morning responded to what they heard from Boris Johnson in that speech that he gave earlier uh, and our political correspondent Tamara Cohn is with us to reflect on what we heard. Now, uh, Tamara, we heard um, from all the opposition parties uh, thus far this morning, uh, but let's first pick up on what we heard from the Labour Party, um, Deputy Leader Angela Rayner speaking to me earlier and making it very clear that what she heard from Boris Johnson really just laid out how sort of out of touch she felt he is with what's actually happening in the country. The opposition parties have been gunning for Boris Johnson for a long time and then two months ago, of course, it, after his Conservative colleagues turned on him, he was forced from office. I think they will be reflecting on whether 
his successor, Liz Truss, will be an easier or more difficult opponent for them. Is she tainted by what happened during Boris Johnson's time in office? Not, of course, by Partygate or anything that happened uh, with Chris Pincher uh, towards the end, uh, but with serving in his government, Liz Truss was obviously loyal to Boris Johnson to the end. And I'm sure we're going to hear from opposition parties, starting from Wednesday at Prime Minister's Questions, something about that and trying to... Uh, trying to pin that on Liz Truss, if you like. But they know this is a new era. She's going to have a very different style. Boris Johnson's sort of bombastic, colourful language. We're not going to see very much of that, I think, from Liz Truss. And so it was the end of an era uh, when he uh, made his final speech here and then went off uh, to Balmoral. And the opposition parties had their final go at him as he was leaving, uh, saying that uh, what he'd said was out of touch with reality. This is what Angela Rayner told us. It was a classic Boris Johnson speech, completely deluded about what's happened over the last couple of years and the crisis that people are facing. There was no acknowledgement of how the scandal and sleaze that has engulfed his party and his government over the last couple of years, whether that was him supporting the scandal around Owen Patson, supporting Chris Pincher with the situation with sexual harassment, whether that was the absolute billions of pounds that was wasted on money that was given to mates um, through the global pandemic and, of course, the partying that happened when the UK public were told that they had to go into lockdown and had to follow the rules. I think it was completely deluded and it stunk of all the hallmarks of somebody who's had a privileged background who thinks that they can just do what they like. Yeah, Angela Rayner, they're not holding back on what she thought about uh, Boris Johnson, but definitely actually avoiding the question whether she thought that it would be uh, a bit of a, an electoral asset that Boris Johnson was for the Labour Party, and difficult challenge now with Liz Truss, as you mentioned. And Ed Davey, of course, has been speaking about the Boris Johnson legacy and what he heard from his speech this morning. Yes, the Labour Party, towards the end, talked about how they didn't mind if Boris Johnson stayed in power in the sense that they felt it was good for them. But I think... Some of them would acknowledge that he was a very difficult opponent. It was always very difficult to pin any criticism on him. And sometimes Keir Starmer would say things, particularly about his integrity, and sort of fail to land the blows. Will they find Liz Truss an easier opponent? Well, it depends whether she gets a boost in the polls from whatever it is that is in her energy package. Uh, Liberal Democrat leader Ed Davey also talking about uh, some of what Boris Johnson said. And look... He knows that people will take issue with the 40 new hospitals that he says will be built by the end of the decade and whether they really are new. The 50,000 nurses he promised to recruit, they are some of the way there. But they will say that, look, he's giving a list of the things that he has not achieved, reforming social care. I mean, I think the sector would dispute some of that. Uh, this is what Ed Davey, the Lib Dem leader, had to say. Well, what Boris Johnson failed to mention was our economy is in a, in a mess. Um, we uh, are the lowest growth uh, projections of any industrial country bar Russia. Uh, energy bills are going through the roof. People are really worried about food prices. They're worried about the crisis in the NHS. And that's all happened under his premiership. Yeah, the opposition parties, they're laying it out very clearly as what they think about Boris Johnson. We heard also from Ian Blackford, the leader of the SNP here in Westminster. And, and there, there is a, a real issue that's going to be coming to a head very, very soon for uh, Liz Truss when she takes over. And this is the case of Scottish independence. It's going to go to the Supreme Court. But there's reporting this morning that Liz Truss has a plan to try and make it more difficult for them to go for a second referendum. That's right. I mean, Ian Blackford, the Westminster leader of the SNP, and Boris Johnson always enjoyed a bit of knockabout in Parliament. And I think the SNP saw Boris Johnson as a real electoral asset for them. He was unpopular in Scotland. The cons Scottish Conservatives often found it quite difficult to justify uh, some of what he said and did and often tried to distance themselves uh, from him. I'm sure they'll be hoping that Liz Truss uh, similarly puts her foot in it. Yes, we are expecting a Supreme Court uh, ruling on whether Nicola Sturgeon's plan to have an independence referendum without permission from Westminster next October can go ahead or not. So that is in her bulging in tray, as well as, of course, the Northern Ireland Brexit arrangements and various other important constitutional issues to do with the union. Uh, this is what Ian ba Blackford told us about his views on the handover of power. Well, let, let me say it's barking mad. It's, I think, what we refer to as gerrymandering. When you stand for an election and when you have a referendum, you put your case, you encourage the electorate to vote, and of course you want to have the highest turnout possible. But the idea that somehow or other you can change the rules, 
I think people in Scotland, whether or not they agree with us or not, are going to reflect on what is, you know, a sign of behaviour which is just completely unacceptable. He's one of the leaders that Liz Truss will be up against in her first Prime Minister's questions on Wednesday. It's all happening really fast. She is at RAF Northolt at the moment. We saw those pictures. She will be meeting the Queen at Balmoral just after Boris Johnson. He goes in, he leaves, Liz Truss goes in, is, uh, has the ceremony with the Queen, the kissing hand ceremony, will become Prime Minister, will come down here, we'll hear from her this afternoon. She'll appoint her Cabinet straight to the House of Commons tomorrow. There is really no let-up and we will be hearing pretty soon about what the energy bill support package that she will unveil is and she knows that her reputation will depend on it being seen as rising to the scale of the challenge. It may come Thursday as well, so it's really all happening really quickly, isn't it? It may. It, she said that she would act within a week and I'm hearing that we will hear the details of it on Thursday. The, there are various serious options that are in contention and one of her senior cabinet allies said to me that the new cabinet would have to sign it off on mm. Wednesday at their first cabinet meeting. So if, if she does freeze energy bills, which her team have been discussing, that is something the energy companies have put forward, exactly how it will work, what the threshold will be, will businesses be involved as well as households and crucially how much it will cost and where they get the money from if she remains averse to windfall taxes. All of that will need to be worked out. This is going to be complicated and it's going to have implications, of course, for other areas of government. Analysis when it does happen. All right, um, tomorrow, thank you very much for that. Now, as we're looking at these pictures of uh, the jet there on the tarmac at RAF Northolt, we believe that is carrying the incoming Prime Minister Liz Truss, who is on her way up to Balmoral. Now, about half an hour or so ago, the um, current Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, left um, in a similar-looking jet from RAF Northolt on his way to Balmoral. And let's go there now live, where our Royal Correspondent Rhiannon Mills is standing by for us. So, Rhiannon, I can confirm Boris Johnson is in the air, he's on his way up to Balmoral. So take us through what's going to happen when he eventually arrives up there. Yeah, already this morning is looking so different, isn't it, from what we have seen throughout the Queen's 70-year reign in terms of this power handover. Usually, it would all be happening where you are, in that short distance between Number 10 and Buckingham Palace, and all happen within such a short space of time. So usually, under two hours, and it's all done and dusted. We have a new Prime Minister. But as you say, we currently have an outgoing Prime Minister in the air at the moment, heading to Aberdeen. And it has to be said, because of the good old Scottish weather, certainly the weather here in the Highlands, plans have already had to change this morning. Things have been moved slightly earlier. So it's meant that Boris Johnson is now on his way to try and, I think, miss some of those, those storms and make sure that he gets here at 10 past 11, because rather than having a helicopter to take him from Aberdeen Airport here to Balmoral, we are anticipating that it's going to be a car journey instead, which will probably take uh, about an hour or so. Yesterday, apparently, they were, they were practising how that police convoy uh, was going to work. But I think for all sides involved, whether it's the outgoing, the incoming Prime Minister and the Palace as well, it was basically decided last week that from practical terms, it was all going to happen here. We know that the Queen is still having those uh, mobility issues and wanted to make sure that whatever was planned was actually going to happen. If the Queen got up this morning, didn't feel entirely well, then plans weren't going to have to be ripped up. We know that she did in this, earlier in the summer probably intend to, to travel down to London, but 96 years old, it was decided that everyone else instead is going to travel up here. In terms of the formalities of what's going to happen, yes, it's going to have a very, very different look, a very different feel. I think a, a different kind of intimacy happening here uh, at Balmoral, but we wait and see exactly how it all unfolds later. We are expecting pictures of Boris Johnson arriving, Liz Truss arriving, and Liz Truss then leaving as Prime Minister. Yeah, and we'll be back to you for that when that does happen. Uh, Rhiannon, I appreciate that. Thank you very much for now. These, uh, as you can see, the latest pictures from RAF Northolt. That jet is still waiting on the tar back um, before it does begin taxiing and making its way up to Balmoral. The, the flight uh, takes uh, probably just, a, just over an hour to get up there. And once uh, this truss gets up there, she will meet the Queen and officially become our Prime Minister. Now, let me just bring you these pictures that have, have been released uh, by the Number 10 press office in the past uh, hour or so. Uh, I wanted there's a little flash photography in these. Now, this is the scene inside Number 10 now. Of course, the press pack was assembled outside as we were waiting for this moment for Boris Johnson and Carrie Johnson to come up. But you can see them here walking through the halls of Number 10 being clapped, flanked by the staff of Number 10 at the final walk through those halls for the Johnsons before Boris came out and delivered his farewell 
address to the nation. And it was a quite an emotional scene, as I was saying uh, to Tamara earlier. What was really most sort of affecting by it was the people that had been around Boris Johnson through all of this, through the ups and downs the, the past few years, uh, seemed to be deeply affected by the fact that despite him having that 80-seat majority back in 2019, he is now leaving office before his term is out. All right, well, let's just bring in um, someone who is still in government for now, uh, Simon Clark, who is currently Chief Secretary to the Treasury and was an early supporter of this trust incoming uh, Prime Minister. Well, Simon Clark, good morning to you and thank you very much for being with us. Uh, so, uh, I wonder if you can clear up some of the reporting that we're getting this morning about this package that's being prepared, some £100 billion, to help people deal with their energy bills. Well, what I can say is that uh, Liz Truss recognises completely the urgency of the situation facing households uh, and businesses uh, during the autumn and winter ahead, and uh, that we'll, there will be uh, a major intervention uh, to help provide clarity and comfort that the government is, is, is on people's side uh, in the days ahead. Uh, and we, we hope to deliver that uh, during the course of this first week uh, of Liz being our Prime Minister. It's, it's something where uh, the country is obviously looking for, for early reassurance. We're going to provide that. I mean, yeah, many people have been asking for reassurance for the past couple of months, Mr Clark, haven't they? Uh, now we've got these reports. Liz Truss will be here in a few hours' time giving her first address to the nation. So the reports that we're seeing this morning, are they not true? Can you tell us that? I'm afraid I can't comment on the specifics of, uh, of, of, of the plans. It's not for me to do that today. You wouldn't expect me to. Liz has not yet even got the keys uh, to Downing Street. But it, it is absolutely the case that people can be reassured there will be early action on this as part of Liz's government. And it will literally, as I say, be a matter of days. And it'll be something of that magnitude, won't it, Mr Clark? And, and this reporting seems to be focused on households. What will be done to help businesses? I, I can't comment on the specifics of the, of the package, as I say, but it will embrace both households and businesses, and it's something which the government is determined to help uh, deliver as a matter of, of, of the utmost priority, because uh, without this, frankly, we can't, we can't do the rest of our work, and there is, there is a, a whole lot uh, more to be done, but until we've addressed cost of living, then, then clearly there, is, uh, the, the, there isn't going to be the space to do that. So this is the, this yeah. is the top priority of, of Liz's uh, first, first days in office. Now, you're Chief Secretary of the Treasury, so you have been in office while we've been waiting for a plan to be laid out. And I'm sure the work has been done to try and get this paid for. Can you give me your preferred way of making sure that whatever package is paid for um, gets funded? Well, that's a very tempting question, but uh, the full detail of the package, including uh, not just how it will operate, but how it will be funded, will be set out in, in the days ahead. And it, as I say, I simply cannot uh, preempt that. And I do think viewers will understand that there, is, there are going to be answers very, very soon, but it's not for this interview for me to, to set those out. I mean, they will understand that, Mr Clark, but they'll also be very frustrated, I think, that you can't give us any sort of, of sense of, of the scale of this, because it's a huge challenge that we're facing. Um, but I'll, uh, I'll take your answers this morning and we'll move on. Just uh, give us a sense of what kind of Prime Minister you think we'll see in Liz Truss and what kind of operation she'll run out of number 10. I think we'll see someone who is uh, thoughtful, uh, evidence-led, uh, tough, uh, and, and, and resilient. And, and, you know, Liz has a focus, as she set out in her speech yesterday, on delivery for the British people. There is, there is, there is an urgent need, whether that be the short-term uh, challenges that we know we face with cost of living through to the long-term issues, like facing down Russia's invasion of Ukraine or uniting and levelling up this country. Uh, and Liz will bring the same uh, urgency of, uh, of action and, and the same clarity of thought uh, to, to, to the job of Prime Minister that she's brought to successive roles where she's made a huge uh, success of them, whether that be as Foreign Secretary, as Trade Secretary, uh, at Justice or Environment or Treasury or Education. Liz has served across government over the last 12 years and has made a success wherever she's been. The focus, clearly, uh, is going to be on uh, making sure that all of her ministers uh, deliver in the same way. Yeah, and talking about her ministers then, the, the discussion yesterday was when we saw the reports of what the Cabinet would be made up of, that it's really from one side of the party, from the right of the party. Are, are you confident that when you see the, the Cabinet laid out, that it's going to be a, a show the broad sort of depth of the um, Conservative Party and have a, a range of opinions? 
Well, there's been a uh, there's been a lot of speculation about uh, who's going to be in the new government, as there always uh, understandably is. Uh, Liz will form a government which draws on talent right from uh, across the Conservative Party, but it will obviously be of people who are strongly behind her agenda of delivering a focus on growth, on making sure that this country's public services work, uh, and that we are uh, a strong voice. Uh, for freedom and democracy abroad. Those are her priorities as Prime Minister, and uh, it will be a government, clearly, that enables her to deliver that. OK, Simon Clark, Chief Secretary of the Treasury, I appreciate your time this morning. Even though you didn't tell us what the, the plan is going to be, I'm sure we'll get you back on again and, and maybe get the plan for you eventually. Thank you. Thank you. All right, it's been our political correspondent, Tamara Cohn, is listening in to Simon Clark. The Chief Secretary of the Treasury wouldn't tell me anything about the plan, so I had to wait. More time. Wait, a few days, he <laughs> said, in the coming days. We expect it will be Thursday. But there was what something there. What he did that... say was there will be significant support to households and, when you asked him about this, businesses yeah. as well. Because we've seen all these businesses posting, they, their energy bills aren't capped, posting these pictures of £20,000, £30,000 a year for energy and saying, where's our support from the government? If Liz Truss is to help businesses with their energy bills, that is going to be even more expensive. Labour's proposed energy bill price freeze for six months. They put it 30 billion, so that's 60 billion a year. If she tries to freeze energy bills at the current level, which is just under 2,000 pounds, we don't know if that's what she's going to do, but if she tries to do that for a couple of years until the next election, we're already looking at well over 100 billion before you even bring in businesses. So look, the options are all expensive. Mm -hmm. We know that some of the Conservatives supporting her for the leadership would rather she targeted support to particular people, pensioners, people on benefits. It's clear to her and her team that support will need to go far wider than that, just as it was clear to Boris Johnson and his former Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, that people who are not just in those groups will struggle and will need government support. Is there a way, a middle way there, where you help some people more than others? These are the difficult decisions her cabinet will need to sign off on Wednesday. And whether or not this is seen as successful is going to set the tone for her time in office. Appreciate that, Tamara. And someone who might well have an opinion on that middle way that Tamara was suggesting then is uh, Paul Johnson from the Institute for Fiscal Studies, who I'm pleased to say we'll be speaking to after the break. Plenty more to come here throughout the morning on Sky News. All right, let's take you now live again to RAF Northolt, where, as you can see, the jet is now taxiing on its way to Balmoral in Scotland. It's carrying Liz Truss, the incoming Prime Minister, who will be going up to Scotland to meet Her Majesty the Queen. Now, the ceremony is called the kissing of the hands when she is officially appointed Prime Minister, but as we've been telling you throughout the morning, there will be no kissing of hands. It's going to be a, a formal meeting where uh, Liz Truss will be asked to form the next government. Um, that plane is currently waiting for clearance, I guess, to take off. Once this trust has finished in Scotland, she will jet her way back down here to London, where we can expect her to give her first address to the nation from Downing Street sometime this afternoon. Now, as tradition dictates, it's usually done from a lectern, as we saw Boris Johnson do this morning, um, outside. But the weather forecast is not great, so there may be a slight change of plans, but of course, uh, we'll let you know where we can expect to see um, mistrust. Now, Boris Johnson has uh, just arrived in the past couple of minutes in Scotland. He'll be uh, on his way to Balmoral, as Rhiannon was telling us a, a short while ago, where he will formally tender his resignation to Her Majesty the Queen, and the handover of power will begin. 
All right. Let's uh, bring in now the uh, director of the Institute for Fiscal Studies. That's Paul Johnson, who uh, we were just discussing just before the break. Uh, Tamara was laying out, uh, Paul, whether there is a, a middle way to, to get some of this funded to make sure the maximum amount of help can be given to people to help with their energy bills. I mean, what's your analysis of, of what you've heard um, in the reporting? Is the plan being proposed? Well, it looks like uh, we're going to get a huge intervention to fix energy bills at some level, maybe their current level, maybe a bit more, maybe a bit less. Um, that's, uh, I mean, that is a big bazooka, as it were, to um, ensure that nobody loses out through higher uh, energy prices. Now, that's incredibly expensive, £100 billion pounds plus. I mean, that's that we're, we're talking COVID-style levels of intervention, actually quite a lot more than we spent on the furlough scheme. Um, the, it's a terrible policy, but it may be the only one that's available. It's a terrible policy because it's so expensive, because it gives lots of money to people um, who don't need it. And actually, I think if, uh, if the price doesn't go up, we've got more risk of rationing and shortages. Uh, but it's very hard to think of other ways of getting support to all of the people who are actually going to need it, because the alternative of trying to focus support on people who need it probably means missing out millions and leaving them in really serious problems. Yeah, just to explain that in a bit more detail, then, if you can, uh, Paul, um, how because there's been a lot of talk of that we could have this as targeted support for people on universal credit. But just explain why that may well mean, as you, as you say, uh, lots of people who are who are low earners would potentially miss out on that help. Well, the problem, in a sense, is that because energy bills are going up from not much more than an average of a thousand pounds or so a year ago, probably to five thousand pounds by we get, the time we get through to. January. That's not going to be difficult just for people on means tested benefits, on universal credit and so on. That's going to be a real problem for a lot of people who are not in the benefit system, who are on modest kinds of earnings, 20, 30, even £40,000 um, a year. Uh, and some of those will have energy bills and more uh, than £5,000 a year after this. Now, targeting that really quite large group through the benefit system is really hard because they're not on benefits. Targeting them through the tax system is also extremely difficult. And targeting just them through energy bills is something that's pretty hard to do because the energy companies, of course, don't know what the incomes are of the people um, who they're supplying energy to. Uh, and that's why I say I think the um, overall uh, an overall energy price freeze is something to be avoided at pretty much all costs but we may be at the point where the cost of not freezing the energy bills will be higher than the cost of doing so. Yeah, and you described it as a bazooka, and you, and you say it might well be the only course of action, but there are differences of opinions about how it's going to be paid for. The opposition parties uh, want there to be an increase in, in the windfall tax. Um, the government uh, and energy companies are talking about essentially a, a loan system where energy companies are loaned extra money to make sure that they can then freeze the prices, and then that money is then paid back um, over, over time. I mean, of those two methods, which is your the favoured method uh, for you, Mr Johnson? Uh, well, a windfall tax is clearly not going to come close to being uh, adequate to pay for this. I mean, you cannot get £100 billion out of a couple of energy uh, companies that would be that are making the big profits. You can get you know, a small number of tens of billions, so you can get some way towards it, but only a small minority of the way uh, towards it. Um, I'm not either terribly convinced by the idea of doing this through loans to energy companies. I think the idea there is that we all pay this back over a very long period through higher energy bills. Well, um, whether we don't know when energy prices are going to go down, uh, we don't know what level of additional spending people are going to be able and willing to do. It seems to me a much more straightforward uh, way of doing this, which I understand is not politically attractive, is to say that this will be paid back over five or ten years through slightly higher income tax rates, for example. Uh, that means, uh, for example, those of us who are uh, getting this help, who don't really need it, those on relatively high incomes, uh, will pay back more in the longer run. And that, uh, that would seem to me to be a straightforward, uh, a fair and a relatively... Um, a transparent way of paying for this. I do worry that we'll end up getting into all sorts of clever, clever 
financial instruments which make it look like this isn't government borrowing make it look like we're not really paying for it but in the end it really is government borrowing it's government back borrowing and in the end uh, we may end up having to bail the energy companies out in any case yeah that's where it would seem to 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 end up wouldn't it mr johnson i mean is there any other way around this other than to just have all that a, a massive increase in government borrowing well, in the short run, if, the, if this is the policy that's going to be followed, um, it's going to have to be done through big government borrowing in the short run, just as we did big government borrowing to cover the costs of COVID um, in the short run. So I don't think there's any way around that if this is the kind of policy that's going to be, uh, that's going to be pursued. Uh, but I think it's really important that we're honest about that. It's also important to distinguish this kind of policy, which we hope will be relatively short term it's a one-off cost to the government it's a one-off increase in debt that's a different sort of thing to for example the big tax cuts that the new prime minister is mm -hmm. proposing that's a permanent and a long-term cost uh, to the public finances and in the end they may quote only cost 30 billion a year uh, but that's a lot more in the long run than a one-off 100 billion pounds uh, which is not repeated yeah and let me just uh... Johnson, just wait there for me for a moment. Let's just tell our viewers what we're watching here. On the left-hand side, you can see the jet RAF Northolt carrying the incoming Prime Minister Liz Truss. That's wheels up on its way to um, uh, to see the Queen to officially become Prime Minister. And on the right-hand side there, that's the uh, jet that left uh, Northolt, uh, you know, about 45 minutes to an hour before um, Liz Truss's jet. That one is carrying the current Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. Aberdeen Airport's there, and the vehicle has just arrived that will take Mr. Johnson to drive from Aberdeen to Balmoral, where he will officially resign as Prime Minister. So we're just watching uh, one Prime Minister go and another one on its on their way. Uh, Paul Johnson is still with us um, for more on the economic situation facing the incoming Prime Minister, Liz Trust. Uh, uh, and Paul Johnson, during the campaign, there was a lot of talk by Liz Trust about this um, fiscal event, an emergency budget that she was going to bring in that would lay out how um, any borrowing that was needed was going to be paid for and how any help for, any, for customers dealing with their energy bills was going to, to come about. And there was discussion about the Office of Budget Responsibility not having the time to do the work. I mean, in your analysis, was that correct that the OBR wouldn't have had the time to do the work necessary for these plans to be in place? Well, I don't think we, what we're going to have is a formal emergency budget. I think we'll have yet another of these big fiscal spending events that we've had dozens of over the last two or three years. And they've on the whole not come with OBR forecasts. Now, we know because the OBR has told us that they are in a position to provide an economic update and forecast of where the public finances will be. Uh, so uh, I think it'd be quite helpful uh, to have transparently in the public domain the OBR's view of uh, where the public finances are and what the consequences would be uh, of some of these policies. Now, they won't have a lot of time to look at the specific policies that are being proposed, but for example, uh, if um, we're looking at a cut to the national insurance rate or the corporation tax rate or an increase in the um, or, or support for energy bills, those are pretty straightforward numbers to come up with and plug into the public finance numbers they've already done. Uh, so I know that the OBR are willing and ready to provide these numbers. The question is, uh, will the new Chancellor ask them uh, to provide these numbers? Yeah, I guess we'll find that out in the next few days. OK, Paul Johnson from the Institute for Fiscal Studies. Do appreciate your time this morning. Thanks very much for that analysis. Always worthwhile. All right, well, viewers, you are still watching that uh, jet carrying the Prime Minister Boris Johnson uh, on the tarmac there at the airport in Aberdeen. Uh, if you were paying close attention, you would have seen the luxury vehicles putting around to the exit door. And looking very closely, I think I can see the red dress that Carrie Johnson was wearing. So the uh, Johnsons are on their way to see the Queen getting in to those cars. The Range Rover will be carrying the Prime Minister, taking them up to Balmoral, where Boris Johnson is going to formally tend his resignation to the Queen, beginning the process of the transfer of power. Now, the incoming Prime Minister, Liz Truss, of course, grew up in Leeds, so it's uh, worth going back to her hometown to get a sense from people there what they're expecting from the next Prime Minister. And our correspondent, Fraser Maud, is in Leeds for us right now. Good morning again to you, Fraser. So just, just tell us, from those you've spoken to this morning and for the past few days, what are they expecting to hear when um, Liz Truss uh, assumes <coughs> office and gives us that speech in Downing Street? 
Yeah, we're here at Kirkgate Market in the heart of the city, and I think people are wanting Liz Truss to listen to them before she makes any key decisions. Uh, we're here to find out what it's going to mean to the business community, what they want to hear. No better person to ask than James Mason, who's the CEO of the West and North Yorkshire Chamber of Commerce. James, what is it that businesses want to hear from Liz Truss this week? Well, they want some certainty. They want to know that they can operate into next week, into next month, into next year, and they're really... Well, we've spoken to a few this morning, especially a coffee shop lanes just uh, down the road in Leeds. They need to know that their electricity bill, their energy bill, is going to be affordable. Uh, we're hearing quotes of £14,000 this year, £45,000 next year. Businesses cannot survive these prices. So we need the new Prime Minister and what an opportunity to freeze prices for domestic customers and business customers. In terms of what it means to businesses, I mean, that lack of certainty about fuel costs and so on, uh, we're hearing now that they could be capped, but then many businesses have already committed to, to uh, longer-term contracts, haven't they, to yeah, try and avoid the uncertainty? That's exactly the problem. At the moment, you're fishing around for the best price, you're going to take what you can, and that might be an extortionate price, but you'll take it so you can lock it in. The problem then is with the cap is you're locked in for the next year, so potentially grants, a reduction in VAT would help, especially in hospitality. Um, Off-gem, give them more powers to restrict these energy supplies. Um, creating millions and billions of pounds. So businesses really need immediate help from uh, the Prime Minister and what an opportunity for her to put a mark in the sand this week. In terms of what she's going to do, she says that she's got a bold plan. How bold does it need to be to get the economy back up and running? Well, it needs to be bold. She said she'll deliver, deliver, deliver. This needs to be a once-in-a-lifetime um, mark in the sand. And bold can be many things, but I think now she's got to really take a stand and support businesses. There's two, there's two sides of this coin. Support businesses with loans and grants, etc., or actually commit to long-term sustainability. Any business that goes out of, uh, of extinction this week means jobs losses, means mortgages going down the pan, means the, the hinterland of other businesses, the supply chain, all failing. So she's really got to make a big, bold move this week. Thanks, James. We'll let you get out of the rain. I know you're a busy man today, so uh, a bold plan is needed. That's what we want to hear here in uh, West Yorkshire, North Yorkshire as well, from James, who's the uh, CEO of the Chamber of Trade, uh, for there as well. Businesses want some certainty, and they certainly need some help with those energy bills. Yeah, big, bold moves in there. She did say in that speech yesterday that she will deliver, so we'll wait to find out how she plans to do that. Fraser, thank you for now. All right, let's get a little more reaction uh, to what we've heard this morning by bringing in uh, Joe Tanner. Now, uh, she is a former advisor to Boris Johnson and joins us now live. Good morning to you, Joe. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. You will have listened to Boris Johnson's speech. I mean, where do you put that in the chart of his speeches? Is it classic Boris? Well, there, was, there were elements, weren't there? There are always elements of classic Boris whenever he speaks. And I think it was a better speech than perhaps when... Um, it was first clear that he was leaving office. Um, I felt then there was a, there was the issue about the herd moving, and it just sounded a, a little. It didn't seem to hit the right spot to me that day. But I think today was was the right message, the right tone, and um, support for Liz, who's got a very difficult job coming in. Yeah, but as uh, commentators are mentioning, no sort of humility, no sort of sorry again for for the way that it's it's played out. Yeah, I think that would have been nice to have seen, but I think from his perspective, he'll have felt that he's he's done that. Um, I think that I think the point was all about looking forward today. I think it was it was about trying to, I suppose, underline what's been achieved, um, and I think less about you know uh, griping or, or sniping about what's gone wrong uh, in terms of the the way that he was as he might see ousted and certainly some commentators have talked about um, and even some of his own MPs and party members so I think it was better to talk about his um, willingness to support Liz Truss who's got a lot to do but um, I think that was probably as far as we were going to get I'm not sure we'd have got a full uh, post-mortem of his time in office and uh, and you know a big apology on on the uh, outside number 10. No is that just not his personality I mean you know him quite well is that just not he's not the kind of guy to just say look that was I messed up and I'm sorry that, that it really played out like this. I don't, I don't think that is him. I think that's, that's probably characterised him for, for many years, that that isn't necessarily something that he does. Um, you know, some of us are very willing to, to be the first to say sorry, even in an argument, and I'm sure that that's, that's defining in terms of a personality. But I think that moment is about trying to say, look, this is what I did and this is what happens next. And the big question on everyone's lips has been, you know, what will he do next? And he was quick to... 
uh, affirm that he was going to be supportive. Let's see what that support looks like. It's going to be very hard for someone who's always had opinions to not have opinions while on the outside. Yeah, certainly will be. And you will have heard that quote that you used from Cincinnatus. I mean, I didn't get it, I'm no classicist, but it's about him returning to his plough. Now, there's some debate, and Sir Anthony Selden, the historian, tells that Cincinnatus made a comeback. Boris Johnson has uh, quite clearly not ruled out not making a comeback. You know him. What do you think? He's still a young man, really, in political terms. Um, I think that... I don't, I don't think his time is done, but what that looks like, I mean, there is unknown. There are many, many routes um, that former prime ministers can take. And part of that is actually how history regards them in terms of how they're viewed, what they did. Um, actually, the landing that they have after being prime minister, those first, you know, the first sort of outing after that point and how you approach that, um, that will be... Uh, quite definitive for what he does next. It will also be interesting for him to see the offers that come forward. I think many people assume that he will start writing again, which has always been a huge passion of his, um, and not just the books, but also will he end up with another column, because actually he found that an, an incredibly useful and enjoyable outlet. Um, but how he uses that uh, is going to be probably quite an interesting uh, move, you know, his first column out of the blocks, what will he say? Will he continue to talk about Ukraine? Will he be talking about domestic policy? Um, I don't think he's he's a big beast in terms of, you know, the, the power that he's had in terms of whipping people up, uh, getting people behind him, getting people interested in what he's saying. But he's also still a big thinker. So it will be interesting that out of the trappings of office, what is it that he will actually want to talk about? What will he want to focus on? Because... As I say, I'm not sure he's completely done yet. Now, and, and as you mentioned, he may well go to, uh, back to doing some more writing. And whatever he says is going to be consequential. But the question is whether he chooses to, for it to be consequential in the fact that it helps the debate and furthers things, or whether he chooses to throw a bit of shade to those who've replaced him. Yeah, and there's also that huge challenge that we've got a COVID inquiry, you know, going to be taking place. And there will be that inevitable period where everyone tries to rewrite history as he may see it. He will, you know, we saw Rishi Sunak talking about the COVID restrictions and his views about that during the leadership campaign. So there will be people that will be pouring over what's happened over the last couple of years and discussing whether they agreed with something, whether they were asking for something else. And those voices will obviously be almost trying to sort of manipulate how we view those last couple of years. And he's inevitably going to want to, in his eyes, set the record straight or at least get his views across about what happened. So there will be the potential for this kind of toing and froing between key figures that have been involved in quite significant decisions that took place over the last couple of years. But also there is there has to be a period of reflection. There has to be a, a sense of, you know, what next it's been well reported that he's likely to need to earn money um, and so therefore the decisions you make and how interesting you are, no newspaper is going to want him unless he's got something to say. Um, they're going to want people to buy their newspapers. So, you know, inevitably, if he's just going to be fairly boring and, and you know, not Boris-like, then I'm sure that those columns will not be forthcoming. So inevitably, yes, there is going to be uh, something to say, but how that plays into the current domestic agenda or whether he starts to champion certain causes that he's passionate about, that's obviously when the, when the sort of trappings of office are, are off, um, you can start to talk up those issues that perhaps you were really passionate about. And for Boris Johnson, we have to remember that COVID impacted his time in office significantly. There's a lot of stuff that he wanted to do that he didn't even get near to doing. Um, and I wonder if some of that, those things will be picked up uh, in his time now that he's leaving number 10. I mean, just quickly, what kind of things do interest him in terms of public policy and helping, helping the country? Well, I mean, he still talks a lot about his time in London. He was very passionate. The levelling up agenda, which I think a lot of people felt didn't really... They didn't really make the inroads in that arena that they, they could have. I think that issue about disparities... We used to talk immensely on the, the London campaign that I worked with him on about even just health inequalities in places like London, that if you travel just a few stops on the tube, your chances of living a certain number of years um, differed immensely simply because of your um, your economic prospects, your uh, conditions that you lived in, the, the local environment. So there are things around that, that have defined him because of other things that he's seen and other things that he's 
he's sort of talked about and has researched and has been interested in in the past. So I think something around... I'm not sure if it's quite social mobility, but I think something around those inequalities will still be of interest to him. Um, but I also think that Boris is a big thinker. He will be looking ahead. He will, he'll be interested in the next big things and whether he decides to champion causes in the future because they are the next big things and he wants to be visionary still, as I say, still a relatively young man politically. Um, that will be quite defining, the conversations he will have, the people that will come and talk to him now and perhaps get him excited about things that maybe in number 10 they could simply couldn't look at or couldn't do. Yeah, uh, Joe Turner, do appreciate that um, analysis of uh, what we might expect from Boris Johnson. Joe Turner, former advisor to the outgoing Prime Minister during his time as Mayor of London. Appreciate your time this morning. Thanks for being with us. All right, let's bring back in the historian, uh, Sir Anthony Selden, for his thoughts on what we've seen this morning and what we may well see in the future. Uh, Sir Anthony, Joe Turner there talking about Boris Johnson perhaps going back to writing his columns. And, and I don't want you to sort of um, reflect on what kind of column he would write, but... Just his input going forward, how important is that as an outgoing Prime Minister to have a constructive input to the discourse? Uh, well, one thing, of course, uh, to mention is that uh, Winston Churchill, about whom he wrote a biography, did come back uh, to power in uh, 1951. And uh, that was just a glorious trailing and a bit of mischief, but a bit of maybe... Uh, future stargazing there by Boris Johnson with that reference to Cincinnati uh, just taunting us uh, there, tantalising us. Um, and he, you know, he can't stop thinking. And he knows, he knows inside himself that he didn't achieve uh, what he wanted to achieve as Prime Minister beyond getting Brexit done, COVID, fair enough, that wasn't what he planned to do. He uh, as Joe was saying there, he really does care. I mean, he's a one-nation uh, centrist Tory. He really does care about the condition of uh, people. Uh, and uh, levelling up w was underachieved uh, massively. Uh, he does care deeply also, not mentioned about the environment, which he shares with uh, Carrie, his, his wife. He cares deeply about the Ukraine. There's a strong sense of... Uh, justice there uh, within him. There's so much he wants to do. Um, and despite what he says about being an ever so loyal, um, uh, good boy uh, in class to the new teacher uh, coming in, uh, Miss Trust, um, uh, uh, he will, despite himself, he won't be able to restrain um, saying all kinds of provocative uh, things. Uh, he simply can't stop himself. Um, and, of course, uh, the editors will want him to be extremely uh, provocative. Uh, so he'll probably keep quiet for about uh, 10 days, uh, maybe a, a month, um, and then um, he will be uh, saying things and they'll be all over uh, our newspapers and news bulletins. That is Boris Johnson. Yeah, and Sir Anthony, uh, you described as consequential, uh, of course, and, and his premiership has changed the politics in this country. So with the interventions that you uh, described there being provocative, I wonder what that will do further to uh, the politics that we, we see in the UK. Well, it's fragile, isn't it? Um, uh, it's fragile within the Conservative Party. Um, she didn't have the support of her MPs. She'll... I'm sure worked very hard to get that. She didn't have an overwhelming support from Conservatives in the country. She certainly doesn't have that support within the nation. It is at the end of a long period of single party ascendancy. You do not want to become Prime Minister. It's extremely hard in history uh, to become Prime Minister at the end of a long period of power. Uh, no party since 1832 has won five uh, elections on the trot. She's got economic, uh, cultural, social, uh, diplomatic um, and union militancy problems and more. The cohesion of the country, uh, the condition of Her Majesty uh, herself, she can't carry on forever. She is the factor that holds the United Kingdom together. So there's a lot on her in tray, uh, a lot that was left by Boris Johnson undone, including uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol and showing the country that Brexit really was uh, in the interests of the country 
Uh, Boris Johnson was responsible for that, uh, but Liz Truss has been a very strong advocate. She'll want to show uh, that Brexit is more than sloganising an emotion. It really uh, does hit people uh, where it most uh, counts, which is in their pocket. OK, Sir Anthony Selden, always appreciate your thoughts. Thank you very much for being with us for now. Let's bring back in our political correspondent, Tamara Cohen, who's still with us here at Downing Street. Uh, and Tamara, just throw forward then to what we can expect in the next few hours' time now and, and um, what the choreography is going to be like. So Boris Johnson is gone. That was his last act. And with some jokes, some serious messages, a bit of bitterness at his colleagues and a hint of a comeback, he left Downing Street to go and see the Queen and tender his resignation. We will now see him go from Balmoral to the location where he will spend his post-office life. We will not see him leave. He is now out of the spotlight. Liz Truss will leave Balmoral to come to Downing Street, where she will, we expect, in the afternoon, stand on the steps of Downing Street and give her first speech. And this is the speech where a prime minister sets out their priorities. If they've won an election, they say thank you to the public for electing them. She has not won an election. She takes over mid-term with a whole load of problems piling up in her in-tray, the top of which is, of course, the energy price crisis and what she will do about it. We're not going to get chapter and verse of what she'll do, although there's plenty of ideas knocking around in the newspapers, but she'll give some hints of it and of what she wants to do as Prime Minister. Will she talk a bit about her story, her beginnings with left-wing parents in Leeds, going to a comprehensive school and not expecting, perhaps in her wildest dreams, to be a Conservative Prime Minister. She will tell us a bit about herself, then she will get into Downing Street and get on with the business of appointing her Cabinet, who will meet for the first time on Wednesday and then it's straight into Prime Minister's questions and the very difficult business of governing. They will need to sign off, of course, her energy bill package and we may hear about that in the coming days. So uh, there's no time really to get her feet under the table and very little time, very little political honeymoon really for Liz Truss, who takes over just two years before the general election. But a new team and a new approach under the Foreign Secretary who was not that well known to the public before this leadership race and we're yet to see really what sort of Prime Minister she may be. Yeah, we'll find out in the coming hours tomorrow, Cohen. Thank you very much for that. Plenty more analysis uh, from us here at Downing Street in the next hour. Stay with us. Con eso ya podemos ir evaluando entonces cómo el cambio climático va a afectar estos ecosistemas. Y eso cómo afecta prácticamente toda la cadena. O sea, si afectamos a los productores primarios, que son las microalgas, vamos a ver afectado obviamente todo el resto de los organismos.
This is Sky News Today, live from Downing Street. It is 10 a.m. That's it, folks. Boris Johnson finally bows out, promising to get behind the new Prime Minister in a defiant final speech. I am now like one of those booster rockets that has fulfilled its function, and I will now be gently re-entering the atmosphere and splashing down invisibly in some remote and obscure corner of the Pacific. A fond farewell from the staff fads Downing Street as Boris Johnson leaves number 10 for the last time. He's now on his way to Balmoral to meet the Queen and formally hand over the reins of power to his successor. This trust is to be in her first day as Prime Minister facing an energy crisis but promising a £100 billion energy price freeze that could last until the next election. We'll have all the latest from here at Downing Street and from Balmoral as the keys to Downing Street are handed over and the new Prime Minister begins her work. Hello and good morning from Downing Street, where Boris Johnson has said his final goodbyes, promising to get behind the new Prime Minister, Liz Truss, every step of the way. Mr Johnson is now on his way to Balmoral to meet the Queen and formally hand in his resignation. Now, in his final speech as Prime Minister, Boris Johnson described himself as a booster rocket that has fulfilled its function at championing his administration's achievements, highlighting the Brexit deal that he said he's got done, the vaccine rollout and the UK's response to the war in Ukraine. Well, this is, this is it, folks. Thank you, everybody, for coming out so early this morning. In only a couple of hours, I will be in Balmoral to see Her Majesty the Queen. And the torch will finally be passed to a new Conservative leader. The baton will be handed over in what has unexpectedly turned out to be a relay race. They changed the rules halfway through, but never mind that now. And through that lacquered black door, a new Prime Minister will shortly go to meet a fantastic group of public servants. The people who got Brexit done, the people who delivered the fastest vaccine rollout in Europe and never forget, 70% of the entire population got a dose within six months faster than any comparable country. That is government for you. That's this Conservative government. People who organised those prompt early supplies of weapons to the heroic Ukrainian armed forces, an action that may very well have helped change the course of the biggest European war for 80 years. And looking at what is happening in this country, the changes that are taking place, that is why private sector investment is flooding in. More private sector, more venture capital investment than China itself. More billion pound tech companies sprouting here in the UK than in France, Germany and Israel combined. And as a result, unemployment, as I leave office, unemployment down to lows not seen since I was about 10 years old and bouncing around on a space hopper, my friends. And on, on, the subject of, on the subject of bouncing around in future careers, let me say that I am now like one of those booster rockets that has fulfilled its function, and I will now be gently re-entering the atmosphere and splashing down invisibly in some remote and obscure corner of the Pacific. <laughs> and like Cincinnatus, I am returning to my plough, and I will be offering this government nothing but the most fervent support. This is, I'll tell you why, this is a tough time for the economy. This is a tough time for families up and down the country. We can and we will get through it and we will come out stronger the other side. But I say to my fellow Conservatives, it's time for politics to be over, folks. It's time for us all to get behind Liz Truss and her team and her programme and deliver for the people of this country. Because that is what the people of this country want, that's what they need, and that's what they deserve. Together, we have laid foundations that will stand the test of time, whether by taking back control of our laws or putting in vital new infrastructure. Great, solid 
masonry on which we will continue to build together, paving, paving the path of prosperity now and for future generations. And I will be supporting Liz Truss and the new government every step of the way. Thank you all very much. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Boris Johnson's final words there as Prime Minister. About seven and a bit minutes that speech was uh, tomorrow, laying out uh, exactly how he plans to support Liz Trust, but also going through some of his greatest hits, some of the achievements he feels that he has made during his time in office. Um, what did you make of what you heard Boris Johnson and the setup that we had out here as he gave his speech? Indeed, the last words we will hear from Boris Johnson as Prime Minister and Typically, it was fizzing with energy. He was talking about what he believes his great achievements are, some genuinely the vaccine rollout and support for the Ukrainian people, some that his critics would quibble with, the 40 new hospitals he says we'll have by the end of the decade uh, and the 50,000 new nurses he promised to recruit. Overall, it was jovial. It wasn't emotional like some of his predecessors have been. It's not his style. He's not Theresa May. It also didn't have the solemnity of, for example, Gordon Brown's speech when he talked about the honour of serving and serving through a difficult period of the financial crisis. This was very much upbeat, uh, very boosterish, as we've come to expect from Boris Johnson, and with a little hint at the end there of perhaps a comeback. There was a dig at his colleagues. This wasn't a bitter speech like we saw when he resigned a couple of months ago and talked about how his colleagues had basically pulled the rug from under him. He said it turned out to be a relay race and they changed the rules halfway through, but he said let's not talk about yes, that now. Well that. Then at the end he said, like Cincinnatus, who's a Roman statesman, we learn, I will return to my plough but there is some debate about whether Cincinnatus, this is two and a half thousand years ago, uh, in fact, left his farm and returned to help out the Roman Republic later on. So was this a hint of a comeback that he's left us to chew on for the rest of the day, perhaps? But I think Boris Johnson, in typical style, not much remorse, not much self-reflection about how it all went wrong for him and suggesting that maybe we have not heard the last of him. Uh, leaving it very, very open-ended there tomorrow. Appreciate that analysis. Thank you so much. Now, Boris Johnson has made his way from Downing Street uh, in that Range Rover to RAF Norfolk, where he got on a jet to fly to Balmora. Now, he landed at Aberdeen Airport in uh, the past hour or so, and James Matthews is at Aberdeen Airport uh, as Boris Johnson touched down. James, uh, tell us what happens now. Where is Boris Johnson off to next? Well, he's on his way by road, thankfully, towards Balmoral. I say thankfully because, take a look at this Aberdeen Airport P-Super uh, next to the North Sea. And I can tell you, we didn't see much of Boris Johnson because of the sight of the aircraft that he disembarked from. I think we'll see even less of Liz Truss, who is on her way. But, um, you know, it's thick mist. I mean, this is uh, not what I would call, or anyone would call, ideal flying conditions. There was a lot that went into the planning of this journey, first of all to Aberdeen, then onward to Balmoral. There was the option of a helicopter discussed. They will be happy that they opted for the car convoy because this is not great helicopter weather at all indeed. North Sea helicopter pilots, there are many around here, they know a thing or two about putting aircraft in the air from Aberdeen Airport. They were rushing out this morning to catch the good weather before this har rolled in. So, yeah, Liz Truss is on her way and she too will make her way to Balmoral by convoy, escorted by police. As she makes her way and contemplates the land that she will govern, she may well reflect on the Scotland that she knew as a child, of course, because she spent eight years in Paisley. Her dad took a job in 1979 at the Paisley College of Technology, and Liz Truss remembers it fondly. She was quite politically active. Her mother took her on CND marches whilst she lived there. She also took part in a school play, and she performed the role of who else? Her hero, her political hero, Margaret Thatcher, and she recalls getting no votes when that came to pass. The big question, of course, in terms of the politics and where she goes from here is where she takes the union, how she connects or disconnects with Nicola Sturgeon. Nicola Sturgeon was dismissed by Liz Truss, you'll remember, as an attention seeker who deserved to be ignored. And Nicola Sturgeon, in her, in her turn, uh, she said that Liz Truss would be a disaster as a prime minister. Since then, she has said 
since the appointment, she said that she wants to work constructively with Liz Truss. So time will tell how the politics and the chemistry go on that one. Much to be discussed, particularly talk of a new referendum act being floated that would involve a yes vote on independence being declared if more than 50% of the whole Scottish electorate voted yes, not 50% of those who voted. That's a plan that's been floated over the weekend. We'll see if that comes to pass in reality. We'll find out in due course. James Matthews at uh, P Super in Aberdeen. Appreciate that. Uh, and as James mentioned, now that Boris Johnson has touched down at Aberdeen, he's making his way in convoy to Balmoral to officially tender his resignation to the Queen. And, and waiting outside Balmoral is our royal correspondent, Rhiannon Mills. Uh, and Rhiannon, just take us through what the process will be once uh, Mr Johnson arrives there and meets Her Majesty. So, as James mentioned there, the logistics around this have all been very carefully planned. And yesterday we were being told that Boris Johnson was due to arrive here at about 10 past 11. So we've got around an hour to go. That car journey, um, if you're driving it just by yourself without a police convoy, would normally take about 50 minutes, an hour. So I suspect potentially Boris Johnson and Carrie Johnson being held somewhere to make sure that they don't arrive too early uh, here to meet the Queen. It was actually last week that we were told that this is how it was all going to happen. Of course, a complete change from the rest of the Queen's 70-year reign. Every one of her 14 Prime Ministers has always been appointed at Buckingham Palace. So to a degree, a sense of shock last week that they had decided to rip up the rule book and make it all happen here. But I think from all sides, it was decided that it was simply practical. And when it comes to the Queen, actually, that is really the mantra now. And I think for the palace, they decided that, yes, she is still having those mobility problems. No sense that she's deteriorated in any way across the summer. But it could have been that she was going to fly down to London and then simply woke up in the morning and wasn't feeling up to it. So instead, of course, she is not the only important person today. There's an outgoing and in ingoing prime minister to consider as well. So at least everyone knew the plan. And that now is what we're seeing happening this morning. Of course, we're used to the whole process normally happening over kind of a couple of hours, that handover of power. So already this morning is looking very different. But one aspect that won't look different and an aspect that we don't see up close is the formality of it all. Boris Johnson, of course, has had many meetings with the Queen throughout his premiership. Today will be his final meeting. And so much was made, wasn't it, in that first speech that he made announcing that he was going to step aside. The fact he didn't use that word resignation. Today, he will have to formally tell the Queen his intention to resign and at that moment he will also tell her that he recommends that Liz Truss uh, be called to form a new government. Of course we know that Liz Truss well, she's already in the air. She's already on her way. So the usual phone call that would be made by the Queen's private secretary summoning Liz Truss, well, that won't happen. Instead, Liz Truss will arrive here. The Queen, in what's described as a kissing of hands ceremony, no kissing, simply a handshake, will ask her to form a new administration. And as soon as Liz Truss says yes, then that is the moment that she becomes prime minister. We're still waiting to find out whether or not spouses will be allowed in to meet the Queen. Uh, so lots up in the air in terms of that. Um, but certainly a real moment for Boris Johnson as he says his farewell uh, to the Queen and Liz Truss begins a very important relationship with the monarch. Absolutely right. OK, round on Ian Balmoral. Do appreciate that reporting. Thank you more from your course throughout the day here on Sky. Now, to some polling, and it's consistently pointed to victory for Liz Truss in the leadership, but also showed differences between the Conservative voters who voted for her and the electorate as a whole. Let's bring in a polling expert, Chris Curtis from Opinion Polling, uh, for more detail on some of the research that's been done in the past uh, few weeks. Uh, Chris Curtis, good to have you with us now. Let's first of all look at um, how Liz Truss is being viewed by voters in terms of whether they feel that she's in touch. And there's been an interesting change in how voters feel Liz Truss connects with them and sort of understands their concerns. Yes, yeah, so obviously over the summer we have been polling Conservative Party members who have just uh, elected Liz Truss leader of the party. Our final poll was the most accurate. We're very proud of that. But also we've been polling voters out there in the country to see what their views are. You know, Liz Truss wasn't particularly well known over the start of summer. So it's a really interesting question what voters are going to think of her as they start to get her to know her. And, you know, right at the start of summer we did start to see her polling numbers increase a little bit. You know, more people saying that they liked her. But actually, as time's gone on, uh, those numbers have gone down again. And, you know, there's a lot of opportunities for her to turn this around, of course, but she starts the job um, as a not particularly popular new prime minister. 
Okay, Chris, I think we can bring up the, the figures as well that we have on this. I mean, the percentage that um, was, was uh, put forward by those you spoke to before has now dropped below 0%. Is that right? Yeah, so what we're looking at is um, even Conservative voters specifically, more of them say that she doesn't look like a Prime Minister in waiting than does look like a Prime Minister in waiting. Um, you know, more people, more of them say that they think she'll be an incompetent leader than a competent leader. And, you know, these are the people, you know, she needs to win almost all of those people, all of the, almost all of those who voted Conservative at the last general election. She needs to win the, almost all of their support at the next general election um, if she, you know, wants to remain in power and replicate that result. Uh, that Boris Johnson did in 2019. The Conservative Party just got rid of Boris Johnson because it no longer looked like he could do it. But actually, Liz Truss is taking over, um, and you know she's not. She's not. You know, a majority of Conservative Party voters are currently don't have a particularly favourable view of her either. Now, you know, I don't want to read too much into this. She will have lots of opportunities to turn this around. And, you know, most people out there in the country still don't have a particularly strongly held view about her. So, for example, um, you know, we're going to see a big cost of living plan this week to try and address the rise in energy bills this winter. How that goes down with the public will be a really significant moment very early on in her premiership that I think will start to shape how voter, uh, voters view her. So lots of opportunities for her to turn this around, but she doesn't start off in a particularly good place. OK, Chris Curtis, uh, from Opinion Poll, do appreciate uh, your analysis this morning. Thank you. Now, Melissa Truss arrives in at Downing Street later on this afternoon. It will be the start of an exceptionally busy month for her as the new Prime Minister. She's heading to Balmoral right now to meet the Queen, where she will officially be appointed PM. She'll then come back here to London, where she'll give her first speech as leader outside of Number 10. Now, senior officials are going to be installed in Number 10 immediately, while the first members of Liz Truss's new cabinet will be announced shortly thereafter. Now, on Wednesday, Ms. Truss will face MPs at Prime Minister's questions for the first time. In the days after, she'll appoint other government ministers, of course. Now, her first foreign trip is going to be in less than two weeks. The new PM will attend the UN General Assembly in New York. That's on the 19th of September. But before that, there is likely to be something of an emergency budget to try and deal with the cost of living crisis. Then later on the 5th of October, there'll be Conservative Party conference where this trust will speak to the members. Now, in Northern Ireland, this trust faces the twin challenges of a standoff with the European Union and trying to re-establish power sharing between Stormont's fierce rivals. So let's go to Stormont now, where our senior island correspondent David Levins is standing by. Uh, uh, David, good to have you with us again. So look, I'm made it very simple there, the, the issues that are facing this trust in dealing with Northern Ireland. Just lay out for us uh, just how much of a task she has ahead of her. Well, it's difficult to see how the new Prime Minister is going to square this circle because, of course, we've heard again this morning the outgoing Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, talking about having got Brexit done. But as far as Northern Ireland is concerned, it's not done because the Northern Ireland Protocol, the Brexit trading arrangement that created a border in the Irish Sea to avoid the need for a border on this island, is the very reason the DUP will not return to the power-sharing government here three months after the election. Now, they want Liz trust to uh, honour her commitment to remove the protocol. But that's easier said than done because Sinn Féin won that election. They, like the majority of uh, politicians elected here to the Assembly, believe the protocol is the inevitable consequence of Brexit and to remove it would be a breach of international law in their opinion. So does she... Uh, respond to what the DUP wants in order to get Stormont back up and running uh, and, and by so doing risk the possibility of a trade war with the EU. The last thing really that the UK would need in the middle of a cost of living crisis. OK, David Blevins, Stormont, thank you for that. Now, the incoming Prime Minister grew up in Leeds, so let's go back to her hometown and find out what people there want to hear from her when she finally addresses the nation this afternoon. Fraser Maud is in Leeds for us this morning. So, Fraser, just tell us what are people there telling you they want to hear from the new Prime Minister? Yeah, they want to hear movement on energy bills, that's for sure. I'm here in Kirkgate Market, right in the heart of the city. I'll have a chat now with one of the market traders here, Paddy, just in the middle of serving a customer. Sorry, Paddy, to oh, interrupt. No what do you want to hear from our new Prime Minister, Liz Truss? Well, 
So long as she promises what she preaches, that's the best thing. You get me? Been in here, has it been tough? Have you noticed people with less money to spend? Well, less money to spend, more haggling. It's a market in it at the end of the day, so, you know, you can't really win either way, but it's not easy for everyone. Have you noticed business yeah. dropping off recently? It's dropping off, kind of, but we sell food that's like a staple diet for people, so it's a bit different, but our expenses are very high, yeah. At least um, fuel's come down a bit, cos I live in Bradford, so I travel to Leeds every day. So it's a bit, you know... But like I said, it's... Everyone's struggling, don't get me. Even traders, you know. I mean, we're struggling, kind of, but the thing is, it's... It'll get worse. It'll get worse. You can't blame the war in Ukraine for everything. Do you get me? But like I said, it's, it is what it is, isn't it? You have to just take it with a pinch of salt. Do you get on, me? Keep on keeping on. Oh, that's it, yeah. All but... right, Paddy. Thanks ever so much for talking to us. Nice speaking I'll to you. I'll let you get back to it. it. You easy. take care. So practice what you preach. That's what they want to uh, see uh, here in Leeds Market. They want uh, Liz Trust to get on top of the cost of living crisis and do that as quickly as possible. Absolutely right, Fraser. And thank you, Paddy. Look, I've got some lovely produce there at Leeds Market. Now, you're watching Sky News today and still to come. We'll look at the big economic challenges facing the new Prime Minister as soon as she enters number 10. Stuart Ramsey and I'm Sky's chief correspondent. Well, there's a real sense now that people are beginning to expect that this whole airlift is coming to an end and they're really, really desperate. We saw snatch squads going in, grabbing people and putting them into trucks. You either live and recover or you die. OK, so that's like a war. That's the war, yes. Yeah. We help you understand the world with us. Over the past 24 hours, the soldiers have been attacked on a number of occasions. It's really sending a clear message that Venezuela is eager for change. We've been crushed. To take you to the heart of stories that shape our world. They were convinced the United States would become hooked. Well, we're right. Enormous explosion has just come down. I think it was a monster that just landed in between us. The information on this could bring down the entire network, not just in Iraq and Syria, but across the world. It's not out of control, but it's here we're drawing. It's so, so hot. Hello and welcome back. You're watching Sky News today live from Downing Street. Now, who could be working in the new top team under the new Prime Minister, Liz Truss? Her cabinet is rumoured to include Kwasi Kwarteng, Swala Braverman, James Cleverley, Therese Coffey and Jacob Rees-Mogg. Now, will they all make the grade and get new jobs? The former Sky News presenter and political editor Adam Bolton joins us now for his analysis on what we can expect from his cabinet. Adam, good to have you with us this morning. So what do you make of those rumours? Does it seem likely that those people will be in those top jobs? Well, I think it's pretty clear, as you say, that the top jobs uh, have been handed out. It would be a shock now if Kwasi Kwarteng isn't the next Chancellor, uh, James Cleverley, uh, the next Foreign Secretary, and Suella Braverman, uh, the next Home Secretary, because, of course, uh, Priti Patel announced that she was going to the backbenches yesterday. And that will be 
one first. It'll mean it'll be the first time uh, that in the top four great offices of state, as they're called, uh, there isn't a single white man. Uh, but uh, I think lower down uh, the batting order, uh, as ever with cabinet reshuffles, it's proving a little bit more difficult uh, than might have been expected. Uh, Northern Ireland secretary, for example, was being pensioned in, uh, penciled in for Sajid Javid. Uh, he's now said that he wants to go to the back benches as well. Uh, we know Connor Burns would like that job. Uh, we know Robert Buckland also uh, was interested in doing it, but he appears uh, to be going to Wales. And uh, likewise, uh, some question over Leader of the House. It was being said that Ian Duncan Smith might come in or come back as Leader of the House. Now appears more likely that that's going to go to the uh, runner-up, number three runner-up in this leadership contest, uh, Penny Mordaunt. Uh, and also some question over who's going to go to health. Again, it's been suggested that Therese Coffey may be heading in that direction. Uh, on the other hand, she is one of the closest political allies uh, of Liz Truss and uh, the new Prime Minister may want to see her going somewhere else. Now, the plan is that Liz Truss is clearly working now uh, on her Cabinet appointments and they would like uh, to have a full Cabinet sheet available pretty much by the time she gets back uh, to make her statement as Prime Minister, uh, either on the doorstep of Number 10, depending on the weather, or inside Number 10, uh, round about tea time. They would like pretty much to announce the Cabinet then and then quite possibly even to have a Cabinet meeting this evening. Uh, my guess is it may just take that little bit longer. That's nothing unusual. That's how uh, cabinet reshuffles tend to go. Yeah, they could still have it in place uh, tomorrow morning before PMQs, couldn't they, Adam? Um, and that probably wouldn't be too bad if it gives them more time to make sure. Because my next question really is, uh, uh, are we confident that this cabinet will sort of have the breadth of the party? Because one of the other challenges facing the trust, apart from her economic policies and, and how she's going to run the country, is trying to bring the Conservative Party back together. Well, I think you can say that this is not going to be a government of all the talents. We're not seeing One Nation Conservatives uh, being speculated on about joining uh, in uh, the uh, new cabinet. We're not really seeing uh, supporters of Rishi Sunak uh, being talked about. I mean, you might think of uh, names like Jeremy Hunt as a One Nation person. Uh, and also uh, you might think about uh, Sunak himself, perhaps, of getting the cabinet. That's not going to happen. So this is going to be a fairly right of centre within the Conservative Party, Boris Johnson loyalist uh, type of cabinet. And particularly when you've got people like uh, Sajid Javid saying they're not going to be in it, that will, uh, that will only increase uh, that. Interesting, however, uh, that Nadine Dorries uh, is another one who said that she's uh, going to the back benches and quite possibly going to the House of Lords uh, sooner on. Uh, she was one of the early supporters of Liz Truss, but that kind of culture warrior uh, is not going to be in the culture department. And that, uh, I think, gives Liz, chance, Liz Truss a chance to be a bit more pragmatic, perhaps, in her approach and to try and uh, maybe damp down the culture war rhetoric a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I suppose there will be plenty of culture warriors still there. Kevin Badenoch is tipped for a, a job and Jacob Rees-Mogg too. Uh, and I wonder if we do see a cabinet made up like that, Adam, what does that do when uh, Liz Truss and that cabinet eventually have to go to the country? Well, I think that's the big question, Mark. I, you know, the Conservatives are trailing Labour at the moment and you have to ask yourself, is Liz Truss becoming Prime Minister going to give them a boost? And are there any people that she can put in the Cabinet that are going to make people think, uh, maybe uh, I ought to take another look at the Conservatives' floating voters? And so far, I mean, Kemi Badnight, you mentioned that name, is perhaps one. Tom Tugendhat is perhaps another. But we're not quite clear yet uh, where they're going to settle uh, in the lineup. OK, Adam, always appreciate your analysis. Thanks for being with us. All right, you are watching Sky News today and still to come. Boris Johnson's resignation speech. We'll bring it to you in full, all seven minutes, 47 seconds of it. Stay with us.
Hello and welcome back. You're watching Sky News today, live from Downing Street. Let me bring you a little bit of breaking news that's coming to us in the past few minutes here at Sky News. You'll, of course, remember the killing of a nine-year-old Olivia pratt Corbell just a couple of weeks ago, shot by an unknown person in our home in Liverpool, shot and killed. Her mother was injured in the incident and, and police are still hunting for the gunman in Liverpool and asking anyone with information to come forward. Now, Olivia's family have put out a statement in the past few um, minutes and I just want to read some of it to you. Um, words can't express the pain we're going through after Olivia was so cruelly snatched away from us. Those responsible need to know what they have done. Olivia was a real bright spark who knew her own mind and had no problem making friends. She would talk to anyone and loved to laugh and make people laugh. She could be a proper wind-up merchant and loved to wind her nieces up, particularly those who were older than her. When they didn't like it, she'd just laugh and say, don't forget, I'm your auntie. Now, Olivia's future has been cruelly snatched away from her and we have been deprived of a real light in our lives. Now, we know that there's been an exceptional response to police appeals and we would like to thank those who've come forward. At the same time, we want to urge others who may have evidence to keep coming forward with information which could help put those responsible for Olivia's murder behind bars. The statement goes on to say, we've been really taken aback by the kindness and support we've received from family, friends and neighbours in the last two weeks and we'd like to thank them for being there for us. We know that most people on Merseyside are good-hearted and kind, just like them, and we all need to stand together. We don't want to see another child lose their life in such horrendous circumstances and we don't want to see another family suffer like we are suffering now. Now, Olivia's death cannot be in vain and we want people to feel safe and be safe. That will only happen if we all come together and make sure there is no place for guns or those who use guns on our streets or in our communities. If you have any information, make sure you tell the police. And if you don't feel able to do that, give the information to Crime Stoppers anonymously so action can be taken. If you can't do it yourself, do it, for Oliv do it in Olivia's name and for children across Merseyside who deserve to enjoy their lives to the full. Now, that is a statement, as you said, released by uh, Olivia pratt Corbell's father, John Francis Pratt, in the last few minutes here, uh, laying out what Olivia was like um, and appealing again for assistance and help from anyone who may have information into who pulled the trigger, uh, resulting in her death. There have, of course, in, in the past week or so, been a number of arrests. Four people are being held in custody in connection with this killing, and police are continuing to appeal for any more information to find out who killed Olivia. All right, let's return it to the politics now. Uh, and this morning, Boris Johnson left down the street for the final time after delivering a speech outside of Number 10 in which he promised his fervent support for his successor and likened himself to a booster rocket returning to Earth. Here is his speech in full. Thank you. Thank you. Well, well this, is, this is it, folks. Thank you, everybody, for coming out so early this morning. In only a couple of hours, I will be in Balmoral to see Her Majesty the Queen. And the torch will finally be passed to a new Conservative leader. The baton will be handed over in what has unexpectedly turned out to be a relay race. They changed the rules halfway through, but never mind that now. And through that lacquered black door, a new Prime Minister will shortly go to meet a fantastic group of public servants. The people who got Brexit done. The people who delivered the fastest vaccine rollout in Europe and never forget, 70% of the entire population got a dose within six months faster than any comparable country. That is government for you. That's this Conservative government. People who organised those prompt early supplies of weapons to the heroic Ukrainian armed forces, an action that may very well have helped change the course of the biggest European war for 80 years. And because of the speed and urgency of what you did, everybody involved in this government, to get this economy moving again from July last year, in spite of all the opposition, all the naysayers, we have and will continue 
to have that economic strength to give people the cash they need to get through this energy crisis that has been caused by Putin's vicious war. And I know that Liz, Truss, and this compassionate Conservative government will do everything we can to get people through this crisis, and this country will endure it, and we will win. And if Putin thinks that he can succeed by blackmailing or bullying the British people, then he is utterly deluded. And the reason we will have those funds now and in the future is because we Conservatives understand the vital symmetry between government action and free market capitalist private sector enterprise. We're delivering on those huge manifesto commitments, making streets safer, neighbourhood crime down 38% in the last three years, 13,790 more police on the streets, building more hospitals, and yes, we will have 50,000 more nurses by the end of the decade, and 40 more hospitals by the end of, 50,000 nurses by the end of this parliament, I should say, 40 new hospitals by the end of the decade putting record funding into our schools and into teachers' pay, giving everybody over 18 a lifetime skills guarantee so they can keep upskilling throughout their lives. Three new high-speed rail lines, three, including Northern Powerhouse Rail, colossal road pro programs from the Pennines uh, to Cornwall, the rollout of gigabit broadband up over the last three years, I am proud to say, since you were kind enough to elect me from 7% of our country's premises having gigabit broadband to 70% today. And we are, of course, providing the short and the long-term solutions for our energy needs, and not just using more of our own domestic hydrocarbons, but going up by 2030 to 50 gigawatts of wind power. That is half our, this country's energy electricity needs from offshore wind alone. A new nuclear reactor every year. And looking at what is happening in this country, the changes that are taking place, that is why private sector investment is flooding in. More private sector, more venture capital investment than China itself. More billion pound tech companies sprouting here in the UK than in France, Germany and Israel combined. And as a result, unemployment, as I leave office, unemployment down to lows not seen since I was about 10 years old and bouncing around on a space hopper, my friends. And on, on, the subject of, on the subject of bouncing around in future careers, let me say that I am now like one of those booster rockets that has fulfilled its function, and I will now be gently re-entering the atmosphere and splashing down invisibly in some remote and obscure corner of the Pacific. And like Cincinnatus, I am returning to my plough. And I will be offering this government nothing but the most fervent support. This is, I'll tell you why, this is a tough time for the economy. This is a tough time for families up and down the country. We can and we will get through it and we will come out stronger the other side. But I say to my fellow Conservatives, it's time for politics to be over, folks. It's time for us all to get behind Liz Truss and her team and her programme and deliver for the people of this country. Because that is what the people of this country want, that's what they need, and that's what they deserve. I'm proud to have discharged the promises I made to my party when uh, you were kind enough to choose me. Winning the biggest majority since 1987, the biggest share of the vote since 1979. Delivering Brexit, delivering our manifesto commitments, including, by the way, including social care, reforming social care, helping people up and down the country, ensuring that Britain is once again standing tall in the world, speaking with clarity and authority from Ukraine to the AUKUS pact with America and Australia. Because we are one whole and entire united kingdom whose diplomats, security services and armed forces are so globally admired. And by the way, as I, believe, I, as I leave, I believe our union is so strong that those who want to break it up, they'll keep trying, but they will never, ever succeed. Thank you to everybody behind me in this building. Thank you to all of you in government 
Uh, thank you, everybody who's helped look after me and my family over the last three years, including, including Dylan, the dog. And I just say to my party, if Dylan and Larry can put behind them their occasional difficulties, then so can the Conservative Party. Above all, thanks to you, the British people, to the voters for giving me the chance to serve, all of you who worked so tirelessly together to beat COVID, to put us where we are today. Together, we have laid foundations that will stand the test of time, whether by taking back control of our laws or putting in vital new infrastructure. Great, solid masonry on which we will continue to build together. Paving, paving the path of prosperity now and for future generations. And I will be supporting Liz Truss and the new government every step of the way. Thank you all very much. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Now, of course, the new Prime Minister Liz Truss is thought to be drawing up plans to deal with a cost of living crisis that could see £100 billion worth of support. The emergency package is expected to include a freeze for energy bills for homes and businesses until January next year and possibly until 2024. Now, it's thought that energy suppliers will be able to take out government-backed loans to subsidise those bills. So let's bring in our business presenter, Ian King, for his analysis on, on that proposal. Uh, good morning to you, Ian. So uh, I spoke to Paul Johnson from the IFS the other day, and he said that although he hates that idea of a policy, it might be the only thing left open to the government. Yes, that's right. I mean, the government has had various choices. It's really chiefly as to whether it goes for targeted support, i.e. helping the most vulnerable households and businesses, or whether it opts for blanket support. Now, the current uh, government uh, support in place is a kind of mixture of the two, because bear in mind that we've got this uh, £400 flat rebate to household energy bills due to be paid later in the year. There are also council tax rebates for less well-off households, and there's also targeted support uh, via the benefit system. That comes to a total of some £37 billion. That's what's on the table at the moment. So, as I say, it's a hybrid of blanket and targeted support. What Liz Truss and her team look to have come down on, though, on the side of, is some sort of blanket support. And that's why you're getting these enormous uh, costings of up to £100 billion being thrown around. Now, what we don't know is how the government would pay for this, whether it would be simply government borrowing or whether it would be uh, b borrowing by the energy companies themselves, by the industry, with state guarantees. Either way, a big increase in government borrowing is implicit in that, and you can see what the bond market thinks of that, because government uh, bond yields, that's uh, government IO yields, have been rising very steadily. If you take 10-year gilts, 10-year government IOUs, well, the yield on those has risen from 1.7 per cent at the beginning of August to just under 3 per cent today. So that uh, tells you what the market thinks. Investors are looking for a premium for lending to the UK government. So, as I say, we think that Liz Truss is going to come down in favour of some big form of blanket support. Now, there are a lot of problems with that. The key, key one amongst them is that there's no incentive in this for households or businesses to save energy. And that is something that, obviously, higher prices incentivises people to do. It encourages people to spend less on their energy. You wouldn't get that with a blanket support scheme. And, accordingly, some energy analysts are saying, well, this could end up uh, resulting in rationing of power because, as I say, there will be no... Uh, incentive for anyone to save money. Also important in this, a big support package for businesses who've had absolutely nothing from the uh, Johnson government so far. We're being told that potentially £40 billion alone could be spent on supporting uh, ha uh, businesses. But in, in total, in general, it looks as though Liz Truss's government is going to come down in favour of freezing energy prices at the current price cap level of 1971 Obviously, they're due in October to rise to uh, £3,549. It doesn't look as though that is going to happen under what uh, Ms Truss is proposing. All right, Ian King, there in the city for us. Thank you. Now, Boris Johnson won an 80-seat majority back in 2019 with constituencies which had been Labour for generations. They finally turned blue for Mr Johnson. Now, they included Tony Blair's former seat in the north-east, Sedgefield, from where our chief North of England correspondent, Greg Milam, sent us this. They have a history with prime ministers in this part of the world, but just like everywhere else, the talk is of what the next one will do about the issues causing a creeping anxiety. It was different when their MP was PM and brought world leaders to the pub. And in truth, 
Liz Truss's big moment past the lunchtime crowd by at the Dun Cow Inn. Not that they don't care here. I don't think it's going to, she's going to be any good for the working class. I think it's going to be a north-south divide, even more so than it was. And I fear, I so fear for the NHS. I feel for the people that are living from day to day and I worry about the gas and electricity. I really worry. Three years ago, a victorious Boris Johnson came to pull a pint at the cricket club to celebrate the Tories demolishing the blue wall of once safe Labour seats like this one. The local newspaper front page back then reflected that Tory tidal wave across the north. Today's tells a very different story. The business community here in the north calling on Liz Truss to deliver what Boris Johnson promised here three years ago to prevent what they say is a coming disaster for communities like this. It's already arrived for some. This community project's been forced to close because of spiralling costs. The communities are all struggling and it's, it's real life. This is what happens on the ground now. And its founder hardly reassured by the change in number 10. She's said already that she's going to take a week to come out with what she thinks is her plan. That concerns me because there's a lot of people who need that information sooner. Businesses have closed too. Those surviving, like Betty's Boudoir, say they have to have hope. We're in a, a state of not knowing what's going to happen over the winter time and everything. Everybody's worried, everybody's concerned, and we can feel that with business. I do like the idea that she's a lady and that, that that's good, good for us women. <laughs> but um, I just hope she's strong enough to cope with the job. They've seen prime ministers come and go here, but rarely has this community, so many communities, felt so vulnerable and so in need of some certainty. Greg Milam, Sky News, Sedgefield. We're well, watching Sky News today and still to come. We'll be asking the uh, political commentator, uh, Sam Friedman, about the transfer of power from one prime minister to the next. Stuart Ramsey and I'm Sky's chief correspondent. Well, there's a real sense now that people are beginning to expect that this whole airlift is coming to an end and they're really, really desperate. We saw snatch squads going in, grabbing people and putting them into trucks. You either live and recover or you die. OK, so that's like a war. That's the war, yes. Yeah. We help you understand the world with us. Over the past 24 hours, the soldiers have been attacked on a number of occasions. It's really sending a clear message that Venezuela is eager for change. We've been crushed. To take you to the heart of stories that shape our world. They were convinced the United States would become hooked. Well, we're right. An enormous explosion has just come down. I think it was a monster that just landed in between us. The information on this could bring down the entire network, not just in Iraq and Syria, but across the world. It's not out of control, but the kid withdrawn. It's so, so hot. The inspiration behind our product came from understanding how big of a problem livestock meat and emissions were. Global Insight. 
made local. Invest in your future. Sky News Financial Reports, sponsored by Interactive Investor. Invest in your future. Sky News Financial Report, sponsored by Interactive Investor. Well, hello again from Downing Street as we're covering the transfer of power from Boris Johnson to Liz Truss. Let's bring in now Sam Friedman, who worked with Liz Truss at the Department for Education, where he was a senior advisor on schools. Sam Friedman, good morning to you and thanks for being with us. Now, first of all, Tamara tells me that you were right in your prediction and you got the, the margin of victory just about spot on. Thank you very much. <laughs> How were you able to get it so right? Uh, I just assumed that the polls would overestimate the level that Trust would win by, by the same that they overestimated the level Johnson would win by. They struggle a bit to get the Tory membership polled correctly. Uh, so I just thought it would be a bit closer than uh, the polls were suggesting. And of course, you worked uh, with Ms Trust at the Department for Education. I mean, what was she like there in, in terms of being open to new ideas, I mean, is she one of those people that you can give new ideas to? Is she pretty set on what she wants to see done? Uh, she has very strong ideas of her own. Um, she uh, She's very strong-minded. Uh, she's very interested in policy, uh, unlike Boris Johnson, um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and hangs on to her opinions tenaciously. But she does listen. She does engage with advisers. Um, and she will she will change her mind if the evidence is there for her to do so. But it sometimes took quite a long time to persuade her to change her mind on things. Uh, she is she is uh, she is uh, resilient and sticks to her views. Ms. Freeman, I apologise. I can't quite hear uh, your response uh, to my previous question, but I'll just carry on anyway. Now you say that she does listen to advice uh, from those around her. So how do you expect her to run the? Um, the operation out of Downing Street? Well, it looks already from what we know that she's going to run a much smaller number 10. Uh, she's appointed her sort of political team already, uh, and they're going to be people who are very loyal to her, people who've worked for her before. She's cleared out all of Boris Johnson's uh, advisors, her cabinet as well. She's picked people who are very loyal to her. She's not going to have people in that cabinet who backed other candidates particularly. Um, so it looks to me like she's intending to govern very much from the centre, govern very much with a team around her of people she trusts and believes in. Um, uh, and that does mean, that does risk uh, a sort of lack of diversity of thought coming into that bubble. Uh, and there is a risk she's only going to get advice from people she already agrees with. Yeah, and, and what are the dangers then of not having that kind of lack of diversity of thought in, when it comes to, to making policy? And of course, thinking that we're in such a consequential time for politics and for policies Absolutely. that we're in place. Um, you know, there's, there's some really big crises obviously going on at the moment and it's important if you're in uh, Downing Street not to fall into a kind of group think where you think you found the right answer straight away and you pursue that answer without anyone challenging it and saying, wait a minute, so, you know, we're hearing at the moment about the plan for energy and maybe they're going to add... Uh, the cost of energy now, they're going to get people paying it back over 10 or 20 years. I hope there's somebody in Downing Street saying, wait a minute, that's going to go down like a lead balloon with the British public. We might need to think about this differently. If there aren't people expressing those um, kind of different views and, and, and critiques, uh, then, then they're going to have a problem. OK, Sam Friedman, uh, former advisor who works with Liz Truss at the Department for Education. I do appreciate your time and analysis this morning. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that's almost it from me on Sky News today. Is uh, We've seen Boris Johnson give his final speech as Prime Minister. He is now in Scotland on his way to Balmoral to formally tender his resignation, having served three and a bit years uh, behind that door in number 10. A consequential Prime Minister who, uh, in his words, has got Brexit done, got the country through the pandemic, but his critics will say perhaps didn't live up to the promises that he made and, of course, will be viewed very differently by those who want to see him out of office. We'll have plenty more, of course, from Downing Street throughout the day here on Sky News as we await Liz Truss arriving back in London following meeting the Queen at Balmoral, where she will 
give her first address to the nation as PM. This is Sky News today, live from Downing Street. It's 11 o'clock. This is it, folks. Boris Johnson finally bows out, promising to get behind the new Prime Minister in a defiant final speech. I am now like one of those booster rockets that has fulfilled its function, and I will now be gently re-entering the atmosphere and splashing down invisibly in some remote and obscure corner of the Pacific. A fond farewell from Downing Street staff as Boris Johnson leaves number 10 for the last time. He's now on his way to Balmoral to meet Her Majesty the Queen and formally hand over the reins to his successor. Liz Truss is to begin her first day as Prime Minister, facing an energy crisis but promising a £100 billion energy price freeze that could last until the next election. I'm in Warrington looking at some of the big challenges facing the new Prime Minister as she begins her first day in the job. Well, we'll have all the latest from here and in Balmoral as the keys to number 10 are handed over and the new Prime Minister begins to form her government. A very good morning from Downing Street, where Boris Johnson has said his final goodbyes this morning, promising to get behind the new Prime Minister, Liz Truss, every step of the way. He's now on his way to Balmoral to meet the Queen and formally tender his resignation. In his final speech as Prime Minister, Mr Johnson described himself as a booster rocket that has fulfilled its function, championing his administration's achievements, highlighting Brexit, the vaccine rollout and the response to the war in Ukraine. Good morning. 
Well, this is, this is it, folks. Thank you, everybody, for coming out so early this morning. In only a couple of hours, I will be in Balmoral to see Her Majesty the Queen. And the torch will finally be passed to a new Conservative leader. The baton will be handed over in what has unexpectedly turned out to be a relay race. They changed the rules halfway through, but never mind that now. And through that lacquered black door, a new Prime Minister will shortly go to meet a fantastic group of public servants. The people who got Brexit done, the people who delivered the fastest vaccine rollout in Europe and never forget, 70% of the entire population got a dose within six months, faster than any comparable country. That is government for you. That's this Conservative government. People who organised those prompt early supplies of weapons to the heroic Ukrainian armed forces, an action that may very well have helped change the course of the biggest European war for 80 years. And looking at what is happening in this country, the changes that are taking place, that is why private sector investment is flooding in. More private sector, more venture capital investment than China itself. More billion pound tech companies sprouting here in the UK than in France, Germany and Israel combined. And as a result, unemployment, as I leave office, unemployment down to lows not seen since I was about 10 years old and bouncing around on a space hopper, my friends. And on, on, the subject of, on the subject of bouncing around in future careers, let me say that I am now like one of those booster rockets that has fulfilled its function, and I will now be gently re-entering the atmosphere and splashing down invisibly in some remote and obscure corner of the Pacific. And like Cincinnatus, I am returning to my plough. And I will be offering this government nothing but the most fervent support. This is, I'll tell you why, this is a tough time for the economy. This is a tough time for families up and down the country. We can and we will get through it and we will come out stronger the other side. But I say to my fellow Conservatives, it's time for politics to be over, folks. It's time for us all to get behind Liz Truss and her team and her programme and deliver for the people of this country. Because that is what the people of this country want, that's what they need, and that's what they deserve. Together, we have laid foundations that will stand the test of time, whether by taking back control of our laws or putting in vital new infrastructure. Great, solid masonry on which we will continue to build together. Paving, paving the path of prosperity now and for future generations. And I will be supporting Liz Truss and the new government every step of the way. Thank you all very much. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Well, Boris Johnson's last speech as Prime Minister there and uh, Liz Truss shortly to succeed him. We understand that she has just touched down, her aircraft has just touched down in Aberdeen, Aberdeen International in some, as you can see for yourself, some very foggy, some very difficult conditions, but uh, there it is, Liz Truss landing. Now, Boris Johnson is on a separate flight. His plane has already landed and we understand he is on his way to Balmoral to tender his resignation to Her Majesty the Queen. Liz Truss following by road shortly afterwards where after a brief interregnum when uh, interestingly uh, the Queen holds executive power between Prime Ministers for a minute or two. Uh, Liz Truss will accept the invitation to form a government and become the next Prime Minister. We'll, uh, be up in Balmoral and Aberdeen in a moment or two, but uh, let's talk now to our deputy political editor, Sam Coates. And uh, Sam, as I mentioned there, Liz Truss shortly, formally to become Prime Minister. Once that happens, we're going to see a very different style of governing, aren't we, from the uh, previous incumbent? That's right, Derbert. Liz Truss will be Britain's 56th Prime Minister. Halfway through a parliament, and it's going to be a massive change if the rhetoric of the people who have been helping her prepare for this moment lands, uh, stands up uh, to reality. 
This afternoon, we, she will give a speech giving the first taste of what a Liz Truss premiership uh, will be like when she is Prime Minister, and then she will begin uh, her Cabinet appointments. And what her allies say is that this is going to be a very different type of premiership to the one that's just ended. Now, yesterday, we may have seen Liz Truss pay tribute to her friend Boris Johnson. We may have heard Boris Johnson uh, just behind us a few hours ago uh, talk about all the achievements that he succeeded in doing. But there is a feeling amongst people around Liz Truss, Liz Truss herself, that there needs to be quite a sharp change in the way this government is, uh, this government uh, conducts itself, the priorities that a trust government will pursue. And number one, once we've dealt with the energy uh, cost, massive energy cost increase, for which we're expecting a, a policy where they will cap wholesale bills um, announced possibly as soon as this week, uh, we will see a singular focus on growth. Whereas Boris Johnson was talking about levelling up the word that I think Liz Truss most wants to be associated with is growth. And there will be a huge package. We will see tax cuts. We will see infrastructure plans. We will see all of the things that Tory prime ministers, bluntly, uh, for the last 12 years in, in Downing Street, have said that they wanted to pursue. She believes that she's found the right cocktail, the right mixture of plans and people to actually push through a big change to the way the British state... Is she a gambler, though? I mean, because that is quite a gamble, because everyone's talking now about things beyond her control. The markets, the people who buy UK bonds, the, the billions, the trillions that are invested in the United Kingdom, if they lose confidence, if they see inflation still soaring, if they see growth not happening, then she could be in trouble. Well, look, Dermot, you've touched on the risk. There's nobody here uh, in the Westminster... Uh, in this square mile that doesn't underestimate the challenges ahead. You're right. Uh, Liz Truss is promising growth at a time where a lot of forecasters, a lot of economists are saying that there could be a recession. Uh, she's coming into power after a very fractious battle with the Conservative Party, and so she's got to do it with a majority that uh, many of the MPs of the Conservative Party, something, uh, uh, something of a civil war for recent months, so she's got, to, uh, she's got to contest with that. And you're right, we're looking at 100, 120 billion pounds of borrowing. The international markets could end up being the ultimate judge and juror of the Liz Truss Premiership, and she will be hoping that they're not also the executioner. OK, thanks very much indeed for the time being. Sam Coates, our deputy political editor there. As I said, we're going to head uh, north now to Scotland and, first of all, to Balmoral, where Boris Johnson uh, is on his way by road from Aberdeen Airport to Balmoral to meet Her Majesty the Queen. Our royal correspondent, Rhiannon Mills, is there as well. Now, this, uh, Rhiannon, is a, is a carefully choreographed process of the resignation and then the anointing of Liz Truss as Prime Minister. It is, but we're so used to it happening where you are, aren't we? All of this kind of pa exchange of power happening within just a couple of hours as the cars to and fro between Number 10 and Buckingham Palace. This year, of course, it is completely different and a complete change from throughout the Queen's 70-year reign. All of her 14 Prime Ministers have always been appointed at Buckingham Palace, but it was decided last week, purely from a practical perspective, that rather than the Queen heading down to London, which we were told in the summer she was expected to, that she didn't mind doing that. Instead, it was decided that the outgoing and incoming Prime Ministers would instead be making that 1,000 mile round trip up here to Balmoral. Now, it has to be said, we are currently keeping our eyes peeled because we were told uh, that Boris Johnson was due to arrive here at about 10 past 11. I think both for Number 10 and Buckingham Palace, one thing that they have had to factor in that they normally don't have to factor in when it comes to these handover processes is the good old Scottish weather and arrangements already had to be changed this morning because they were anticipating that potentially a helicopter could be used to transport both Boris Johnson and Liz Truss from Aberdeen Airport uh, here to Balmoral Castle. Instead, they're having to travel by car. So at the moment, we're still waiting for Boris Johnson uh, to arrive, likely with Carrie Johnson, who we saw both of them getting off that plane at Aberdeen Airport, a journey of about an hour, 45 minutes, uh, when they're using that police convoy. So we wait for them to arrive. In terms of the practicalities, the logistics may be different, but when it comes down to the formalities of the day, 
it's going to be very much business as usual, just as we would see uh, inside Buckingham Palace. So Boris Johnson arrives, he resigns formally, of course, so much made the fact that he hadn't used that word resign when he said he was stepping aside uh, a couple of months ago. And he will then recommend that Liz Truss is called to form an administration. The Queen will then ask her to form a new government. At that moment, she becomes the new Prime Minister. Now, I'm very lucky to have Louise Tate uh, with me, who was the former Scottish Communications Secretary to the Queen. And Louise, this is all very carefully choreographed and it will also be very important that there are people there to meet Boris Johnson and Carrie Johnson when they arrive for this important final meeting. Who are those people likely to be? I think no different to what we would see, expect to see in London, in Buckingham Palace. There'll be probably the duty private secretary, possibly a lady in waiting, the equerry. Uh, they'll be there to meet the cars on arrival and then there'll be handshakes perhaps and then taken inside through the portico inside the castle. For all of us, it couldn't feel more different than standing on the Mall, seeing the cars turning and throwing. We are mm. somewhere that is much more remote, much more rural, but it is a place that the Queen loves spending time. And ultimately, she was here spending her, her summer holidays. Indeed, as she does every year, uh, joined by many members of her family um, who spend time here throughout the year, not just, not just in the summer. Um, so it is very important for the Queen, but it's very a place where she still continues the business of state. The red boxes, that's always happened, continues to happen. Um, and it is the place that she probably, up until perhaps moved to Windsor, that she spent the longest time <laughs> in one place. Yeah. In terms of the Queen, you were saying there, duty always comes first. Yeah. We're currently showing pictures now of Liz Truss making her way here. Of course, yeah. usually um, the Queen would have to get the private secretary to call Liz Truss to tell her to come for an audience. That, of course, isn't happening today. But the, the sense of that relationship that Liz Truss will now build um, mm. with the Queen is probably sorry, one of the most... Yeah. Sorry, there are many bugs <laughs> many 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 <laughs> That relationship for Liz Truss that she will start to build today with the Queen is so important, one of probably the most important relation, relationships of her premiership. Well, I would imagine so. For all of our... Um, pre pre Queen's previous Prime Ministers, they have openly said it's, it's been one of the most important relationships they ever had. She's a great confidant, they can speak freely, um, there is a, an understanding that, that those conversations will remain within that room. And that's the same with most audiences, that uh, these conversations remain. I'm just going quiet. to get you to pause there and step down okay. for me a bit, Louise, because we can see now that Boris Johnson and Carrie Johnson are arriving here at Buckingham Palace. Not at Buckingham Palace, at Balmoral. And they will now be driven the very short distance, just a couple of minutes up to the front of Balmoral Castle, where we anticipate that a camera is waiting and we will see the moment that they will be, as Louise said, let me move Louise around here, as Louise said, we will see the moment that Boris Johnson is met by usually the Queen's equerry and also her principal private secretary, who is Edward Young. Always the Queen has a private secretary with her because, as Louise was mentioning, the official duties of sovereign, of monarch, continue right throughout this summer break uh, here in Scotland. Let's bring Louise um, back in. Hopefully we will see some pictures from outside the front of, of Balmoral. What do you think that Boris Johnson and Carrie Johnson can expect when they arrive at the front of, of Balmoral as they're welcomed into the entrance? Because they have been here before, yes. haven't they? Yes, they have been here before, I believe, yeah. Well, I think the, the wonderful thing about driving up to Balmoral is that drive up and just getting a sense of the granite splendour of Balmoral Castle, because it, it is a castle, but it's quite an intimate castle all the same. Um, and it's a place they have seen before, but uh, perhaps in different, in different weather conditions, the atmosphere, it is a very place of atmosphere and drama. And we're seeing, Louise, now pictures of Boris Johnson uh, being met by... By Sir Edward Young. Sir Edward yeah. Young here. And also Sir Edward there shaking the hand of, of Carrie Johnson as well. And then they are welcomed inside. And Louise, we were talking about this earlier. Often there is a moment to kind of pause there in, in the entrance hall as the private secretary and others talk to those who are about to have that audience with the Queen about how things are likely to happen. Yes, I mean, it's understandable. Let's just give everybody a moment just to chat and acclimatise and just perhaps explain the logistic steps of what will happen next and there'll be a brief informal chat and then 
at the right and appropriate time. The Prime Minister will be invited by the equity to join him, to accompany him to the drawing room for his audience with the Queen. And it's worth saying, for the Prime Minister, this is the important moment where he, he resigns. He has that, that time with the Queen, that final moment. But also, in recent years, we have seen spouses invited in. I'm told that there's a buzzer in the room that the Queen may press to then allow Carrie Johnson to come in as well. And the Queen is particularly good at trying to put people at ease, you said. Oh, uh, yes. I mean, that's, that's well understood. I think she would probably begin by asking about the journey. I'm not sure, I'm speculating, but um, these are just things to, to ease into, the, into just what's happening today and, and you know, are, is everything all right? How's your journey been? Quite understandable. Very human conversation at the forum. Perhaps the more formal business begins, I would imagine. Louise, thank you very much. There is still plenty to talk about. And in the next few moments, no doubt, Boris Johnson will be welcomed into the drawing room for that final conversation with the Queen, the moment where he will formally resign as Prime Minister, where he will tell the Queen that Liz Truss should be invited to form a new government. It has been quite a couple of years for Boris Johnson. If you think about the conversations that him and the monarch must have had during the pandemic, sometimes remotely over the phone, um, which was, of course, a change from the usual weekly audiences that many prime ministers had. And today, another complete change, another history-making moment as the Queen is due to say farewell to her 14th prime minister and shortly welcome her 15th. OK, Rhiannon, thank you very much indeed. Back with you very soon uh, as the 15th Prime Minister uh, arrives shortly after Boris Johnson in Balmoral. Uh, she landed, Liz Truss, of course, we're talking about, she landed at Aberdeen Airport shortly after Mr Johnson's aircraft and we understand is on her way by road, as I say, a carefully choreographed operation. This there is only uh, a few minutes at the very most when there is no Prime Minister, when... In actual fact, Her Majesty the Queen holds executive powers once Boris Johnson has resigned and invited Her Majesty to ask this trust to form a government. She will be close behind, but they will not meet together. She will then be ushered in and asked to form a government by Her Majesty. Let's check in with James Matthews, who's at Aberdeen Airport, where, as we saw earlier, James, can, conditions are pretty tricky to get those planes down. Um, Liz Truss on her way, we understand. Yeah, she is now, uh, Dermot. Uh, the convoy has just left Aberdeen Airport, so she's on her way about an hour and a half from here to Balmoral. But you talk about careful choreography. I can tell you, Dermot, the elements in the northeast of Scotland will, be, will decide how things go down when it comes to traditional. It's been more functional than traditional. And when I say functional, I mean just because she was delayed for some considerable time. I reckon about... 20 to 25 minutes watching on the flight radar. Her uh, RAF aircraft was 12,000 feet in the air, circling above Aberdeen Air Aberdeenshire because Aberdeen Airport was shrouded in mist. Nothing was landing. You could hear the helicopters, North Sea helicopters, hovering, unable to land. And the new Prime Minister was unable to get down herself. So it was circling above Aberdeenshire. I count it. Uh, digitally on flight radar, something like four government U-turns before she even started. Eventually, however, the mist lifted. She was able to get down. The two RAF jets are parked on the runway, ready for the return journey of the ex-PM and the future PM down south later today. I suppose one of the complications is, because she's late, you know, part of the choreography in all this was to compress the time that the Queen had to deal with this whole situation. She has mobility issues. So now that Liz Truss has been delayed, that will extend the whole process, which I suppose doesn't sit quite well with uh, the original choreography. But these are the hitches of uh, the modern day, the modern day anointing of a new Prime Minister when it all comes down to functionality rather than tradition as we know it. OK, James, we'll be back with you for the departures. James Matthews, they're live for us at Aberdeen Airport. Well, let's talk now about uh, one of the thorniest diplomatic issues that Liz Truss will have to wrestle with because in Northern Ireland she faces the twin challenges of a standoff with the European Union and trying to re-establish power sharing between the Stormont 
administration's fierce rivals. Well, let's go live to Stormont now. Our senior Ireland correspondent, David Blevins, is there. And, uh, David, talking about the protocol, first of all, this is uh, an issue, of course, that Liz Truss has been intimately involved in as Foreign Secretary. That's right. And this morning, again, in his farewell speech, we heard Boris Johnson talk about having got Brexit done. But as far as Northern Ireland is concerned, Brexit isn't done because the Northern Ireland Protocol, the Brexit trading arrangement that created a border in the Irish Sea to avoid there being a need for one on this island, is the reason the DUP has not returned to the power-sharing government here three months after the election. They want Liz Truss to honour her promise to scrap that protocol altogether. But in doing so, she risks a trade war with the EU, the UK's largest trading partner, and it's the last thing the UK needs in the middle of a cost of living crisis. Now, remember, it was Sinn Féin who won that election. They believe there are more pressing concerns, more pressing need to get Stormont back, and that is the fact that you need a devolved government to support people through a cost of living crisis. That's the quandary for Liz Truss. Does she stick to her promise and scrap the protocol, or does she seek some kind of negotiation? Remember, before he became Prime Minister, Boris Johnson said there would never be a border in the Irish Sea. He changed his mind when he became Prime Minister, and she just might change hers too, Dermot. OK, David, many thanks. David Blevins, live for us there in Stormont. Well, let's talk more now about uh, some of the huge domestic challenges faced by Prime Minister Liz Truss. My colleague Greg Milam is in Warrington. Greg. Yeah, good morning, Dermot, from uh, Warrington, where we're looking at some of those big challenges, particularly here in the north that are facing uh, the new Prime Minister. Warrington, in many ways, is, is typical of the nation as a, as a whole, and I think we can give you some detail on that uh, now. Uh, gross household domestic income, what people have left to spend after they've paid their tax and their key bills, uh, was just under £21,000 last year. That's compared to just over £21,000 for the UK as a whole. Housing here is slightly more affordable than nationally, with the average cost 8.3 times earnings compared to 10.1 nationally, and that, that figure often skewed by the, the high prices in parts of London. Overall prices in Warrington rose at 10.1% in the year to July. That's exactly the same as the national figure. But real wages fell 4% in the year to April compared to 3% for the UK as a whole and 25% of households in Warrington will be living in fuel poverty by October. That's spending 10% or more on energy. That's compared to 32% nationally, of course, depending on what happens on those, those energy bills. Politically, here, Labour has controlled the council uh, pretty comfortably since 2011, but the Conservatives have been narrowing that gap in, in recent years. There are two Westminster seats here. Uh, Warrington North has been held by Labour, since it was created in 1983, uh, Warrington South, traditionally more marginal, uh, the Conservatives gained that from Labour in 2019. And that's, of course, when uh, Boris Johnson made those promises to people in the North and the Midlands that uh, he would represent them uh, better, uh, appealing to Warrington Man, uh, as it was described back then, Workington Man, uh, people who felt they'd been left behind and, and believed they could trust the Conservatives then. Well, we can speak to a Warrington man, Carl Oakes, who runs for Ketza Business Solutions. Um, we have a new Prime Minister, Carl. Businesses, obviously small businesses, very concerned, like the rest of us, about what's happening. Just first of all, explain what, what you do for, for small businesses in this part of the world. Uh, good morning. So our role is to help out to arrange loans and funding. So when a small business goes to a bank and a bank says no, which is getting more and more common, uh, that's when we step in. So our role is to aid small businesses with their cash flow and try and reduce some of their stress and hassle. Have you heard anything from, from Liz Trust that, that reassures you, reassures those small businesses that there are uh, that, that there's something ahead to look forward to? Not really. The, the policy noise that she did make um, was around uh, corporation tax and around lowering corporation tax. But if you're a small business, you've actually got to survive and get to that point for it to be a benefit. Um, I think the absence of tangibles and the absence of financial facts actually is what's worried small businesses. If there is action on energy, we know that the energy cap doesn't apply to small businesses, but if there is action on energy prices, how essential is that? How, how much would that be welcomed by the, the kind of businesses you're talking to? I think when you think about the environment that we're in now, surrounded by bars and restaurants and casual dining, I think people having even a little bit of money in their pocket would help 
in terms of footfall, in terms of keeping bars and restaurants alive. So I think just that in isolation would be a huge benefit. We heard a lot from Boris Johnson, obviously levelling up this, this talk of, of spreading equality around the country a bit more. That was three years ago. What have you seen here? Have you seen anything here that, that, that suggests that has, that has happened, has started to happen, that there's, a, there's optimism here? No, not really. I think um, as a small business ourselves, we operate across the country. So we do spend time in the South East. We do spend time in London. So I think we're fairly well placed to kind of comment on that. And I would say I think there's been assurances and promises, but very little in the way of delivery. We heard a lot from, from Liz Truss about cutting taxes. You mentioned corporation tax, income tax cuts. Is that something that, that for a business that is, that is looking at the next year, wondering how they're going to get through with, with, with fewer people coming through the doors, that there is something there that is a, is a help for them? I think the reality from a small business perspective is, is intervention that will add value now. So I think, again, let's point to bars, restaurants, retail. I think if you think about the cost of rates, if you've got a business premises, I think something like that in the short term would boost confidence far more than any assurances down the line. And just one thing, what, what one thing would you like to hear from Liz Trust today? I'd like to hear that um, small businesses are going to be supported through the storm so that perhaps we can make some money when the sun comes out. And do you think that, I mean, do you think, have you had a sense from, from this campaign that's gone on for a long time that um, she understands the North, that, that, that she understands the issues that are, that are confronting people here? No, not really. I, I think that um, there's been some comments and perhaps some sound bites that uh, are aimed at, um, at pleasing us, but it probably sounds more like we're being placated than pleased, if I'm honest. So uh, the, the devil's in the detail and let's see. Comparing her to Boris Johnson and what we've seen over, over three years, you, you did say to me earlier you thought she, she perhaps would, would get down to business a bit more perhaps than, than Rishi Sunak would have done, would have, would have taken this seriously. Is that a fair assessment? I mean, do, do, you, do you have hope that, that there is something there that she could deliver? I think that um, Liz Truss is far more likely to try and help in the short term by way of a direct comparison to Rishi Sunak. I think Rishi Sunak was, was concerned that we kept kicking the can down the road. So I think he was more along the lines of, let's just suffer it now so that we can protect tomorrow. Whereas I do think Liz Truss is the more likely person to try and help in the short term. I mentioned Warrington Man. It was Wigan Man, Workington Man. It was, it was um, working class, rugby league towns yeah. where people had voted for Brexit, felt they'd been, been left behind. And that, that did the job in 2019. Do you sense that those people who took that bet in 2019 would, would do so again come the next election? No, and, and, and I think there are perhaps some emotional reasons as well as economic reasons behind that. I think a lot of trust has been lost in the Conservative Party for various reasons. So, no, I, I, I think there's going to be a lot more consideration this time around before promises are believed. OK, Carl Oakes, uh, thanks very much for talking to us this morning on, on some of the view from here in, uh, here in Warrington. That issue of levelling up that was, uh, of course, the, the promises made by Boris Johnson, the promises to repay that trust. It's now for Liz Trust to deliver on those. Back to you, Dermot. OK, Greg, many thanks. Greg Milam there, live for us in Warrington. And you are watching Sky News Today, live from Downing Street. Coming up next, I'm going to be discussing the new Prime Minister's formidable in-tray, as well as her predecessor's legacy with the former Conservative Party chairman, Eric Pickles, Lord Pickles.
Welcome back. Let's leave uh, Westminster for a moment or two. And the family of Olivia Pratt Corbell, the nine-year-old girl who was shot and killed inside her own home in Liverpool last month, has released a statement. Let's find out more about it with Ashna Hurinag, who's in Liverpool for us. Uh, tell us about the statement, Ashna. Just over two weeks ago, that Olivia Pratt Corbell was shot at her home in the Dovecourt area of the city. And today we have heard from her father for the first time, John Francis Pratt, who has paid tribute to his daughter and says, words can't express the pain we are going through after Olivia was so cruelly snatched away from us. Those responsible need to know what they have done. Olivia was a real bright spark who knew her own mind, had no problem making friends and loved to laugh and make people laugh. Olivia's death cannot be in vain, and we want people to feel safe and be safe, he says. That can only happen if we all come together and make sure there is no place for guns or those who use guns on our streets or in our communities. Alongside that statement released by Olivia's father was also a video that he has released to the public. It shows him and the nine-year-old girl, a little bit younger in this video, at a Christmas market in Liverpool city centre. Um, and she can be seen on that fairground ride with her father, holding on to him and smiling. It was 10.30 in the evening on the 22nd of August when a masked gunman entered Olivia's home. He shot Olivia's mother in the wrist, a bullet which then travelled and then struck Olivia in her chest, killing the nine-year-old girl. Ever since then, there has been an extensive murder investigation that is continuing to happen. Merseyside Police, the officers investigating her death, made four arrests of four men on Sunday, the key one being a 34-year-old man who has been arrested on suspicion of murder and of attempted murder. Three other men have also been arrested. They are facing allegations of assisting an offender. But the key to all of this is evidence. Police are appealing yet further for the public to come forward with yet more information to try and piece together the events that led up to the tragic death of Olivia. A plea that has been echoed by her father, John Francis Pratt today, who has pre paid tribute to his daughter, who loved to laugh and whose life was cruelly cut short. Ashna, many thanks. Ashna Horinag there in Liverpool for us. Well, uh, let's return uh, to politics and the installation of a new Prime Minister. Uh, I'm here in Downing Street live and I'm joined now by Lord Eric Pickles, the former Cabinet Secretary and, of course, uh, former Conservative Party Chairman. Very good to talk to you, Lord Pickles. Well, now, let, let's you talk from the perspective of uh, putting the party back together again, trying to get some form of unity re-established, because, as we've all seen, it's been a bruising summer. Votes of no confidence in the sitting Prime Minister, mass resignations, then a seemingly interminable leadership contest and a lot of bad blood spilled. What does Liz Truss have to do to reunite the party? Well, I think Liz Truss is going to be judged on just one thing, and that's her ability to be able to uh, control the spiralling costs of uh, energy. If she doesn't get that right, no matter how close the Conservative Party gets together, no matter how many uh, interesting ideas she has, she won't be able to do anything else. So largely the, the, the set and the programme and the style of uh, the new Prime Minister will be set by what she brings out on Thursday. That is absolutely huge. And it's interesting what you say. So the doubters within the party, and there are many of them, they're quiet at the moment, but do you think they will then be convinced if they see Liz Truss landing something that will, that will last and will really help people out? Yes, I mean, it's, uh, in, in many ways, you've got to turn the telescope the other way around. Uh, the future of the party, the future of this government, the future of this, this country depends on how we react to this unofficial declaration of economic war by uh, by Mr. Putin. Uh, it isn't as though we're acting to, in response to the vagaries of the market. This uh, this crisis has occurred because uh, because uh, Russia thinks we're soft, and Russia thinks that if they squeeze us economically, that we will allow him to do what he wants in trying to recreate the Soviet Union. So in a time of of virtual war, we've got to protect the most vulnerable. We've got to protect uh, those on low incomes. We've got to ensure this social cohesion within within the nation. And as you're pointing out there, Lord Pickles, what a task 
that is, uh, you've described it. Is this trust the woman then to match it? Is she the one to sort it out? What, tell us more about your assessment of her character and her abilities. Well, this is a pretty big happy day for me because uh, she was one of the young candidates that came in when I was uh, um, chairman of the Conservative Party. Um, from my associations with Liz over the years, she is a formidable person. Um, people, I think, have underestimated her at their cost. I certainly found that she was always on top of a brief that, um, as you know, most of the big business of government's done in, um, in cabinet committee. And sometimes you'll have cabinet ministers who will turn up there and will just read the brief of their officials. She was never like that. She always was interested in the argument. She always wanted to make a point. But she's actually also quite a good listener. Well, I mean, you point out there some of the qualities that apparently uh, the previous prime minister, or shortly to be previous prime minister, did not have that attention to detail, that reading of the contents of the red boxes. How do you think Boris Johnson, if he had got to stay, would be matching up to this huge challenge? Well, I'm, I'm, sure, he, I'm sure he would have done. I'm sure he would have... Um, one thing about Boris is he was always always very good in a crisis. Uh, I think we need to thank him for uh, ordering the vaccines, and I don't think that would have happened without him. I think he understood the nature of um, of the threat uh, that uh, the Russian invasion of the Ukraine. But unfortunately, uh, you know, he is flawed, and he's been rather brought down by some very silly parties and some very silly spinning and it's a tragedy because he's got a lot to give uh, to uh, the country and I'm sure that he his public life is not over and he, and he will be able to give uh, something back uh, to the country though probably not through Downing Street. Okay but but through Parliament you think he could have another senior position ahead of him? Yeah I, I, he is a, a force of nature I, I, I think you'd be foolish to write him off uh, off now. Um, there are very few successful second acts in politics. Um, perhaps Churchill is, is the exception to the rule in, in terms of coming back to the top job. But certainly I, I would have thought that, uh, that, that Boris Johnson has an awful lot to, 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 to offer the country. Well, you talk about uh, how formidable Liz Truss is, so we talk about the size of the challenges ahead. She therefore obviously needs a formidable team around her. And uh, if you add in Mr Johnson there, there are many abilities and plenty of experience, uh, cabinet experience, that she is not going to have available to her for various reasons. Do you think that is a mistake? And I'm talking about what Michael Gove, Dominic Raab and, of course, the challenger, Rishi Sunak. Well, I think she, she needs to get the very best people around her. I think um, loyalty is one thing, but she, what she really needs to be able to have are people who are able to deliver, because what we are going to need is uh, a lot of what my old um, uh, my woodwork master called application. We kind of need people who can get things done and get things done uh, uh, quickly. And that does mean that you need to draw from people who didn't vote for you as well as people that did vote for you. And you need to offer the hand of friendship. I'm sure she's, she's big enough and, and uh, intelligent enough to do that. Well, well, just briefly on that, Lord Pickles, when you're talking about delivery and the ability to get things done, you're really talking specifically, aren't you, about one person, Michael Gove. Michael, I'm a big fan of Michael. Uh, uh, I mean, effectively, he kind of, he's ruled himself out. I, I, I think he said he didn't want to, to serve, or uh, I may be uh, mistaken. Uh, but uh, nobody would be happier than myself to see uh, Michael uh, back in government. Lord Pickles, always great talking to you. Thank you very much indeed. Eric Pickles there, of course, former party chairman amongst uh, many of the jobs he held in government. Uh, now then, the new Prime Minister, as discussed, uh, is thought to be drawing up plans to tackle the cost of living crisis that could see at least £100 billion of support for consumers. The emergency package is expected to include freezing energy bills for homes and businesses until at least January next year and possibly until 2024. It's also expected that energy suppliers will be able to take out government-backed loans to subsidise people and businesses' bills.
Let's talk about the huge economic challenge then with our business presenter, Ian King. He joins us from the city. And uh, Ian, crucial to, to this whole project, if we can call it that, is the view of the city, of the, of the international investors in United Kingdom PLC. Well, that's absolutely right, Dermot, and the financial markets have been uh, telling you very clearly over the last uh, six weeks or so just what investors think of the prospects for the UK economy. The pound has sold off pretty sharply. Yesterday on Monday, it hit a two-year low against the US dollar. Now, the US dollar is uh, pretty strong across the piece right now, but nonetheless, that was pretty disconcerting. Uh, gilts, meanwhile, UK government bonds, UK government IOUs, will yields on them, in other words, implied borrowing costs. They've also been rising. If you take, for example, the 10 year gilt. Well, the yield on that stood at 1.7% at the beginning of August. It's now closer to 3%. It's uh, just shy of 3% as we speak. In other words, that's an implied increase in government borrowing costs. And a lot of that boils down to what the government is going to have to do to tackle these higher energy bills. Now, the big debate going on in Liz Truss's team is whether they go for a targeted approach, helping the most vulnerable households and businesses, or whether they go for blanket support. What we've got at the moment, the existing uh, proposals unveiled by by Rishi Sunak, of course, when he was Chancellor, costing some £37 billion, by the way, Dermot. Well, that's a, it was kind of a hybrid. You've got a flat £400 rebate to household bills that's due later this year. There's also a rebate on council tax bills for less well-off households, and there's also targeted support through the benefit system. So it's a kind of hybrid system. Now, what we think Liz Truss's team is going to come down in favour of is blanket support, which, as you say, would encourage the uh, household energy suppliers to cap prices. That would probably be at the existing level of £1,971. You wouldn't get an increase to uh, £3,549, as is uh, due to be uh, coming in in October. That would obviously require the household energy companies to be operating at a loss. So you're looking at some sort of backstopping for them, either by state-backed loans or, indeed, government borrowing outright. We don't know the fine details of that. But either way, implicit in all of that is a great deal more government borrowing if it's not, if it's all... If it comes down to this sort of private sector solution, well, essentially, that's going to have to be repaid in over the next 15 years or so via a levy on household bills. And that effectively would equate to a big tax increase. So it's not likely to be very popular further down the line. So the government may just decide, in fact, to hike up government borrowing. Now, one big drawback, Dermot, with all of this is that there is no incentive for households or businesses to actually start rationing their energy use, to try and reduce their energy uh, consumption. Because obviously, at high prices, there's a big, big incentive for people to do that. And a lot of industry analysts are suggesting, well, if you just go for this blanket support for households and businesses with no incentive via the pricing mechanism to conserve energy, well, potentially, you could be looking at rationing at some point this winter. And that is something that uh, is certainly being on the uh, minds of a lot of uh, European governments right now as they uh, throw money at the uh, problem as well. Now, as I say, we have yet to get a firm costing as to how much this is all going to be. I mean, the number being banded around is as much as £100 billion, uh, £40 billion alone, to support vulnerable businesses. And if that was true, well, I mean, that would be vastly more expensive than the government support that uh, was given to businesses during the furlough scheme during the pandemic. It would also be significantly higher than some of the money that is being thrown at this problem by European governments. For example, Germany's latest package of support comes to a total of some €65 billion. Euros. So it would be appreciably ahead of that. And that partly reflects the fact that the UK is just that bit more dependent on imported gas than some of uh, our continental European counterparts. Now, there's another kicker to this, Dermot, which is that Kwasi Karteng, likely to be the incoming Chancellor, is also likely to step up moves to try and reform the way the energy market works. And one reason that uh, we have had these big increases is because of what's known as marginal pricing, whereby household energy is uh, priced at effectively the most marginal supplier, which tends to be gas rather than uh, cheaper renewables. And accordingly, uh, the, that's, that is why the electricity market is, uh, in the views of some people, broken. Boris Johnson's government pledged to try and tackle all this but never really got anywhere with it. It's likely to be a big, big uh, priority for Kwasi Karteng as he goes into number 11 Downing Street, trying to break up this relationship between wholesale gas prices and the electricity market. But that would also require a great deal of intervention in terms of how contracts for uh, energy supplies are drawn up. That's a lot of work involved in that, which is why I think Liz Truss is thinking in the short term of just going for this big package of blanket support. Ian, uh, thanks for explaining all that so clearly and cogently in King, our 
business presenter there. Let's uh, talk more now with our deputy political editor, uh, Sam Coates. And Sam, talking about the, the scale then of this challenge, particularly on energy and the cost of living crisis. And just to refer back to what Lord Pickles was telling me a few minutes earlier about how she heals the party, how Liz Truss heals the party. He says it's through this mechanism as well. It's kind of one huge shot, but it solves a lot of problems if she gets it right. I was very struck, Eric Pickles, saying that her premiership will be defined by what she does over the energy price conundrum. And I think on this specifically, we're learning quite a lot about Liz Truss because it was only August the 16th, so barely, what, three weeks ago, that Liz Truss was saying it would not be right to, quote, throw money at the problem without dealing with the root causes uh, and suggested uh, that there would be no short-term fix if she became Prime Minister. Now she's likely to throw about £100 billion pounds plus at the problem uh, and it's going to take some time to do the fundamental fixes to the energy market that Ian King was talking about. But there does seem to be a one big unresolved question about Liz Truss's energy plans and Ian uh, referred to it and that is the question of whether or not it is all paid for by borrowing so future generations or whether or not there's some attempt to claw it back in time through uh, energy bills. Now you can see Liz Truss being cautious about anything that could be branded a tax rise but if the markets see Liz Truss embarking on a plan that costs £100 billion over this year and then President Putin still inflicting his Cold War in 2023 and 2024. So an open-ended uh, commitment to spending on a vast scale after the COVID pandemic, then maybe those are the circumstances in which borrowing costs could go up and there could be some nervousness in the city. There's something else to throw in there about the price cap. Uh, the, the talk is that it'll be at the level it has been set now, which people are already hurting because of this price cap. And it is, of course, the summer. Even under this price cap, people are going to get into difficulties. Absolutely. You hear a lot about uh, marginal price reform uh, uh, on the kind of economic side. There's potentially only marginal benefit politically for spending £100 billion because people will be hurting exactly as you say because of what's already happened. So potentially Liz Truss might not reap a huge benefit from these vast sums she's preparing to uh, spend because actually people are poorer than they were at the start of the parliament when uh, they elected this Conservative government and with a recession coming and more energy price challenges ahead, it's hard to see how people won't really be feeling the squeeze over the next couple of years. And in those circumstances, she can spend all she wants and it sounds pretty much like she's prepared to spend uh, as much as any sitting Prime Minister uh, in the last 70 years uh, and not necessarily uh, find that the voters are flooding her with thanks. OK, Sam, for the time being, thank you very much indeed, Deputy Political Editor. Uh, Sam Coates there, let's just look at uh, the latest pictures uh, coming to us from the northeast of Scotland, uh, location of Balmoral, of course, where Her Majesty the Queen unable to travel to London because of uh, ongoing mobility issues, and that is the, the small motorcade uh, carrying Boris Johnson and his wife Carrie, who we sure saw a, a few minutes ago, about half an hour ago, entering the grounds of Balmoral Castle, uh, being ushered in to see Her Majesty the Queen, tendering his resignation, which now has presumably been accepted. Uh, he is Prime Minister, no more, and shortly to be installed, or having just been installed, is Liz Truss, who uh, will be approaching those grounds. We're not entirely sure whether she has arrived yet. In the interim, the interesting constitutional point is, is of course, that there are a a few minutes when uh, there actually is no Prime Minister and uh, therefore executive power reverts to Her Majesty the Queen. Uh, we'll uh, update you on that process as soon as we hear more about it. But let's talk then about uh, the imminent installation of Liz Truss as uh, Britain's new Prime Minister. If it hasn't already happened, she'll be the third female Prime Minister, of course, all of them Conservative, after meeting as she meets Her Majesty the Queen in Balmoral. So are we finally getting to a place where female Prime Minister isn't seen as unusual if it isn't already, and what else can we expect from her new government? Let's uh, discuss that much, much more now with Catherine Haddon, a senior fellow at the Institute for Government. Good to talk to you, Catherine Haddon. Now, well, let's, uh, we'll talk uh, a bit more about the third female Prime Minister, all of the Conservatives, as I've pointed out, but just, just tell us what you think the difference will be between a, a Truss administration and a Johnson administration in terms of the way they conduct themselves. 
Well, we're already hearing a certain amount of change uh, in the working of Number 10. And remember, for Boris Johnson, how his Number 10 was organised, whether it was serving him well, whether it was serving the rest of government well, that was a big issue. So we kept hearing about resets. You could argue that this is yet another reset of that Number 10, this time without Boris Johnson there. Uh, but also, actually, quite a lot of his staff will have already left Number 10, uh, and Liz Truss's new team will be installing themselves. So they're could be some big changes at the centre to try and organise in a better way. And that's quite usual for a Prime Minister. They, they often react to the previous incumbent uh, and try to say that I'm going to do things completely differently. Um, so I think there'll be a change of tone in, in, in that respect, a change of organisation a bit also. Um, I guess we're still waiting to see what kind of Prime Minister she's going to be. Um, you know, we heard a very brief bit from her yesterday, but uh, that full speech later today is probably going to be the first clue where we get a sense of how does she want to govern, what is the kind of language that's going to uh, typify that, and, and most importantly, as you were just discussing, what are the key policies at the heart of it? Yeah, and the implementation of those policies. We hear from Prime Minister after Prime Minister. We heard it, of course, from... Boris Johnson, the frustrations that they have about uh, the decisions taken by Prime Ministers and then them not actually happening, pulling levers and there's no-one seemingly at the end of them. Do you expect a, a shake-up then in the way that the Downing Street as a whole operates, the people around Liz Truss? Yeah, I mean, in a sense, it's a frustration for those of us on the outside because the same problems we keep talking about in terms of how government operates. And the, it isn't as easy as just saying this is a problem of the civil service. They've got to get their act together, which often is what happens. Government is a huge, huge organisation. When you take into account the size of public services, you know, the levers that ministers have to control them, um, and, and also what you've got to do in terms of delegating that power, it's a massive operation. It's very complex complicated to deal with. But we know a lot about how to do it successfully. We know you need decent lines of accountability, you need good reporting structures, good data, um, and, and also you need clarity from ministers. Uh, and this is one of the things that she's got to make sure that from the get-go her government is delivering. If she's going to have a smaller centre, which is what she's talking about, um, does that mean that she is delegating more to cabinet ministers? Are we going to see cabinet ministers more empowered than perhaps they had been under Boris Johnson? How is Liz Truss going to react then if things start to go wrong? and she wants to claw back that power for herself. So it's a really tricky balancing act. It's much easier to talk about it than to get it, um, you know, than to do it in practice. Yeah. But she, she kept talking about delivery. I think that's the key test that we're going to have to look out for. And, Catherine, just really, really briefly, diversity, whatever political hue you are, we understand it in the, the top four jobs, no white men. Yeah, and another female Prime Minister. I mean, all of this is really important. We still haven't had a female Chancellor of the Exchequer. That's another sort of important glass ceiling you might talk about. Um, I do think we'll see more diversity, uh, certainly in this Cabinet. We wait and see about all those all-important junior ministerial positions, whether more people okay. are brought through the pipeline. So, so lots to watch out for. The more the better. Catherine Haddon, really good talking to you. Uh, Catherine Haddon there from the Institute for Government. You're watching Sky News today, live from Downing Street. Coming up, one Prime Minister leaves, another one about to arrive.
is Sky News Today, live from Downing Street. It's 12 o'clock. Boris Johnson bows out at Balmoral, promising to get behind the new Prime Minister in a defiant final speech. I'm now like one of those booster rockets that has fulfilled its function, and I will now be gently re-entering the atmosphere and splashing down invisibly in some remote and obscure corner of the Pacific. This trust lands at Aberdeen Airport and is due to be appointed Prime Minister by Her Majesty the Queen in the next few minutes. She begins her first day facing an energy crisis but promising at least a £100 billion energy price freeze and that could last until the next election. I'm in Warrington looking at some of the big challenges facing the new Prime Minister as she begins her first day in the job. Also ahead, new video is released of Olivia Pratt Corbell as her father says her death cannot be in vain. And a man in his 20s is shot dead by police in South London after a car chase. A very good afternoon from Downing Street, where Boris Johnson has said his final goodbyes, promising to get behind the new Prime Minister, Liz Truss, every step of the way. And in the last hour, he's been to Balmoral, accompanied by his wife, Carrie, to meet Her Majesty the Queen and formally tender his resignation. Well, a bit earlier, he uh, left Downing Street for the final time as Prime Minister and in his last speech, he described himself as a booster rocket that has fulfilled its function, championing his administration's achievements, highlighting Brexit, the vaccine rollout and the response to the war in Ukraine. Well, this is, this is it, folks. Thank you, everybody, for coming out so early this morning. In only a couple of hours, I will be in Balmoral to see Her Majesty the Queen. And the torch will finally be passed to a new Conservative leader. The baton will be handed over in what has unexpectedly turned out to be a relay race. They changed the rules halfway through, but never mind that now. And through that lacquered black door, a new Prime Minister will shortly go to meet a fantastic group of public servants. The people who got Brexit done, the people who delivered the fastest vaccine rollout in Europe and never forget, 70% of the entire population got a dose within six months faster than any comparable country. That is government for you. That's this Conservative government. People who organised those prompt early supplies of weapons to the heroic Ukrainian armed forces, an action that may very well have helped change the course of the biggest European war for 80 years. And looking at what is happening in this country, the changes that are taking place, that is why private sector investment is flooding in. More private sector, more venture capital investment than China itself. More billion pound tech companies sprouting here in the UK than in France, Germany and Israel combined. And as a result, unemployment, as I leave office, unemployment down to lows not seen since I was about 10 years old and bouncing around on a space hopper, my friends. And on, on, the subject of, on the subject of bouncing around in future careers, let me say that I am now like one of those booster rockets that has fulfilled its function, and I will now be gently re-entering the atmosphere and splashing down invisibly in some remote and obscure corner of the Pacific. <laughs> and like Cincinnatus, I am returning to my plough, and I will be offering this government nothing but the most fervent support. This is, I'll tell you why, this is a tough time for the economy. This is a tough time for families up and down the country. We can and we will get through it and we will come out stronger the other side. But I say to my fellow Conservatives, it's time for politics to be over, folks. 
It's time for us all to get behind Liz Truss and her team and her programme and deliver for the people of this country. Because that is what the people of this country want, that's what they need, and that's what they deserve. Together, we have laid foundations that will stand the test of time, whether by taking back control of our laws or putting in vital new infrastructure. Great, solid masonry on which we will continue to build together. Paving, paving the path of prosperity now and for future generations. And I will be supporting Liz Truss and the new government every step of the way. Thank you all very much. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. That was Boris Johnson's farewell here in Downing Street about half past seven this morning while our deputy political editor Sam Coates was uh, listening to that speech and is now going to bring us up to date on what's happened at Balmoral. Boris Johnson is no longer Prime Minister. The baton relay of British politics, as Boris Johnson said a few hours ago right here, is very much underway. In the last few seconds, we've had a message uh, from uh, the Queen. It says the Right Honourable Boris Johnson MP had an audience with the Queen this morning and tendered his resignation as Prime Minister and First Lord of the Treasury, and which Her Majesty was graciously pleased to accept. So as we speak, uh, the monarch in Balmoral with all power at her fingertips for another few minutes until Liz Truss comes in and she is appointed uh, Prime Minister uh, by the Queen. And then I think things are going to start moving quite quickly. Um, right now, we know that plans are underway already for changes inside the building behind me. Liz Truss is planning to slim down Downing Street. The key change that she's thinking of there is to actually remove quite a lot of the civil servants that are involved in delivery and making things happen uh, under Boris Johnson's premiership. She's got a much smaller team, a much younger team, that are going to uh, deliver her plans. Then, after that, uh, we're going to see the Cabinet start to arrive. Now, Liz Truss has been pretty much nailed on to be Prime Minister for about three weeks now, so she has a lot of plans already set. So don't expect this to last long into the night. I think Boris Johnson, uh, I think Liz Truss uh, will uh, appoint people pretty quickly. We'll see them in quite short order uh, come up Downing Street. We know who the senior officers of the state are likely to be, Kwasi Kwarteng, going into the Treasury. Suella Braverman uh, will replace Priti Patel uh, in the Home Office. Ben Wallace uh, will be uh, continuing, uh, I think, in the Defence Department. James Cleverly, uh, her ally, uh, will go into the Foreign well, Office. I mean, as you point out there, Sam, all allies. What about this issue of reaching out uh, across the divides, which that bitter campaign opened up and uh, illustrated for us, doesn't she have to do some healing within the party, offer some of them some big jobs? Well, there are some people briefing mostly anonymously to exactly making that point. Theresa May's former chief of staff, Gavin Barwell, however, has gone public with exactly that point. In the last few moments, he says that Liz Truss risks repeating Boris Johnson's mistake of favouring allies and it will be one of the least experienced cabinets in, me in modern times at the top. Think quasi quarting James Cleverly, Cleverly Suella Breverman versus uh, Geoffrey Howe, Lord Carrington and Willie Whitelaw. I think that uh, actually not all of those figures under Thatcher were quite as experienced perhaps as Gavin Barwell uh, makes out. But there is definitely a feeling amongst some bits of the Sunak camp inside Parliament that she does need to potentially do more than we think she's going to do from all the leaks what's going to be in her cabinet uh, to reach across the party and heal this divide. And in terms of the challenges, the challenge ahead, it was interesting during the course of the campaign, how the penny really dropped. They have talked and talked an awful lot about a wide range of things and it has focused down in the last few weeks on this huge cost of living crisis at its centre, the energy crisis. Do nothing and millions go into poverty within a, in a matter of months. It looks as if Ed, uh, Liz Truss this week will set out a ginormous plan to try and help people uh, hundreds of billions of pounds of borrowing in order to cap the wholesale price of energy. In other words, be able to fix business and household energy bills. Well, we've learned quite a lot from the, her decision to do that. Just a few weeks ago, she was saying caps don't, uh, aren't appropriate. She was saying short-term fixes don't work. She was saying throwing money at the problem doesn't work. She is already proving herself to be something of a more flexible 
uh, politician than perhaps uh, she comes across in the way she likes to present herself uh, as a Conservative who will govern as a Conservative. That's what she said uh, when she was chosen to be the next Prime Minister yesterday. But actually, in the opening decisions, it does appear uh, as if she is, able, she is willing to do more uh, when the, her back is against the wall uh, in order to help families, you know, perhaps even if some of those solutions do rub up against some of the Conservative principles that we've heard her espouse uh, over the last few weeks. Wow, what a lot on a plate. Uh, Sam, thank you very much indeed for the time being. Well, uh, let's just check in. If uh, formerly Liz Truss is Prime Minister, yet, as you know, the uh, whole process is taking place in Balmoral, the uh, Queen's summer residence, uh, because of her mobility issues, uh, Her Majesty unable to travel to Buckingham Palace, where this process normally takes place. Boris Johnson has uh, officially resigned, and that resignation has been accepted by Her Majesty. The announcement read out by... Sam, a few moments ago, uh, Liz Truss is shortly behind Boris Johnson for her audience with Her Majesty. Uh, let's check in then on the progress of that process uh, with our royal correspondent, uh, Rhiannon Mills. And Rhiannon, do we know uh, when, if the, uh, the kissing of hands, as it's called, although I know that doesn't actually take place, uh, <laughs> if when that has happened? So, yesterday, it was anticipated that we were due to see Liz Truss uh, arrive here at Balmoral around quarter past 12, about 20 past 12, for that all-important audience. Uh, it has to be said that Liz Truss definitely has had the more rough side of the weather when it comes to arriving here in Scotland. Uh, we know there were some difficulties with her plane landing at Aberdeen Airport because it was so foggy, um, but we do know that she is on her way here now in a car. And we're in that kind of no man's land at the moment where the unusual situation where at the moment, we don't technically have a prime minister. So executive power rests in the hands of the Queen. And because of that, I think, despite the fact that it's happening here in Scotland, rather than down at Buckingham Palace, there was still this need to make sure that the process happened as quickly as possible, or at least is seen to happen as quickly as possible. So yeah, at Liz Truss won't be too far behind uh, Boris Johnson. And of course, the Queen now has graciously accepted his resignation. We've just had uh, that notice through from Buckingham Palace. And then it's up to Liz Truss now to form a new government. And as you said, the kissing of hands, as it's recorded in the court circular, will happen where the Queen invites Liz Truss to form a new government. And it's at that moment that she will officially become Prime Minister. Now, joining me here is Louise Tate, who was the former Communications Secretary to the Queen here in Scotland. Uh, we've already seen how this process of the arrival happens with Boris Johnson and Carrie Johnson. We'd expect a similar thing ha to happen, wouldn't we, with, with Liz Truss? Yes, yeah, so I think you, we've seen this very similar um, arrangement at Buckingham Palace, and I think that arrangement has just been replicated up here, and it's a very sim similar process. I'm sure it will be the Queen's Duty Private Secretary, who seems to be Sir Edward Young, I believe, and the equity who will meet uh, Liz Truss and her husband on arrival, and then they'll be taken inside uh, through the protocol. Because it is worth reminding ourselves, this is history in the making. Every one of the Queen's 14 Prime Ministers up until this point has always been appointed at Buckingham Palace. There was some surprise that it was going to happen here at Balmoral, but there is nothing unconstitutional about it. And ultimately, the Queen still, right throughout her summer break, continues her duties, doesn't she? You've seen that up yes, close. This is, this is a continuation of the Queen's formal constitutional role. She continues to perform her head of state duties here at Balmoral. That's well documented. Uh, the red boxes and so forth. It is how the business of, of head of state is done. And this is a continuation of that. And it is exactly a replica. Pretty much what happened at Buckingham Palace. It's just happening here at Balmoral. Because earlier we saw her private secretary, Edward Young, a very important man who yeah, kind of is in, in, the, in the shadows. Um, but he, this morning, Presumably, the red box would have been on her desk this morning for her to, to look as, through. As usual, I'm, I'm pretty certain, yeah. I can't imagine why it wouldn't be. But it isn't unusual as well for Prime Ministers to come here to Balmoral. We were talking yeah. earlier about how, actually, it's a really important summer moment for every Prime Minister yeah. to be invited to spend some quiet time with the Queen, I suppose. Yes, yes and it is traditionally around this time of year. It's, uh, it's, it's not uncommon for it to be sort of the, around the first weekend in September. Um, and this year has been you know, different because the circumstances are different. So there is, it's not a precedent for this situation, but it's certainly not unusual for a Prime Minister to come and visit Her Majesty uh, and spend some time here at Balmoral. Now, members of the public are allowed to kind of look outside and go into the grounds here at Balmoral. I did it earlier in the <laughs> summer. Yeah. It's 
you immediately get that sense of, of how remote it is, how it's a, a place that the Queen feels that she can come away to, mm. to escape in some ways. That presumably will maybe change the, the tone of those meetings today, despite the formalities being the same. Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I think, you know, this is a place where the Queen is very, very at home. Um, it is her home. Um, I, it, it might feel slightly less formal, perhaps, uh, but I'm guessing. I, I, I think it'll just be a very, still, everyone making sure that everyone's put at ease, understands what's about to happen next, and so that everyone feels confident that at each stage of the process they're looked after and understand what they're expected to, to do. Louise, thank you very much for now. We are still waiting uh, for Liz Truss to arrive, of course, in the car alongside her, likely to be her husband, Hugh O'Leary, because we know that Carrie Johnson arrived uh, with Boris Johnson. And that has become customary, that while those formal audiences happen with the outgoing and incoming prime ministers, I'm just potentially hearing a car behind me. No, nothing to worry about for the moment. Uh, while the private kind of one-to-one -one happens with the outgoing and incoming prime minister, the spouse is then invited in at the end. So I think this is likely to be the first time uh, that Liz Truss's husband will meet the Queen. As Louise said, the Queen always very adept at making sure that everyone feels at ease in her company. Gordon Brown also described that how after that kissing of hands, that formal moment, you become Prime Minister happens, he then sat down with the Queen and had a little bit of a more business-like discussion. Of course, plenty uh, for Liz Truss to discuss. And I think very important for many people today to see the Queen. People have been concerned about about her health, seeing her many as a symbol of uh, stability, continuity, and that's exactly what she's doing today, carrying out one of the most important uh, constitutional roles. OK, Rhiannon, uh, keep listening for the uh, crunch of those tyres on the gravel. We'll be back with you when Liz Truss arrives. And if you scan the QR code on your screen, you can listen to the latest episode of the Sky News Daily podcast with Neil Patterson, who's been gathering reaction with the Daily's team to Liz Truss winning the Conservative leadership race. You can subscribe to The Daily free wherever you get your podcasts from. And you're watching Sky News Today, coming up. I'm in Warrington looking at some of the big challenges facing the new Prime Minister as she begins that first day in her new job. Stuart Ramsey and I'm Sky's chief correspondent. Well, there's a real sense now that people are beginning to expect that this whole airlift is coming to an end and they're really, really desperate. We saw snatch squads going in, grabbing people and putting them into trucks. You either live and recover or you die. OK, so that's like a war. That's the war, yes. Yeah. We help you understand the world with us. Over the past 24 hours, the soldiers have been attacked on a number of occasions. It's really sending a clear message that Venezuela is eager for change. We've been crushed. To take you to the heart of stories that shape our world. They were convinced the United States would become hooked. Well, they were right. An enormous explosion that's just come down. I think it was a monster that's just landed in between us. The information on this could bring down the entire network, not just in Iraq and Syria, but across the world. It's not out of control, but it's big withdrawn. It's so, so hot. And here we can see Liz Truss, leader of the Conservative Party, and soon to be the new Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, arriving 
at Balmoral Castle, making that short drive up the driveway where in just a matter of moments, she will be met by the Queen's equerry, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Tom White, and also the Queen's principal private secretary, Sir Edward Young. And the process, that formal process, the handover of power is in a matter of minutes going to be complete. Uh, joining me now is uh, Louise Tate. Let's just move Louise next to a microphone so that we can uh, talk about what we're expecting uh, to see in the next few moments. We've already seen this play out with Boris Johnson uh, and Carrie Johnson arriving earlier. You can see there uh, the equerry, the principal private secretary and members of the household waiting inside that covered entrance hall. And so they will drive into this, this, this portico and shortly get out for what is going to be a very important first meeting. Of course. Um, it's a very dramatic moment. <laughs> As you said, Rianne, on the weather has really um, lent its sense, own sense of drama to the occasion. Um, and it's, very, it's not untypical, this part of the world. Um, but I think it has just added to the atmosphere. Uh, Balmoral is a very atmospheric place. And I think that just emphasises that, to be honest, the weather. It'll keep the midges down, perhaps, and the insects away, for which this part of the world is famous, especially the midges. And we were saying, despite the fact that this is, for the first time, not happening at Buckingham Palace, everything, all the logistics, the planning, the formalities, run exactly to order. And here she is, Liz Truss, stepping out, shaking the hands there of Lieutenant Colonel Tom White and being met by uh, the Principal Private Secretary, Sir Edward Young. And the Ecury and Sir Edward Young, they play a very important role now, don't they, in making sure that both Liz Truss and her husband, Hugh O'Leary, yeah. are very aware of what happens now. It can be intimidating, I suspect, meeting yeah. the Queen for that first time. With the best will in the world, you know, it's helpful to have a, just a reminder of what's going to happen, no matter how accomplished you are. And I've seen it many times, people suddenly go, oh, what happens next? Um, so, yes, they're well, well looked after by senior officials. In this case, we've got the equity and the principal private secretary. That's perfectly normal uh, for the prime minister. And uh, as you can see, they, they will be taken inside. There will be perhaps a few moments of informal discussion um, before the equity comes and we'll take Liz Truss in to meet with the Queen uh, for her audience. Louise, thank you. And yeah, this is the important moment. We know Boris Johnson has already resigned. We know that the Queen has graciously accepted his resignation. And now Liz Truss will walk into the drawing room on the ground floor at Balmoral Castle and have her moment with the Queen. The Queen will ask her uh, to form a new government. And at that moment, the kissing of hands, as it's described, just simple handshake. At that moment, Liz Truss will finally be Prime Minister. I can hand you over now to Greg Milam, who is in Warrington, to get reaction there. Yeah, good morning from, from Warrington, where we're looking at some of the challenges facing Liz Truss now as Prime Minister, particularly uh, here in the north. We're in uh, the new state-of-the-art Warrington market, which is very nice. And Warrington is, if you like, a, a pretty typical example of, of the nation as a whole. And, and we have some some numbers that, that uh, lay that out for you. Gross household domestic income, what people have to spend after they've paid tax and key bills, was just under £21,000 last year here. That compared to just over £21,000 for the UK as a whole. Housing is slightly more affordable than nationally, with the average cost 8.3 times earnings compared to 10.1 nationally. And that, that national figure often skewed by the high prices in parts of London. Overall, prices in Warrington rose at 10.1% in the year to July. That's the same as the national figure. But real wages here fell by 4% in the year to April, compared to 3% for the UK as a whole. 25% of households in Warrington will be living in fuel poverty by October. That is, spending 10% or more on energy. That's compared to 32% nationally, depending, of course, on what happens with, with energy prices. And politically, Labour has controlled the council here in Warrington pretty comfortably since 2011, but the Conservatives have been narrowing that gap in recent years. There are two Westminster seats here, uh, Warrington North, held by Labour since its creation in 1983, Warrington South, traditionally more marginal. Uh, the Conservatives gained that from Labour uh, in 2019 with that, uh, that surge in the old 
red wall states. There's so many issues for the new Prime Minister to deal with. One of them, uh, the issue of the NHS and social care. Dave Thompson from the Warrington Disability Partnership is, is here with us. Morning uh, to you, Dave. Um, so many issues, as we were saying there, for the new Prime Minister, the NHS and social care among them. And you were telling me some of the stories you've been hearing in recent days, just about how critical that situation is for people. It is, Greg. And people, just, they're just about managing. Groups of people who yesteryear, a year ago, were just about managing, and today with all the energy and fuel crisis and cost of living, and now tipped over the edge. Only last week, one of our, uh, our workers got a phone call from a personal assistant that we support, uh, who was supporting a, a disabled man. And when she got to his house, uh, she found that he'd not eaten for two days. Uh, he'd have to use the money he had to put into the gas and electric meters to keep uh, his powered wheelchair, uh, a, a bed, an electric bed, and he had a breathing apparatus as well. So if you can imagine not being able to eat or face actually sort of the things that keep you alive. Uh, and this is the things that people are going to be facing going forward. The Prime Minister's got a huge job because disabled people in the main in past strategies have been completely missed because we get welfare benefits in, in the main, but some of these welfare benefits have now been taken into account for people's social care costs. So when social services are assessing uh, your ability to pay and contribute to that care, that could have been a year ago, two years ago. Well, that did not take into account today's energy costs. Did you hear anything in, in the leadership campaign that, that reassured you, if you like, that, that those sort of issues are, are going to be addressed? No, not at all. Um, we heard lots about people on universal credit, but lots of people who are just in that just about managing bracket are not on universal credit. These are people who are today having to face those major decisions of food or energy. What do you want to hear when Liz Truss speaks to the nation, as she will later today? What, what, if there's one thing you, you want to hear from her, what, what would it be? It, it's protecting those who are most vulnerable. And, and when she talks about protecting those who are most vulnerable, we don't want to simply hear universal credits. We want to hear about disabled people, older people. Uh, people with long-term health conditions, and it's that additional cost of living with a disability. And not just that, it's the support for the charities that support them. Our energy costs have gone threefold in the last six months, and, and charities will literally be not able to support people. So without that, the critical sort of fallback then is on social care and health care, and that's when the system will fall apart. You are saying as well that, that you, as a, as a charity, you're still a business. We, we know businesses are being hit by, by the energy price rises, all these other costs of inflation. What, what is the impact on, on you as, a, as an organisation? Well, the, again, fuel costs. Uh, we've got three vans on the road delivering. We, we, we set up a business arm um, to the charity ten years ago that contributes over a third of our income to the charity. That's, that's what we generate ourselves from the surplus or the profits from the, the business arm of the charity. So the, that, the cost of that has gone up. The cost of heating the buildings have gone up. The shops have gone up. Uh, the staffing costs have gone up over the years. Um, and social services and the grants that we get from health and social care have just not kept pace. And the expectation that we as a charity can continue to pay that, that cover that gap, I think is just not, going forward, just not going to be viable. This was one of those seats in 2019 that, that the Conservatives won with a, with a promise of, of levelling up. We've had three years of that. Where is Warrington? Where are those towns in the north now on, the, on that picture? Are you seeing any, any sense of equality being spread around the country? I've been fortunate, Greg, to actually be on the levelling up fund in Warrington, the, the town deal fund, and I can see the difference that money has made, and, and it has made a difference, and it will make a difference going forward uh, with the Health, Health and Social Care Academy uh, training much needed social care assistance for tomorrow, uh, the Health and Wellbeing Centre in Warrington Town Centre, which shall open next year, um, and the levelling up fund too, we just put a bid in for that, and one of them is a centre for excellence around disability sports. So, yeah, there is some money coming into the town, and, and we're really thankful of that. But it, for, for me, it's not just about the levelling up fund, it's about the government strategy now about this energy, fuel costs and cost of living crisis. It's got to be now, not in April next year. OK, Dave Thompson, thanks very much. We wish you the best of luck to you and your, your team. As I mentioned, we're in the new state-of-the-art market here in, in Warrington. A lot of new businesses uh, that have moved in here from locations elsewhere, the old market, for example. Uh, and we can um, show you uh, John Cross and Sons, family butchers since 1860, but new in here. John, morning to you. Um, we've just been talking about these, these issues that so many businesses are facing and now the new Prime Minister is facing. Tell us a little bit about you, how you're being affected by, in particular, the, the, the issue of energy prices. Yeah, I certainly, um, from a, a business perspective, it's obviously increased our overheads. But from our customers, I think they're living in fear. There's so little disposable income. That's because the, the gas and electric shooting up, and we've noticed a, a significant 
um, down turning our customers, regular customers, which is the backbone of our business, um, which is a bit disconcerting. So, you know, we, we, I, I, what would seasonally be an upturn for us going into the autumn and the winter, I, I have a great deal of reservation that we're going to get to the level of trade we need to. New Prime Minister, what's your view on what, what she will offer? Yeah, well, uh, you know, you've got to, she's got to back up what she said she's going to do. Um, you know, uh, I, I, I mean, we're in a, 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 a time in this country where we need strong leadership. So she's got to back that up with actions. Um, you know, I mean, she's not going to turn things around overnight, obviously. But, you know, people... I think we've been through a very difficult part with Covid and no government's been, you know, that, uh, faced that before. But the, some of the things we've been faced with now, we've got more control over, and I think people want to see something done a bit sooner rather than later. And do you have any optimism, having seen that, that leadership campaign, do you have optimism that, that what was talked about then will, will have an impact, I mean, you say for you, but also for those customers that you say you're seeing who are, who are struggling? Yeah, I think she's got, to, she's got to put... People have got to have their faith restored. Because I think the worst thing that happened with the Partygate scandal was the, the British public were lied to and blatantly lied to. And I think they've got to do a lot to get people back on their side. And how Warrington, we know, one of those seats that was targeted to the, you know, we, we've just been talking about levelling up and, and the attempt to spread equality. Do you think those who put their faith in, in the Conservatives back in 2019, maybe you'd always voted Labour, have got what they wanted out of that. Yeah, well, I mean, Warrington's always been a very divided town. You know, Labour in the north of the town, Conservatives in the south. But I think, yeah, I think at the moment, uh, I would say there's a lot of uh, people disillusioned with the Conservatives. So she, she's got a big job on her hands to turn this round. John, well, thanks very much. We'll let you get back to it. Uh, an uncertain time for the businesses who moved to this market. It opened in 2020, actually. It stayed open during lockdown because it was uh, because it was serving food. And it's pretty thriving today, as you can see, but some uncertain times for the businesses here and for those uh, using them as well. We'll have more from Warrington uh, during the course of the day. But for now, back to you, Doug. Greg, many thanks. Greg Marlin there. And you're watching Sky News today. Coming up... A new plea from the family of Olivia Bat Corbell, the nine-year-old who was shot dead in Liverpool.
Welcome back to Downey Street, where, as we speak, a new prime minister is being installed. But, of course, she, because, of course, it is Liz Truss, is not here yet. She's in Balmoral, where that process is taking place. Her Majesty the Queen accepted Boris Johnson's resignation as prime minister about half an hour ago, and Liz Truss is now being invited to form a government. She will then leave Balmoral and travel back down to London here, to Downing Street, to make a speech sometime later this afternoon. Uh, our deputy political editor, Sam Coates, is here with me. And in that speech itself, already, we want to hear from Liz Truss what is she going to do about the cost of living crisis. Her premiership, as some have said this morning, will be defined by how she responds to soaring energy prices that could bankrupt millions of households in a matter of weeks. If you remember, the energy price cap at the moment is at 1,971, could go up to around uh, 3,500 uh, early next year and then all the way up to 5,000. Now, we understand that uh, Liz Truss plans to freeze energy prices uh, at around 2,500. That will be the cap uh, that she sets, but she will also uh, have uh, keep in place uh, the £400 rebate uh, that uh, Rishi Sunak promised, the universal rebate uh, for everybody taking the price to not that much more uh, than the 1,900 cap uh, that is coming in uh, imminently. So Liz Truss wants to be able to say this week that she is going to be able to keep in place energy prices at their current level, at or just slightly above uh, their current level, at a cost, uh, it is expected, of around uh, 90 to 100 billion pounds. Uh, so we now have the first concrete details uh, of Liz Truss's energy plan. There's one really important thing here, which is there's been a debate all morning, there's been a debate bluntly, I think, amongst Liz Truss's team about whether just to borrow that money to compensate people, to shield them from the uh, higher excesses of the energy plan, or whether or not to uh, put in place a plan which would just simply see energy companies borrow that money on favourable terms and then have to um, pay it back probably through higher uh, energy bills. I understand that latter option is not the case. This will not see energy price bills, energy bills, go up in subsequent years, amounting to something like the kind of tax that Liz Truss would say uh, that she's against. Instead, it looks like this plan is just going to be paid for straight out of borrowing uh, itself. The markets, I think, will be uh, very interested in exactly the way uh, that this happens and how Liz Truss is to make sure that if President Putin keeps in place uh, a long-term uh, war on you know, Cold War, as it were, against, uh, as it were, against Europe, uh, how to make sure she's not on the hook for hundreds of billions of pounds year after year after year. But that, in essence, is Liz Truss's plan on day one uh, of a uh, capping energy prices at about £2,500, uh, keeping the universal payment of £400 and using those two things together to claim that energy bills uh, for the next few months will not be that much higher than the amount that she inherited already, of course, a hell of a lot higher uh, than uh, most people saw uh, just one year ago. Fascinating extra detail. Sam, thank you very much indeed. Sam Coates, our deputy political editor there, now well away from politics. And the family of Olivia Pratt Corbell, the nine-year-old girl who was shot dead inside her own home in Liverpool last month, have appealed for people to come forward with information about who killed her. Let's go live to Liverpool Sky's Ashna Hurinag is there. Well, uh, tell us more about what we've been hearing from the family, Ashna. Well, it was just over two weeks ago now that nine-year-old Olivia Pratt Corbell was shot at her home in the Dovecot area of the city. And today we've heard for the first time from her father, John Francis Pratt, who has issued a tribute to his daughter, in which he says... We Words can't express the pain we are going through after Olivia was so cruelly snatched away from us. Those responsible need to know what they have done. Olivia was a real bright spark who knew her own mind, had no problem making friends and loved to laugh and make people laugh. He goes on, Olivia's death cannot be in vain and we want people to feel safe and be safe and that can only happen if we all come together and make sure there is no place for guns or those who use guns on our streets 
or in our communities. Now, following on from that tribute issued by Olivia's father, is also a video that he's also issued to the public. It shows Olivia with her dad at a Christmas market in Liverpool city centre um, when she appears to be a little younger. She can be seen hugging him and she's smiling in that video. It was 10.30 on the 22nd of August in the evening in which a masked gunman entered Olivia's home and he fired a bullet that went through into the wrist of Olivia's mother. It then passed through her wrist and entered Olivia's chest, killing the nine-year-old girl. Officers here at Merseyside Police who are investigating Olivia's death have made four arrests on Sunday, including a key arrest, a 34-year-old man arrested on suspicion of attempted murder and attempt of attempted murder but also um, on suspicion of murder itself. Three more men have also been arrested on suspicion of assisting an offender. Police, though, continue their appeal for more information from the public. They say they need to piece together, together the events that led up to the tragic uh, death of nine-year-old Olivia. They say so far the appeal from the public has been successful. They have received an immense amount of information, but still they need more. That is a plea is, that has been echoed today by Olivia's father, who has paid tribute to his little girl, who loved to laugh, and whose life was tragically cut short. OK, Ashna, many thanks. Ashna Hurinag live there. In Liverpool, let's return now to the handover of power here in Downing Street, actually taking place in Power Moral. Let's look at who could be working in the new top team under Prime Minister Liz Truss. Well, her cabinet is rumoured to include Kwasi Kwarteng as Chancellor, Suella Braverman as Home Secretary, James Cleverley at the Foreign Office, uh, Therese Coffey perhaps in health and Jacob Rees-Mogg maybe as business secretary, uh, former Sky News presenter and political editor. Adam Bolton joins us now for his assessment. Uh, and of course, uh, Liz Truss always said she wants to hit the ground running. A lot of her top team already thought to be in place. Yeah, I think those top four great officers of state, including the uh, premiership itself, uh, they are do seem to be nailed on, as you've just said, Dermot. And uh, uh, interestingly, it'll be the first time ever in British history, and remember this is our 56th Prime Minister, uh, that there has not been a white man in any of those top four uh, offices. Uh, that is certainly a sign of the diversity at the top uh, of the Conservative Party. Uh, we did, you remember, get a, a putative list at the weekend, a well-briefed list at the weekend of other Cabinet appointments. And I think it's clear, as often happens in reshuffles, that that hasn't necessarily gone according to plan. Uh, for example, Sajid Javid uh, has said that he doesn't want to serve in the Cabinet. Uh, Nadine Dorries has also said that she wants to go to the uh, backbenches. And, of course, uh, we never quite clear what was going to happen to Priti Patel. Well, she said yesterday she's standing down. Michael Gove is another person who's standing down. Doesn't look like there's going to be a job for Dominic Rowe. Uh, and not quite clear, I think, in the second tier below the great offices of state quite who's going there. Uh, Therese Coffey, as you say, is being tipped to go to health. Uh, not quite clear whether she's going to go there yet. We're hearing Kit Malthouse uh, might be going to education. Interesting one I've heard, although it hasn't been confirmed, is that Penny Morden, uh, who came third, of course, amongst the MPs in their preferences for the new leader of the Tory party, uh, suggesting she may become leader of the House, uh, which I think would certainly be a popular appointment uh, with MPs. Some people even saying uh, she might be given the post of Deputy Prime Minister, but uh, we have to wait and see. And, of course, the big thing is how long this is all going to take uh, because uh, we know that Liz Truss wants to hit the ground running. She wants to get... Uh, proposals as what she's going to do about soaring energy prices through a cabinet as soon as possible. Uh, but she can only do that uh, once it's all been appointed. OK, Adam, many thanks. Adam Bolt. Well, now, armed police have shot dead a man in his 20s after a car chase ended in South London. Officers say they were pursuing a suspect vehicle last night. Police apparently deliberately collided with the car to force it to stop, bringing the pursuit to an end in Streatham Hill. Uh, residents reported hearing gunshots and a police helicopter in the sky above. There's a massive bang. I thought a neighbour's roof had fallen off or something. It's a real that 
I think it was like boom, boom like something that maybe it bounced or something. And I looked out the back window to see something had fallen, and straight away I, I didn't really notice it before, but straight away I could hear the helicopter very close in the air. And that's not terribly unusual for around here, but it suddenly was like, you know, just felt more intense. But it's usually fairly, fairly calm around here, so it's a bit, bit of a shock. Yeah. Well, our crime correspondent, Martin Brunton, uh, joins me now live. Uh, Martin, what more details have you got about the pursuit and the incident itself? Well, the police watchdog, the Independent Office for Police Conduct, has taken over this investigation, and their investigators have been here uh, since last night, working through the night, probably about to hand over to a new team. And the kind of thing they're trying to establish is you know, vital things like, was there a weapon, a non-police weapon, retrieved from the scene? What was the reason for the police pursuit? Those are the vital questions. Um, that will be asked how many officers were involved, how many shots were fired, and trying to establish as closely as they can the exact circumstances and what prompted uh, the shooting. Were any shots fired at the police? Now, uh, I don't have answers to any of those, and I think at this stage, investigators aren't absolutely clear. They will have got last night's um, initial statements, very brief statements from the officers involved, um, but it may take some longer time to establish exactly what happened. Um, the facts, according to the police, are that this happened just before 10 o'clock last night. Police had pursued uh, a vehicle from Lambeth, so sounds as though it was heading south, probably hadn't travelled very far. Uh, they came to this road here, uh, police rammed the car, or um, <clears throat> not clear how violent uh, that was, um, but they brought it to a halt. Uh, according to witnesses, uh, the officers got out, asked the driver to get out, uh, and according to another witness, the car moved towards the police cars and then a shot or shots were fired. Um, there's no official identification of the man who died, but there is a name on the street. Friends of the man they think was the victim here who died have been talking uh, about their um, how distraught they are, how they recognised him from the car number plate, the car's still here. Uh, they say he was on his way to see friends and they are, like his family, completely puzzled and shocked about what happened here last night. OK, Martin Brunt in Streatham in South London. Thank you very much indeed. Confirmed that it has officially happened. Liz Truss okay. is now officially Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Let's uh, show you the formal moment when it happened. Uh, there it is being confirmed. Her Majesty the Queen asking Liz Truss to form her next government. That is her 15th Prime Minister. The kissing of hands, as you can see there, is actually a handshake uh, taking place in Balmoral, of course, because of the Queen's ongoing mobility issues confirmed there by her use of that walking stick. But that is the moment when Liz Truss became the new Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. It'll take her a little while then to travel back here to Downing Street to take over at Number 10 itself. And our Deputy Political Editor, Sam Coates, is here with me to talk us through the, the scale then of the, the task, the tasks that's a waiter. Britain has its 56th Prime Minister. Liz Truss, the longest serving member of the Cabinet, has succeeded Boris Johnson in a contest that few foresaw just a few months ago. Liz Truss outwitted her political foes and her political friends to assume this job, uh, becoming Prime Minister up in Balmoral in the last few minutes, taking on an in-tray perhaps bigger than any Prime Minister, maybe since Margaret Thatcher, maybe since the Second World War, uh, with conflict and strife uh, abroad and challenges at home uh, as we're at this perilous point with the British economy. Within hours, she has to form a new government that her allies say will mark a radical departure even from the work of Boris Johnson. And then within days, she's got to set out a bold and far-reaching plan that will see her uh, help households all across the country deal with this phenomenal rise in the basic cost of living with the sharp increase in energy costs. 
And what a contrast it's going to be to, to just a few days ago, those weeks of the summer, the long summer, when Boris Johnson referred to himself in his farewell speech there as a, as a booster that comes back to Earth. You could use another space analogy and say he's been like a, like a satellite in space, orbiting pointlessly, that we lost contact with. The government has been doing nothing. Now it's going to be all over as much as it can. For the last seven weeks, nobody would deny that effectively the British government has been on hold while the Conservative Party chose a successor to Boris Johnson. But if you were being a bit more honest, Dermot, you would actually say that because of the scandal that has engulfed Boris Johnson's premiership across the final months, there has not been a clean single focus of Prime Minister uh, for the Prime Minister because of the multiple challenges. Remember, we spent months talking about parties. We spent months talking about the conduct of Boris Johnson and those around him. So it would be wrong just to say that there has been distraction in the last few weeks. There have been months and months of uh, turmoil in the heart of government that has acted as a distraction in a parliament that has seen, I mean, really some of the most far-reaching events of our lifetime uh, with a pandemic, uh, uh, dealing with the aftermath of Brexit, the leaving uh, of the single market and the customs union, so huge administrative as well as political challenges, uh, and then more recently the far-reaching consequences uh, of the war in Ukraine, uh, which is having uh, a, which is causing a blight uh, both on households and for businesses already uh, having to come to terms with so many of those challenges. That's why there has been an accumulation of problems uh, now all landing uh, on Liz Truss's in tray. She will be back in a few hours time here for the first time to walk in through that door as Prime Minister, giving us a speech that will set out the direction of travel that will put um, finding growth, getting rid of that anemic uh, 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 economic improvement that uh, she thinks has been at the root of British problems for the last 20 years. Uh, she will put finding that at the heart of her mission. But first, she's got to deal with energy bills. And what about Boris Johnson? Uh, we heard him in that speech I referred to talking about uh, going quietly in effect. But uh, you were here when I interviewed Lord Pickles, former party chairman, about an hour ago. He said he thinks he's Boris Johnson's got another big political job in him. He said, not perhaps in Downing Street. What do you think his ambitions, Boris Johnson's ambitions are? Boris Johnson has always been a master communicator. And I think what was fascinating about his early morning speech this morning is that he basically did two completely contradictory things. He pledged to throw uh, his loyalty behind Liz Truss, urging all Conservatives to do the same. But he couldn't help himself, could he, Dermot? He couldn't help just hint that he would be like Cincinnati, who went back uh, to plough his fields. Uh, right, but then, of course, so scholars a, a, would... A 5th century BC Roman general who became dictator for 15 days to, to help out the Roman Empire and then went back to his farm. And then returned to help put out uh, a rebellion. So uh, the returning aspect of that, perhaps hinting some, some of his ambition. But so long as he's an MP, people will turn to Boris Johnson. Uh, he just attracts attention. Uh, TV cameras follow him. So do crowds of people who elected him in 2019, giving him something of a personal mandate about which he and his allies always used to talk. Uh, having uh, inherited the crown at this point is difficult enough for Liz Truss, uh, but with the big political beast of Boris Johnson looking down uh, over uh, her shoulder uh, on the Commons backbench. It's, it's just that bit harder. She has an ability to perhaps influence, though, his political trajectory, doesn't she, in terms of this parliamentary inquiry, the standards inquiry into whether he misled Parliament or not. That is getting underway. There are some key appointments, a key appointment that's just taken place on the Conservative side. Now, Liz Truss said during the hustings that she wasn't a great fan of this inquiry into Boris Johnson, but if it continues and finds him guilty of misleading Parliament, uh, it is in a position then what to perhaps cost him his seat. Um, it is remarkable that Boris Johnson was slung out by his own party a matter of weeks ago because they did not think he was a fit Prime Minister, that he uh, was bringing the office into disrepute because of a series of scandals culminating, of course, uh, in the decision not to take swift enough action against uh, Chris Pincher. 
Uh, but now, if you listen to Liz Truss, she talks of Boris Johnson as her friend. Um, she welcomed him and thanked him uh, yesterday as she accepted the leadership. Um, she is not doing what many expected, which is to put a bit of distance between him uh, and her. Indeed, she is inheriting many and keeping many of the key people in Cabinet that also worked around his Cabinet table. So, in some ways, it looks like this is more continuity. It's just in the policy direction, this trust looks like she's going to go in a sharply different uh, direction. Boris Johnson's political future is an interesting one, though. That Uxbridge seat in West London that he inherits, that's going to be very hard to keep. Uh, whether the uh, committee uh, uh, that uh, now has one more uh, favourable Conservative to Boris Johnson on it than it did 24 hours ago, whether that uh, finds in his favour or not. And Sam, just before we go to our top of the hour break, just uh, talk us through again that breaking line you got on where you think Liz Truss is going to put the price cap, the frozen price cap, in terms of one of her, her first actions as Prime Minister. So what we're hearing is that Liz Truss will set the price cap as £2,500. Uh, uh, the amount people will pay in practice lower than that because of the £400 uh, uh, universal benefit that Rishi Sudak agreed. And then uh, uh, and that will, uh, for uh, the next few months, uh, cushion people's pain. Uh, although, of course, bills are a lot higher than they were. The key detail appears to be that that uh, help will not then be clawed back through higher energy bills in future, but instead paid for uh, by borrowing, by taxation, uh, passed on to future uh, generations, as it were. Uh, Liz Truss doing what she said at the start of the campaign, that she wouldn't, uh, some might call it a sticking plaster, some say it's um, cash without reform, uh, but nevertheless, a big moment this week. And the big question then, who pays for that? What the money markets make of that, uh, the international money markets. Well, uh, as we go to that break, as I mentioned there, let's uh, remain on that picture from earlier this hour in Balmoral. Her Majesty the Queen, the, the very moment that she is asking Liz Truss to form her next government to become her 15th Prime Minister. Much more reaction coming up.
This is Sky News Today, live from Downing Street. It is one o'clock. Liz Truss is formally appointed Prime Minister as she has travelled to Balmoral to meet Her Majesty the Queen. Earlier, Boris Johnson finally bowed out, promising to get behind the new Prime Minister in a defiant final speech. I am now like one of those booster rockets that has fulfilled its function and I will now be gently re-entering the atmosphere and splashing down invisibly in some remote and obscure corner of the Pacific. Liz Truss begins her first day facing an energy crisis, but promising a £100 billion energy price freeze that could last until the next election. I'm in Warrington looking at some of the big challenges facing the new Prime Minister as she begins that first day in the new job. Also ahead, new video is released of Olivia Pratt Corbell as her father says her death cannot be in vain. And a man in his 20s is shot dead by police in South London after a car chase. A very good afternoon from Downing Street, where Liz Truss will be returning as the new Prime Minister in the next few hours. She travelled to Balmoral this morning, accompanied by her husband, to meet Her Majesty the Queen and formally to be asked to form Her Majesty's next government. The handover of power would normally take place, of course, at Buckingham Palace, just down the road from Downing Street, but Her Majesty has remained at Balmoral, her summer residence, because of her ongoing mobility issues. Uh, Boris Johnson and his wife Carrie made the same journey to Balmoral a bit earlier than Liz Truss, where he then tendered his resignation. And earlier, Mr Johnson left Downing Street for the final time in his last speech as Prime Minister. Mr Johnson described himself as a booster rocket that has fulfilled its function championing his administration's achievements. They included Brexit, the vaccine rollout and the response to the war in Ukraine. Well, this is, this is it, folks. Thank you, everybody, for coming out so early this morning. In only a couple of hours, I will be in Balmoral to see Her Majesty the Queen. And the torch will finally be passed to a new Conservative leader. The baton will be handed over in what has unexpectedly turned out to be a relay race. They changed the rules halfway through, but never mind that now. And through that lacquered black door, a new Prime Minister will shortly go to meet a fantastic group of public servants. The people who got Brexit done. The people who delivered the fastest vaccine rollout in Europe and never forget, 70% of the entire population got a dose within six months faster than any comparable country. That is government for you. That's this Conservative government. People who organised those prompt early supplies of weapons to the heroic Ukrainian armed forces, an action that may very well have helped change the course of the biggest European war for 80 years. And looking at what is happening in this country, the changes that are taking place, that is why private sector investment is flooding in. More private sector, more venture capital investment than China itself. More billion pound tech companies sprouting here in the UK than in France, Germany and Israel combined. And as a result, unemployment as I leave office, unemployment down to lows not seen since I was about 10 years old and bouncing around on a space hopper, my friends. And on, on, the subject of, on the subject of bouncing around in future careers, let me say that I am now like one of those booster rockets that has fulfilled its function and I will now be gently re-entering the atmosphere and splashing down invisibly in some remote and obscure corner of the Pacific. <laughs> and like Cincinnatus, I am returning to my plough. And I will be offering this government nothing but the most fervent support. This is, 
I'll tell you why. This is a tough time for the economy. This is a tough time for families up and down the country. We can and we will get through it and we will come out stronger the other side. But I say to my fellow Conservatives, it's time for politics to be over, folks. It's time for us all to get behind Liz Truss and her team and her programme and deliver for the people of this country. Because that is what the people of this country want, that's what they need, and that's what they deserve. Together, we have laid foundations that will stand the test of time, whether by taking back control of our laws or putting in vital new infrastructure. Great, solid masonry on which we will continue to build together. Paving, paving the path of prosperity now and for future generations. And I will be supporting Liz Truss and the new government every step of the way. Thank you all very much. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. That was Boris Johnson uh, very early this morning in Downing Street. We are uh, taking out to the latest pictures from Balmoral. Uh, that car is certainly uh, a car nearby carrying the new Prime Minister, Liz Truss. She arrived in Balmoral, as you can see, uh, pretty murky conditions there. She arrived by aircraft at Aberdeen International Airport, then by road to Balmoral to be received by Her Majesty the Queen to be formally asked to form the government for Her Majesty and become Her Majesty's 15th Prime Minister, a span that goes all the way, in fact, to, to Winston Churchill, Boris Johnson's hero. You can see there with the... Look at the, the water there. You can see there the conditions uh, in the northeast of Scotland. Um, we understand that her aircraft coming in had to circle for a bit and uh, find an opportune moment to get down on the ground. We know that she's returning there immediately and will then come back to London. Now, this is the... Time scale, as we understand it, at the moment, Liz Truss is then, as Prime Minister, expected to make an address here in Downing Street, uh, outside, if the weather conditions hold up here in central London, in Westminster, or inside Downing Street itself, setting out her stall as the new Prime Minister. Our political correspondent, Joe Pike, is here with me. And, you know, what an entree, as they say, and it is this energy crisis, this cost of living crisis, that is front and centre. It certainly is, Dermot, and I think fact that we already have a pretty good idea of who this trust's cabinet is, partly because of those crises coming down the line incredibly fast. She does seem to have given the nod to a lot of uh, senior uh, allies, for example, Kwasi Kwarteng as, as Chancellor, Suella Braverman as uh, Home Secretary, James Cleverley and, uh, as Foreign Secretary, partly so they could use the last three weeks of August to start getting ready uh, for their roles and get ready for a package of support on cost of living and energy, which we expect to be announced later this week, perhaps Thursday or Friday, certainly in the last hour or so, my colleague uh, Sam Coates has been firming up our understanding of what is in that package. Certainly looks like uh, a cap around two and a half uh, grand, that is for an average household per month. That is significant, but strange that perhaps two days before we'd expect to hear this from the Prime Minister or a Cabinet Minister in the House of Commons, we are already uh, understanding what the government wants to do. A big question still over what support there will be for businesses, businesses that are struggling. And one thing we do know is that the government want to pay for this by borrowing. That may be the key dividing line, because Labour, of course, at the heart of their pitch for a cap on the price freeze was the idea of a windfall tax on the profits of oil and gas companies. So a bit of a difference, Dermot, there, which we may hear a lot more of in the Commons tomorrow at PMQs or in the later weeks. That's the politics of it all. Let's uh, talk about some of the, well, I suppose the tradition of it, and that is what has taken place in Balmoral earlier today, starting this morning. The fact that this is happening in Balmoral, uh, the first time, I think, for nearly 140 years since Lord Salisbury uh, went through the same process with Queen Victoria, and uh, illustrating that, I suppose, the strangeness of the times, the fact that Her Majesty can't travel, she has these mobility issues. Exactly. And Lord Salisbury, Dermot, I wasn't a huge fan of uh, Balmoral when he went up to meet uh, Queen Victoria. He uh, compared it to uh, Siberia. Certainly the fact that the uh, monarch's health and the monarch's mobility is a priority over uh, the Prime Minister and former Prime Minister having, having to make a journey is, is uh, significant. And it's also the start, I think, of an important relationship 
that Liz Truss will have because the Prime Minister, as all her uh, 14 predecessors have had, um, this, this weekly audience with the Queen, sometimes in person, sometimes over the phone, which historians certainly say is a very important relationship, partly because of the confidence held. Ben Pimlott, uh, one historian, saying the uh, monarch is the constitutionally sanctioned counsellor and therapist, the only person a prime minister uh, can talk to whose confidence they know will not be abused. A very important relationship of somebody who has seen politics and crises for decades and perhaps can provide some context and advice, even though you and I will never know the content of those private discussions. OK, Joe, for the time being, many thanks. Well, let's concentrate more now on the, some of those economic challenges we've just been discussing. And the markets have been making their own judgment already about Liz Truss's economic plans. Deutsche Bank said what it calls a large unfunded fiscal expansion, significant cuts to tax or rises in spending, all of which seem to be in Liz Truss's plans, could damage investors' confidence. The economic backdrop for the new Prime Minister is extremely challenging, to say the very least. Gas prices, of course, uh, rose again yesterday. Our economics and data editor, Ed Conway, has his analysis. So what are the main economic challenges facing the new Prime Minister? Let's just go through some of them. Some of them she can control, some of them she can't, including starting with this. This shows you wholesale gas prices, so energy prices. And what you can see is just how much they have ramped up uh, in the last few years and indeed the last few months. Just look, up to nearly a record high uh, just recently and it's been bouncing around what with what's happening in Russia uh, and Ukraine. That is something that's feeding into all of our bills, obviously, and we're starting to see that now. And the concern is if that stays high, it's even higher bills in the next few months. And that's the stars, and that's undoubtedly going to be the big thing that she has to uh, deal with. But it feeds, of course, into our pockets. This is one measure of that. This shows you our household disposable income. Basically, once you've adjusted for inflation, for all the things we have to spend money on, this is how much things are growing. So anything above the line shows it's growing. We're getting better off. The feel-good factor is rising. Anything below the line, well, that's bad news. We're shrinking. And look at what's happening in the next few years. Look, red, red bars there. You can see we're going to have the biggest fall in our disposable income on record so that we've ever seen. That's an enormous thing for Liz Truss to have to deal with, as is this next chart. It's showing you kind of a similar thing, but just displaying it in a different way. The higher this line is, the higher our real earnings. So you can see they go up and up and up. Then you've got the financial crisis down a bit and starting to go up just recently. But look at what's happened, uh, what's going to happen in the next few years. The forecast uh, from the Office of Budget Responsibility, that's going to go down quite a lot and you're talking about it being next year the same level that it was in 2003. That's two lost decades of earnings growth. Incredibly depressing there. It's not all bad news. It's worth just taking a step back and looking at some other big statistics. And no doubt Liz Truss uh, is going to be shown all of these things. How the UK compares with other countries around the world on unemployment. The higher these bars are, the higher the unemployment rate. So the fact that the UKs are, well, middle of the pack, relatively low, that's good news. OK, so unemployment is good. It's a good story at the moment. Growth, GDP growth, ideally you want that bar to be higher, but the UK, middle of the pack, certainly not the worst. But here's one you don't want to be high. Look at that red bar. We're going to show you inflation. Look, the UK has the highest inflation rate in the G7. No one quite knows why, but the UK really have, does have stubbornly high inflation. It's expected to go even higher uh, in the next few months. And all of this means there's probably less capacity for Liz Truss to deal with the thing that she really wants to deal with, which is... This, the tax burden in the UK, forecast to head up to the highest level that we've seen since the 1940s. She wants to bring that down, but what with everything else she has to do, what with all of these other challenges, there's a big question as to whether she's going to be able to do that. Ed Conway there with his analysis. We'll be getting much more on the economic challenges and the financial reaction in just a moment or two. But uh, first, to bring you the latest shots of the two aircraft that uh, have arrived at Aberdeen Airport today. That was the first one containing Boris Johnson and his wife Carrie. He arrived there as Prime Minister. He leaves there as a backbench MP. Arrived in fairly murky conditions, it must be said. Conditions have cleared up a little bit. He flies off and, uh, as he told us in his speech earlier this morning, his farewell speech as Prime Minister to 
return to Earth as a booster rocket that's done its job to then land in some quiet part of the Pacific and offer his uh, fulsome support for the new Prime Minister. Uh, just to let you know, if you scan the QR code on your screen, you can listen to the latest edition of the Sky News Daily podcast with Neil Patterson. He's been gathering reaction with the Daily's team to Liz Truss's anointment as the new Prime Minister. And you can subscribe to the Daily, as you probably know, free wherever you get your podcasts from. Now, as I said, uh, much more reaction to the financial side of this change over and what we know about Liz Truss's plans. The plans uh, are thought to include something major to tackle the cost of living crisis. That could see at least £100 billion of support offered to consumers and businesses. The emergency package is expected to include freezing energy bills for homes and businesses. We understand it's something like the level of £2,500 until January next year, maybe longer than that, could go on until the next election, uh, 2024, if it is then. It's expected that energy suppliers will be able to take out government-backed loans to subsidise bills, or indeed that uh, the government may just borrow the money. Our business presenter, Ian King, joins us now from the city. And, uh, Ian, all eyes on how the markets are going to react and are reacting to the appointment of Liz Truss. Yes, that's right, Dermot. Well, I mean, uh, the markets for the last six weeks or so have been telling you what they think of the UK's economic prospects because, uh, obviously, the pound has been selling off. In fact, on Monday, yesterday, it hit uh, its lowest level against the US dollar since the 23rd of March 2020, which, of course, is the day that Boris Johnson put the UK back into, into its first COVID-related lockdown. As for gilts, government IOUs, UK government bonds, well, the yield on those, which is the implied borrowing cost, well, that's been rising very sharply. Uh, if you take 10 year uh, UK government gilts. The yield on those was 1.7% at the beginning of August. Right now, it's just shy of 3%. So that is implying a very big increase in government borrowing costs. And this is the uh, key question as regards the uh, government support for households and businesses with higher energy bills. Now, there's been, there was a lot of conflicting uh, reporting in this morning's newspaper. Some people suggesting that it would be paid for out of government borrowing. Other newspapers and news outlets suggesting that, in fact, it would be a private sector scheme whereby the government would be backstopping bill, uh, loans that were made by the banking sector. Well, as our colleague Sam Coates has been reporting in the last hour or so, it looks as if it's going to be funded out of general taxation. Now, implicit in that is a very big increase in government borrowing. Now, is that necessarily going to tip the UK into, a, into an inflationary spiral and a big debt spiral? Not necessarily. If, if Liz Truss and her incoming Chancellor, who we think will be quasi carting, can convince investors that this is the uh, lesser of two evils, that this is something that potentially could get the UK on a path back to growth fairly swiftly, well, it may not necessarily go down all that badly. However, the Institute of Fiscal Studies, impeccably uh, neutral, of course, and independent, well, they've made clear they think this is a pretty bad idea for a couple of reasons. First of all, if you're going to give blanket support for households, as we think is going to happen with an all-round energy price freeze at around the level of the uh, price cap right now, £1,971, well, essentially, you're going to be throwing an awful lot of money taxpayer money at households who don't necessarily need financial support. So that is one issue. The other is that by taking away the pricing discipline, you're going to remove the incentive for both households and businesses to ration energy. And so there are other schemes that uh, have been kicked around. I mean, for example, the Germans have said that they're, they're going to backstop with taxpayer money a certain amount of energy for every household. But then after that, you have to meet higher costs on your own. That, of course, is an incentive for people to save energy. And, indeed, German uh, energy use has fallen by some 26% since the spring. So that's the uh, German approach, for, for example. In France, of course, we know Emmanuel Macron has already uh, frozen uh, energy prices. That has come at vast expense to the French taxpayer. He spent €12 billion Euros alone buying up shares in the uh, energy provider EDF that the government didn't already own. So there are various models being kicked around. It looks as though the order of support that is going to be coming from the trust administration, if that number is correct, 100 billion, well, that is sharply higher than the kind of numbers that we're seeing in the Eurozone. For example, Germany's uh, energy support packages so far have totaled some 65 billion euros. So this is a very, very big bazooka indeed, potentially, that the Truss administration would be firing to support households and businesses. Don't forget, the Johnson government gave no support to businesses with their energy bills whatsoever. So there'll be a lot of interest in the business sector, particularly among some of those energy intensive 
intensive users, the manufacturing sector, the steel companies, for example, the construction sector, the sort of support that they'll be getting in particular as well. But it looks like a big dramatic move as things stand. OK, Ian, many thanks for that analysis, Ian King, our business presenter there, and Ian referring to the Trust administration. That administration being formed as we speak as this trust makes her way back from Balmoral, where she was invited to form a new government by Her Majesty the Queen uh, just, what, under an hour ago or so. Let's go live there. Our royal correspondent, Rhiannon Mills, is there. And, of course, as we say, uh, Rhiannon Liz Truss has been uh, asked to form the... Her Majesty's new government, she's the next Prime Minister, and Boris Johnson resigned, offered his resignation shortly before that. Talk us through what you've been seeing there this morning. So it was around 20 minutes ago that we saw the new 15th Prime Minister for the Queen, Liz Truss, in a car leaving Balmoral Castle after having that all-important audience with the Queen, the moment where the monarch formally asks her to form a new government. The moment that Liz, Tr Liz, Liz Truss said yes was the moment that she officially became the Prime Minister. That's all now been confirmed by Buckingham Palace. So, in essence, that important handover of power is now complete. The Queen has carried out her official duties, albeit in a rather different way, here at Balmoral rather than at Buckingham Palace. But that process is now complete. There's also been, as is customary, a photograph released of the moment, the moment described as the kissing of hands, no kissing involved, actually a handshake or a simple bow or a curtsy. Louise Tate, who was the former communications secretary to the Queen here in Scotland, joins me now. We were taking a look at that photograph, weren't we, uh, Louise? Now, the first thing that stood out to me was the fact that the Queen seemed to be dressed less formally, but you weren't surprised about that. Not, not really, no, not at all. Um, I think that's indicative of when uh, the Queen is here at Balmoral. We've had official photographs before where perhaps she looks slightly less formally attired. Tired. Um, she was wearing uh, a skirt in the Balmoral tartan, which we've seen many times on the Prince of Wales, who's known as the Duke of Rossi in Scotland. We've seen it, of course, on the Duke of Edinburgh uh, quite a few times. Um, but yes, that's what stood out to me, is that that was traditional Balmoral attire for Her Majesty. Yep. The first time that we've seen her since she arrived at Aberdeen Airport at the end of, of July, and I think for some, there has still been discussion about her health. We know that she wasn't able to travel to London because of mobility issues. Some reassurance today that we have seen her, and again, it's that sense of duty comes first. Yes, things have to change. She still wants to carry on, though, doesn't she? Absolutely. She made that pledge very early in her reign, and I don't think that that uh, wish has been diminished in the least. And I think we've seen evidence of that today, her determination to carry on with the, her role as head of state uh, in accepting resignation of one prime minister and then formally asking a, the next one, the incoming prime minister, to form a government. Yeah, it's part of her role. It's interesting. It is absolutely <laughs> tipping it down here, so hopefully you can hear us uh, <laughs> over the rain. That audience took a little bit longer than we thought it would. Liz Truss leaving slightly later. You wonder whether the Queen was looking out the window thinking, well, I can't send them out in that <laughs> quite yet. But it is a really important first meeting. Yes, there's that formal yeah. moment, the kissing of hands, but then time for more discussion, I suppose, and the starting and forming of a very important relationship for Liz Truss. Oh, well, of course, we can only speculate, because as we've already spoken about, these sort of meetings, these audiences are kept very confidential. But it is, it's, it's, it's going to be one of the key um, things for, for the new Prime Minister is establishing that role with them, that relationship with the monarch and getting a feel and an understanding and just how, to, how that relationship's going to evolve and develop. And uh, it's going to be an incredibly valuable one for both Her Majesty and the new Prime Minister. Louise, thank you very much. Um, as Louise was alluding to there, it's a really important relationship. Two very powerful individuals who, in some ways, can only appreciate between themselves exactly what it feels. It can be lonely at the top, as some have described. The Queen also in the past has explained how her Prime Ministers, during those weekly audiences, can sometimes unburden themselves. She's talked about the fact that she is there to be consulted, to be encouraged and to warn when it comes to 
that new Prime Minister. I think, of course, as we've talked about a great deal, there are challenges ahead uh, for Liz Truss. We wonder whether those were, were discussed in that audience. Also, Liz Truss, of course, now forming her cabinet. It's the Queen who does the final official signing off of that. Maybe there was a discussion about that. But also, I think, for some out there, at these times of political uncertainty, cost of living crisis, difficult time for families, there will be a sense of reassurance that today we have seen the Queen again carrying out her official role and that very important constitutional duty. And thanks for talking us through it all, Rhiannon Mills, our royal correspondent, live for us in Balmoral. Well, good afternoon from, in contrast, a very sunny uh, Warrington, uh, where we're looking at some of the issues facing the new Prime Minister, particularly here in the north. Warrington is a pretty typical uh, town, uh, uh, reflecting much of the, the national averages across uh, the country. Also, crucially, it was one of the, the two seats here taken by Boris Johnson and the Conservatives in 2019, breaking that, that so-called red wall, of course, with promises to uh, voters uh, in the north. Much of that was focused on this issue of levelling up that we hear uh, so much about. Have they delivered on that? Well, we can ask uh, Sylvie Morton, who's the Assistant Director of Mikador Regional Development uh, Consultancy. Sylvie, thanks for talking to us on, on Sky News this afternoon. On that issue, levelling up, we hear a lot about it. It mm -hmm. obviously was a lot was promised to constituencies like this in 2019. First of all, what do you understand it means? What, what do people understand that actually means to them? A lot of people don't understand what it means and there's never been a very clear definition of what levelling up was or should be. So I think levelling up, in our view, is increasing productivity and it's, it's increasing productivity across the country to increase prosperity for everyone. When you look at local levels, there are still so many disparities and by levelling up, we, we are going to share that prosperity for the whole of the UK. During the leadership campaign, we variously heard that levelling up would be ditched. Liz Truss saying she would double down on, on levelling up. What did you hear in that leadership campaign about what constituencies like this can expect from, from the new Prime Minister? Well, I would say the campaign was... I didn't listen to it that much, basically, because I think the campaign is not what it was about. What it's about is actually carrying on the big agenda items which are going to make a difference. So what we need with this new Prime Minister is actually leadership and focus on delivering up because that is what is going to deliver. We've seen here and, and across the country, government jobs have been moved out to, to regions. We've seen billions of pounds. People have talked here to us today about some of the, the, the projects that have received money as a result of that, of that new agenda. You think that's not enough? That's not going far enough? That's good, but that's not enough. Basically, what we need with levelling up is a lot more devolved local authority. Local authorities like this town in Warrington, they know their area better, they know what needs to be done. The problem is that they haven't got the resource. They've been starved of money for the last 10 years. There's no money left and there's no resource left to actually put in place all these plans which could make a difference. What does that do, though, practically? Because you hear that a lot, that, that people say that power should be devolved to local authorities, particularly on things like education after the age of 16, yeah. to get people the, the training, vocational training. What difference practically would that make somewhere like this? That would make people at local authority level a lot more hands-on and being able to devolve more resource and, and really help rather than having, you know, being tied to government policies which may not be applicable equally across all the different areas. On, on energy, so much talk about cost of living and the, and the prices rocketing, and we may hear in the next few days something to, to tackle that. What do you hear in communities like this about the impact that's having and, and the fear of what might come next on that? It's fear, it's, it's drama, and it's, uh, and it's all realistic because people are already struggling now before October, before January. And that goes for both uh, individuals and families and communities. But also what is kind of overlooked is the effect that the energy crisis has on business. Uh, businesses are not su subjected to or do not, uh, are not beneficiary from the price cap. And their costs are going up and up and up. So we have there a big threat of businesses, especially small businesses, having to, to close down, basically, because they won't be able to sustain the costs. Uh, and 
that's snowballing into job losses and, and so on and making things worse. We're expecting to hear from the new Prime Minister in the next few hours. What is, if, you, if there was one thing you wanted to hear from her as the country's new leader, what would that be? Uh, one thing, unfortunately there's not one thing, there's three things in my view. There's definitely deal with this uh, cost of living crisis and it's not only energy, it's everything and it's actually supporting people to get through that. Uh, help with the energy crisis and support businesses to get through that which will support the economy altogether. And the biggest thing is keep that leadership and that focus on levelling up and help us and help local authorities to deliver that levelling up for the UK. OK, well, we'll see what she does say later on. Sylvie, thank you very That's much uh, okay. for talking to us. Um, uh, that, the view from here in Warrington, it was Boris Johnson who made those promises in 2019. It is now for Liz Truss to deliver on them to uh, communities like this one. We'll have more from Warrington during the course of the afternoon. But for now, back to you, Wilfred, in the Sky News Centre. Greg, thanks so much. Uh, you're watching Sky News and still to come a new plea from the family of Olivia Pratt Corbell, the nine-year-old who was shot dead in Liverpool. Welcome back. This morning, Boris Johnson left Downing Street for the final time after delivering a speech outside Number 10 in which he promised fervent support for his successor and likened himself to a booster rocket returning to Earth. Let's bring you that speech now in full. Thank you. Thank you. Well... Well, this is, this is it, folks. 
Thank you, everybody, for coming out so early this morning. In only a couple of hours, I will be in Balmoral to see Her Majesty the Queen. And the torch will finally be passed to a new Conservative leader. The baton will be handed over in what has unexpectedly turned out to be a relay race. They changed the rules halfway through, but never mind that now. And through that lacquered black door, a new Prime Minister will shortly go to meet a fantastic group of public servants. The people who got Brexit done. The people who delivered the fastest vaccine rollout in Europe and never forget, 70% of the entire population got a dose within six months, faster than any comparable country. That is government for you. That's this Conservative government. People who organised those prompt early supplies of weapons to the heroic Ukrainian armed forces, an action that may very well have helped changed the course of the biggest European war for 80 years. And because of the speed and urgency of what you did, everybody involved in this government, to get this economy moving again from July last year, in spite of all the opposition, all the naysayers, we have and will continue to have that economic strength to give people the cash they need to get through this energy crisis that has been caused by Putin's vicious war. And I know that Liz, Truss, and this compassionate Conservative government will do everything we can to get people through this crisis, and this country will endure it, and we will win. And if Putin thinks that he can succeed by blackmailing or bullying the British people, then he is utterly deluded. And the reason we will have those funds now and in the future is because we Conservatives understand the vital symmetry between government action and free market capitalist private sector enterprise. We're delivering on those huge manifesto commitments, making streets safer. Neighbourhood crime down 38% in the last three years. 13,790 more police on the streets building more hospitals, and yes, we will have 50,000 more nurses by the end of the decade, and 40 more hospitals by the end of, 50,000 nurses by the end of this parliament, I should say, 40 new hospitals by the end of the decade. Putting record funding into our schools and into teachers' pay, giving everybody over 18 a lifetime skills guarantee so they can keep upskilling throughout their lives. Three new high-speed rail lines, three including Northern Powerhouse Rail, colossal road pro programs from the Pennines uh, to Cornwall, the rollout of gigabit broadband up over the last three years, I am proud to say, since you were kind enough to elect me from 7% of our country's premises having gigabit broadband to 70% today. And we are, of course, providing the short and the long-term solutions for our energy needs, and not just using more of our own domestic hydrocarbons, but going up by 2030 to 50 gigawatts of wind power. That is half our, this country's energy electricity needs from offshore wind alone. A new nuclear reactor every year. And looking at what is happening in this country, the changes that are taking place, that is why private sector investment is flooding in. More private sector, more venture capital investment than China itself. More billion pound tech companies sprouting here in the UK than in France, Germany, and Israel combined. And as a result, unemployment, as I leave office, unemployment down to lows not seen since I was about 10 years old and bouncing around on a space hopper, my friends. And on, on, the subject of, on the subject of bouncing around in future careers, let me say that I am now like one of those booster rockets that has fulfilled its function and I will now be gently re-entering the atmosphere and splashing down invisibly in some remote and obscure corner of the Pacific. <laughs> and like Cincinnatus, I am returning to my plough. And I will be offering this government nothing but the most fervent support. This is, I'll tell you why, this is a tough time for the economy. This is a tough time for families up and down the country. We can and we will get through it and we will come out stronger the other side. But I say to my fellow Conservatives, it's time for politics 
to be over. Folks, it's time for us all to get behind Liz Truss and her team and her programme and deliver for the people of this country. Because that is what the people of this country want, that's what they need, and that's what they deserve. I'm proud to have discharged the promises I made to my party when uh, you were kind enough to choose me. Winning the biggest majority since 1987, the biggest share of the vote since 1979. Delivering Brexit, delivering our manifesto commitments, including, by the way, including social care, reforming social care, helping people up and down the country, ensuring that Britain is once again standing tall in the world, speaking with clarity and authority from Ukraine to the AUKUS pact with America and Australia. Because we are one whole and entire united kingdom whose diplomats, security services and armed forces are so globally admired. And by the way, as I, believe, I, as I leave, I believe our union is so strong that those who want to break it up, they'll keep trying, but they will never, ever succeed. Thank you to everybody behind me in this building. Thank you to all of you in government. Uh, thank you to everybody who's helped look after me and my family over the last three years, including, including Dylan, the dog. And I just say to my party, if Dylan and Larry can put behind them their occasional difficulties, then so can the Conservative Party. Above all, thanks to you, the British people, to the voters for giving me the chance to serve. All of you who worked so tirelessly together to beat COVID, to put us where we are today. Together, we have laid foundations that will stand the test of time, whether by taking back control of our laws or putting in vital new infrastructure. Great, solid masonry on which we will continue to build together. Paving, paving the path of prosperity now and for future generations. And I will be supporting Liz Truss and the new government every step of the way. Thank you all very much. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Boris Johnson's last speech as Prime Minister there. Much more uh, from Downing Street on Downing Street coming up. And now to other developments in the family of Olivia Pratt Corbell, the nine-year-old girl who was shot dead inside her own home in Liverpool last month, have appealed for people to come forward with information about who killed her. Sky's Ashna Hoynag joins us now live from Liverpool. And Ashna, tell us more about what the family had been saying. Well, it's just over two weeks ago now that Olivia Pratt Corbell was shot at her home in the Duffcott area of the city. For the first time today, we have heard from her father, John Francis Pratt, who has issued a tribute to his daughter on behalf of him and his family. He says in a statement provided to the public, words can't express the pain we are going through after Olivia was so cruelly snatched away from us. Those responsible need to know what they have done. Olivia was a real bright spark who knew her own mind and had no problem making friends and loved to laugh and make people laugh. He goes on, Olivia's death cannot be in vain. and We want people to feel safe and be safe. That can only happen if we all come together and make sure there is no place for guns or those who use guns on our streets or in our communities. Well, as well as that tribute from Olivia's father, he's also provided a video that shows um, him and his daughter at Liverpool uh, City Centre's Christmas market a few years ago, in which Olivia can be seen hugging her dad and smiling along the way. It was 10.30 on the 22nd of August in the evening when a masked gunman forced his way into Olivia's home. He shot Olivia's mother's wrist. That bullet then went straight into Olivia's chest, killing the nine-year-old girl. Ever since her death, there has been a huge outpouring of grief from the community here in Liverpool. But alongside that, Merseyside Police launched an extensive murder investigation, which is very much ongoing, the latest of which was four arrests that Merseyside Police con uh, conducted on Sunday. The perhaps the most important one being the arrest of a 34-year-old man arrested on suspicion of murder and of attempted murder. But in addition to that, three separate arrests three men are facing allegations of assisting an offender. They are still being questioned by police. 
and remain in police custody. But all the while, police here are appealing for yet more information from the public. They say that their appeal for information has been immense. People have been incredibly forthcoming with information to assist in their investigation, but they still need more. That is a plea that has been echoed by Olivia's dad, John Francis Pratt, today, who has paid tribute for his dearly loved daughter. Thanks, Ashna Hoinag there in Liverpool. Now, armed police have shot dead a man in his 20s after a car chase ended in South London. Police say that they were pursuing a suspect vehicle last night and the police deliberately collided with the car to force it to stop, bringing the pursuit to an end in the Streatham Hill area. And people living there reported hearing gunshots and a police helicopter overhead. It was a massive bang. I thought a neighbour's roof had fallen off or something. It was a real, that, I think it was like boom, 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 like something that maybe it bounced or something. And I looked out the back window to see something had fallen and straight away, I didn't really notice it before, but straight away I could hear the helicopter very close in the air. And that's not terribly unusual for around here, but it suddenly was like, you know, just felt more intense. But it's usually fairly, fairly calm around here, so it's a bit, bit of a shock, yeah. And our crime correspondent, Martin Brunt, is there on the scene. So, Martin, what more do we know about the incident? The investigators are still here. They've been here overnight, and they're from the independent Office for Police Conduct. So that's the police watchdog that took over the investigation as soon as it was known that a man had been shot by police. We're waiting for an update from the IOPC, but there isn't any yet, but the sort of things that they will be trying to establish as soon as possible is the identity, um, firstly, of the man who died. Um, we are pretty sure we know who that man is, and I'll say a bit more about that in, uh, in a second. Um, they'll want to know whether there was any non-police weapon um, that, was, uh, that was found at the scene. Um, how many police fired their weapons, how many bullets were fired. Um, the reason for the car being pursued by the police, um, those are all the key questions that uh, the investigators will be hoping to answer as soon as possible. Now, the facts, according to the Metropolitan Police, um, are that uh, police were pursuing a suspect vehicle. We're not sure what the suspicion was about it. They travelled from Lambeth, so rather further north, uh, but travelling south uh, here, they probably hadn't gone very far. Um, the car was cornered, if you like, in this street here. It was rammed by the police to make it stop. Um, and then there were shouts from police, according to witnesses, asking the driver of the car to get out. Um, the driver apparently failed to do that. The driver's car moved towards the police vehicles, according to a witness reported in the Evening Standard, and at that point, it appears, a shot was fired. There are, there's a clear uh, shot of a, a, a sort of clear view of a gunshot, um, a bullet hole in the windscreen uh, of the suspect's car. Police haven't said whether anybody else was in the car. We don't think there was, and that bullet hole appears to be on the windscreen uh, by the driver's side of the front of the car. Now, uh, we spoke earlier um, about um, the identity of, um, of the man who died. Uh, it hasn't been officially confirmed, but we did speak to, and we can listen to her now, Pastor Lorraine Jones Burrell from the Dwayne Simpson Foundation, which steers youngsters away from gang culture. She has been talking to the friends of the man who died, many of them who are gathered here, and this is what Pastor Lorraine told us. He was on his way to one of the friends. The friends is here. He's still waiting for him to come, only to hear that their friend Chris has been killed in cold blood by a bullet. And that bullet has been fired from a police officer. There has to be answers because this has caused a massive ripple effect of distrust fear and trauma amongst the violence that we're dealing with? Have we got to deal with the police as well now? These are the questions. There are 
at least one relative of um, of the man who died here, or at least the mother of the man's girlfriend, and uh, we may be able to talk to her uh, in a short while. Um, Lorraine, Pastor Lorraine also told us that the man who died, Chris, was about to be a father, so his girlfriend uh, is carrying his child. Um, and it's quite clear uh, from talking to Pastor Lorraine, who represents uh, the wider community here, that there is a huge amount of shock, sadness, anger, and the family are looking for answers about to what happened here last night. Okay, Martin Brunt in South London, thank you very much. And you are watching Sky News. Coming up, we're going to be discussing the ways in which Liz Truss's government could be very different to that of Boris Johnson. Stuart Ramsey and I'm Sky's chief correspondent. Well, there's a real sense now that people are beginning to expect that this whole airlift is coming to an end and they're really, really desperate. We saw snatch squads going in, grabbing people and putting them into trucks. You either live and recover or you die. OK, so that's like a war. That's the war, yes. Yeah. We help you understand the world with us. Over the past 24 hours, the soldiers have been attacked on a number of occasions. It's really sending a clear message that Venezuela is eager for change. We've been crushed. To take you to the heart of stories that shape our world. They were convinced the United States would become hooked. Well, we're right. Well, Norman's explosion has just come down. I think it was a monster that's just landed in between us. The information on this could bring down the entire network, not just in Iraq and Syria, but across the world. It's not out of control, but it's big withdrawn. It's so, so hot. The inspiration behind our product came from understanding how big of a problem livestock meat and emissions were. Well, now, Liz Truss will arrive here later in about two hours, two and a bit hours' time in Downing Street as the new Prime Minister. And she will be under immediate intense pressure to form a government equipped to deal with the cost of living crisis. Also a, a struggling NHS, as we all know, plus the continuing conflict in Ukraine. And that's not all. Well, joining us now from Westminster is Dr Catherine Haddon, a senior fellow at the Institute for government. Uh, good to talk to you again, Dr. Haddon. And uh, I say that's not all in terms of uh, what's in our in tray. There's strikes, inflation, problems in education, social care. The list goes on. I mean, any one of those issues, let alone that combination, would be enough to, to engulf, to overwhelm any government, any prime minister. They've got to really get to it, get to work as quickly as possible. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just hitting them crisis after crisis. I mean, the one benefit that she's got is that this is something that we have seen in advance. You know, people know that this is coming, certainly in terms of energy prices, rising inflation, 
um, and, and many of the other aspects that you talked about. So there has been able to be some thinking about it. She's not in the same position as Boris Johnson when he thought he was coming in and Brexit was going to be the defining issue. Instead, it was COVID uh, that dominated much of his premiership. Um, but she has to hit the ground running. You know, there's very little time to uh, sit back and think, well, what are we going to do? Already people are looking immediately for that energy support package. We're you know, being told that will be announced this week. That doesn't give you a lot of time to, to think about dealing with it. And it is, it's a very difficult political situation because this isn't just some abstract economic debate. This is people's lives. You know, the public, the voting public are feeling this right now and looking ahead to winter. Um, so that is something they will be very closely well, watching you, the government on. And it is the scale of the spending that potentially is ahead. That support package, well, it's been put into three figures in terms of billions, 100 billion plus yet. Liz Truss also sticking at this point with her pledge to cut taxes to spark growth. Yeah, and it's difficult to think how she's going to square that circle. Um, you know, when you talking about the energy support package, people are throwing around the figure of 100 billion. You add in the tax cuts as well. That's even more money out of the public purse. You can compensate for that with growth, but we haven't really seen a plan for how to do that. And one of my colleagues writing this week said the problem with any of these growth strategies is that they chop and change all the time. And so businesses just don't have that kind of certainty. So it's it's a big promise uh, to say to the public that you're both going to fix the economy and throw lots of money the way of the public. And it's going to be, you know, a huge impact on the public finances to do so. So government borrowing is going to be up. Uh, these are, you know, astronomical numbers that we're talking about. But then so is the rise in energy prices that we're talking about. And it is something that's not going to be just this autumn, this winter. People are already talking about high energy prices through next year in to next winter, let alone, as you say, other major problems we already knew we had, like fixing the NHS, dealing with social care, huge, huge issues. Dr. Haddon, Catherine Haddon, uh, thank you very much indeed. Catherine Haddon there from the Institute for Government. And uh, as Dr. Haddon was saying, there are uh, a huge number of issues of problems on the entry for the new Prime Minister about to enter that door here at number 10 Downing Street. Just let me talk you through the timings as we know them. There is expected to be some pretty severe weather over this area later this afternoon. But uh, as it stands now, in this weather, Liz Truss will speak outside that door just after four o'clock. We expect maybe inside if the rain intervenes. Stay with us.
This is Sky News live from Downing Street, where later this afternoon we'll see the new Prime Minister, Liz Truss. Ms Truss accepted the Queen's invitation to form a government at Balmoral this lunchtime. She's now on her way back to Westminster to appoint her cabinet and get straight to work. The top item on her agenda, the cost of living crisis. A £100 billion plan to freeze energy bills is set to be announced later this week. Meanwhile, a fond farewell for Boris Johnson from Downing Street staff as he promises to give his full support to his successor. I am now like one of those booster rockets that has fulfilled its function and I will now be gently re-entering the atmosphere and splashing down invisibly in some remote and obscure corner of the Pacific. Well, we are expecting Liz Trust to arrive here in Downing Street just after 4 p.m. and make her first speech as Prime Minister. We will, of course, have live coverage throughout the afternoon. A very good afternoon from Downing Street, where we are awaiting the arrival of the new Prime Minister, Liz Truss. Ms Truss visited Balmoral this lunchtime where she accepted Her Majesty the Queen's invitation to form a government. Uh, she followed her predecessor, Boris Johnson, to the estate in Aberdeenshire and Mr Johnson formally submitted his resignation to the Queen just before midday. So Liz Truss is now on her way back to Westminster to get straight to work and uh, she's already begun appointing her cabinet, of course, as she tries to get to grips with some of the challenges facing the UK. Uh, of course, chief among them, the cost of living crisis. Later this week, it's expected that Ms Truss will lay out a plan to freeze energy bills at around £2,500 a year for the average household, is what we're hearing. Our deputy political editor, Sam Coates, is with me. We'll talk more about uh, some of those details as we understand them in a moment or two. But first on the fact that the, the drift, the, the stasis, the two months of nothing happening at this crucial time for the UK and its economy, it's over. Liz Truss has so much ground to make up. That's right. Two months where the government effectively switched off because there was a leadership contest underway. Coming off the back of, let's be honest, about eight months where there was so much turmoil to the end, towards the end of Boris Johnson's time in power that less than should have been got done was actually achieved. So, yes, Liz Truss needs to press the reset button and will show that she wants to get on with the business of governing. And that's going to happen pretty quickly this afternoon. She will deliver her first remarks as the 56th Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, uh, just uh, a little way behind us, just after four o'clock, and then we'll get on, we'll hear the Cabinet announcements fairly soon after that. But because Liz Truss was effectively a shoe in in this race, you could tell she was going to win from the polling, from talking to MPs, um, pretty much since the back end of August, she's been planning for this moment. I'm told by her allies that she has a pretty much worked up plan to go when it comes to the cabinet. I think we know quite a lot of the appointments uh, that are going to, the people that are going to occupy the great uh, offices of state. So Kwasi Kwarteng, a long-time ideological ally and neighbour uh, in South East London, will be her chancellor. Uh, James Cleverley, who worked with her in the Foreign Office, will be her foreign secretary. Uh, ben Wallace uh, will go to the defence, uh, will stay in the uh, Defence Department. Suella Braverman, uh, another uh, leadership contender uh, who I think impressed her, uh, impressed Liz Truss will now become the Home Secretary. But within each of the intrays of each of those Secretaries of State, and hence Liz Truss, there is an enormous amount to do. Setting, uh, uh, starting with the problem of energy price increases due uh, to raise ex exponentially millions of people if nothing is done uh, fet to fe set to face poverty within a matter of weeks. Now we understand uh, that Liz Truss has been drawing up plans on that. Now what's interesting about the plans that Liz Truss will outline maybe as soon as Thursday is they're very different from the kinds of things she was saying just six weeks ago where she foreswore um, large-scale expensive short-term sticking plaster interventions 
Paul but, and Brown economics. But Dermot, that looks uh, like the kind of thing that she may be forced to reach through, reach for given the scale of the crisis. Uh, we're looking at some kind of way of trying to keep bills at around the £2,500 mark for households, for the average household, perhaps cushioned with the £400 uh, that Rishi Sunak was going to give uh, with this all paid for through borrowing rather than clawing it back through energy prices. That's the, uh, energy bills in the future. That seems to be the shape of that package. But Liz Truss's ambition doesn't stop there. The reason that the change of Prime Minister really matters is because she wants to change the whole direction of government. She believes that Boris Johnson made a mistake, that he didn't prioritise growth. She's going to correct that mistake with a series of measures, tax cuts, and then reforms in an infrastructure bill that could, uh, uh, we could find out details of as soon as Monday uh, in order to correct that mistake. So this isn't continuity, however much you recognise the faces around the Cabinet table later this afternoon. And you should recognise several of them, Jacob Rees-Mogg uh, and others. Uh, this is a different direction for Britain than the one, crucially, the people voted for in the 2019 general election. So we've got tax cuts, billions to be spent on that, coupled with the, the 100 billion plus to support people through the energy crisis. There are factors beyond her control, beyond the UK's control, and the international money markets, their attitude to this level of spending and potentially this level of borrowing. That's right. I think, let's be honest, Liz Truss has three audiences she needs to please, and you touched on the first one, and we haven't really had a conversation about the money markets being uh, judge and jury of a British Prime Minister since the 1970s, but I think with um, interventions in the hundreds of billions, perhaps year after year now, that conversation is coming back. The next audience uh, that she's going to have to satisfy uh, are the ones over there in Parliament, Conservative MPs, a very fractious um, uh, uh, Conservative Party leadership contest, nasty at points, lots of bruised people. Could some of them rebel? Could some of them stymie her plans, particularly on growth? And then the third audience that Liz Truss is going to have to appeal to is, of course, the voters, we saw snap polling last night, suggesting, but broadly by a margin of two to one, uh, voters at large are sceptical about Liz Truss. She might be the longest serving cabinet minister in Boris Johnson's government uh, and pre previous governments, but she is a bit more of an unknown quantity for many of the public and they don't yet like what they see. Of course, the big energy announcement and the big reforms she's planning are an, are an opportunity for her to introduce herself to the country. She could use that window to turn herself into a success. OK, Sam, for the time being, thank you very much indeed. Our deputy political editor, Sam Coates there. Let's talk more now about uh, the process that has unfolded in terms of this handover of power. It all took place at Balmoral, as you know, the uh, Queen's estate where she spends her summers unable to travel to Buckingham Palace to accept Boris Johnson's resignation and anoint Liz Truss because of her mobility issues. They travelled to see her on separate aircraft. Uh, let's go to Aberdeen Airport now and uh, talk to our correspondent, James Matthews, who can talk us through the, the comings and goings and uh, some of the difficulties thrown up by the conditions there. Yeah, conditions, very harsh conditions, I have to say, Dermot, which dictated some of this morning's tradition. Uh, Liz Truss, in particular, she had trouble getting her plane into Aberdeen Airport. If you looked at the flight tracker, because the mist had descended, uh, that Falcon aircraft was circling Aberdeen for something like 15, 20 minutes before the mist lifted and she was able to land. So that involved something of a delay in getting to Balmoral. Boris Johnson didn't have any such trouble. He was on the road rather quicker in a convoy towards Balmoral from this airport. Uh, and thereafter, of course, Liz Truss uh, went to the castle for an audience with Her Majesty. You can see just on the taxiway behind me, uh, the Falcon aircraft waiting to take Liz Truss back on her journey south. Weather conditions OK at the moment. I mean, throughout the mist and everything else, planes were taking off, so we're not anticipating any great delay in terms of the journey back over the border. She is due to arrive here at Aberdeen Airport fairly shortly. But, you know, there was a lot of planning, clearly, that went into this event. It was uh, fairly unique in its own way. There was discussion about a helicopter trip from here to Balmoral, but that was discounted. And they will be 
counting, thanking the lucky stars that they did discount the helicopter because early this morning, because of that mist, uh, helicopter pilots at Aberdeen who know a thing or two about putting aircraft in the air in tricky conditions, they were rushing to get here before the mist descended. They realised the problems that that was going to involve. So, you know, in terms of the tradition of all this, the function, actually, of how this unfolded was key to events. It has ultimately worked out, albeit with some hitches, with some delay, and Liz Truss, as the new Prime Minister, is now uh, heading to this airport and will duly head back to towards Downing Street. She's no stranger, of course, to Scotland, having lived here. She lived as a youngster in Paisley when her dad took a job at the Paisley College of Technology. So on that road trip along the A93, she had the opportunity to look at the land that she will govern and to reflect perhaps uh, on her childhood uh, as a youngster. At one point, she played Margaret Thatcher in a school play, her mentor. Uh, the, of course, the other woman in her political life is Nicola Sturgeon. And much discussion. Uh, there's much discussion about the chemistry and the politics between these constitutional debate. You'll remember that Theresa May, in her first full day in office, she went to visit Nicola Sturgeon. Boris Johnson went to see her in his first week as Prime Minister. No such meeting on the horizon between Liz Truss and Nicola Sturgeon. And one does wonder uh, how they will progress, particularly on the issue of Scotland's constitution. So we'll see in time how that plays out. But much concern, and indeed Nicola Sturgeon said Nicholas Truss would be a disaster as a Prime Minister. Liz Truss dismissed Nicola Sturgeon as an attention seeker who would be ignored. So one wonders how the two of them will come together in terms of progress on the key issue north of the border uh, of Scotland's constitutional future. India Ref 2 possibly on the horizon, of course, depending on what the Supreme Court decides in October. OK, James Matthews at Aberdeen Airport. Thank you very much indeed. Well, let's concentrate now then on what happened to the occupants of those incoming aircraft after they landed and uh, their occupants headed off to Balmoral. Boris Johnson and his wife Carrie first travelled then to Balmoral for that audience with Her Majesty the Queen to offer his resignation. Let's talk to our royal correspondent, Rhiannon Mills, who witnessed it all for us uh, up there in, in a fairly soggy, as we can see for ourselves, a fairly soggy Balmoral. And uh, talk us through how it was sequenced. As I say, Boris and Carrie Johnson arrived first. I think it was always going to be fascinating to see how this played out. For 70 years, the handover has always happened at Buckingham Palace. But today, despite the fact that both the outgoing and ingoing Prime Minister had to do that 1,000-mile round trip to Balmoral, and despite the best efforts of the weather, everything once again ran seamlessly. And we now have completed, in essence, the Queen's role in that handover of power. As he said, Boris Johnson and Carrie Johnson arrived first. For the moment when Boris Johnson formally submitted his resignation to the Queen and at that moment he then uh, asked her to call uh, Liz Truss to form a new administration. Now, as is customary, we don't get a, a photo of the outgoing Prime Minister, but we do get a photo of the incoming Prime Minister meeting the Queen and going through that process of kissing of hands as it's described in the court circular. No kissing involved, more of a handshake, uh, a bow or a curtsy. I think what will be striking to many is that the Queen maybe isn't dressed as formally as we normally see her. Speaking to those though who are very familiar with how she would normally be dressed when she's here at Balmoral say that it's very standard to see her there in her twin set, her cardigan, her knitted top and also that tartan skirt. So that's fairly standard but also I think it's a really important moment where after so much discussion about the Queen's House we, we were also able to see her carrying out her official duties. Of course for Liz Truss this is just the start of what are going to be many important meetings with the Queen. The Prime Minister every week holds a audience with her. Yes the Queen hands over political power to 
her government to her Prime Minister, but it is still her role. She is still to be encouraged, to, war to be encouraged, warned and to advise when it comes to those meetings with the Prime Minister. Many of those who have gone before Liz Truss have talked about the importance of that relationship, how in many ways it is completely unique compared to other relationships they form within that premiership because they can say whatever they want in the room and they know that it won't go anywhere else. The Queen herself has often talked about how she finds it quite reassuring that Prime Ministers feel they can unburden themselves and sometimes she is able uh, to offer advice. It has to be said, the audience with Liz Truss went on for a little longer than we anticipated. You wonder whether the Queen was looking out the window and thinking, well, I can't possibly uh, quite send them out in that weather just yet. But also, of course, many things that the Queen may have well wanted to talk to, the, to Liz Truss about. Political uncertainty, uh, the cost of living crisis and also her choice of Cabinet. Because the Queen ultimately has to rubber stamp all of those new members of the Cabinet Cabinet. And tomorrow we are expecting a Privy Council meeting to be held by the Queen where she will hand over seals of office, where Liz Truss will take that oath of First Lord of the Treasury, albeit this time it's not going to happen in person. The Queen, we expect, will carry out remotely uh, over computer in some way. Well, we've sent you out in those conditions, uh, Rhiannon, and we thank you for it, uh, Rhiannon Mills, our royal correspondent there at Balmoral. Well, as Rhiannon was telling us, as we all know, top of the Prime Minister's agenda is the cost of living crisis. And Liz Truss is expected to set out a plan to tackle energy bills later this week. Now, we understand at Sky News that the plan is going to freeze the energy price cap at something around £2,500 a year. It's going to stand at about £1,900 at the moment. Just before we discuss that more, let's uh, show you those live shots from Aberdeen Airport. Um, well, not very dramatic at the moment, but we're told that uh, somewhere there, the uh, plane that is going to carry Liz Truss, Prime Minister Liz Truss, back to London is about to depart. Clearly uh, not in our camera shot, though. Um, but, um, yeah, that's all. That's what we're hearing. And in terms of the timings, then, that she'll be here round about here in Downing Street, round about four o'clock. And if the heavens don't open uh, in a way that you've been seeing in Balmoral, Liz Truss will go to the lectern, which just a few hours earlier, Boris Johnson made his resignation speech from his final address as Prime Minister. Liz Truss will have that lectern outside number 10 Downing Street as Prime Minister, Britain's 56th Prime Minister and the 15th under Queen Elizabeth II, and she will make some remarks. Of course, if the heavens do open, we understand it'll be a little bit later and we'll be inside Downing Street. Oh, I see. So uh, that is the, the convoy, the small convoy carrying the cars uh, in which one presumes the, the middle car, the Range Rover, is the one carrying Liz Truss and her husband to the aircraft, as I say, uh, coming back here to London to address the nation, to address her party, and indeed, as Sam Coates, our deputy political editor, was pointing out, to address the international money markets. Very, very worried now, very concerned about the parlous financial and economic situation facing the United Kingdom. And I'll get back then to what we understand about the support that she's going to offer, perhaps as early as this week, the support that Liz Truss and her newly formed government are going to offer to consumers when it comes to the energy price cap. Uh, at the moment, it's set at the, at the still uh, rather large, about £1,900, £1,970 for the average household. Uh, that is expected to r rise in October to above £3,000, £3,300 or something like that. We are told that the plans being formulated at the moment are for it to be put somewhere around about two and a half thousand pounds. Uh, as you can see there, Liz Truss and her entourage, uh, some of the bags, no doubt, plenty of work being done on that flight back to London. Many of the cabinet positions, as we understand them, already decided, uh, particularly for those top jobs, Kwasi Kwarteng, uh, a friend, uh, a long-time friend, political ally, and indeed close neighbour in Greenwich in South London to be appointed as Chancellor of the Exchequer and we'll be covering all that for you throughout the late afternoon and evening. Uh, and James Cleverly, uh, again, another supporter in as 
Foreign Secretary Suella Braverman uh, expected to take over from Pretty Patel at the Home Office and uh, a raft of other appointments. Um, we've got uh, our views and our whispers about who may take those places and we'll be talking about those throughout the rest of the afternoon as we await the takeoff of that aircraft carrying Prime Minister Liz Truss back to London and back to number 10 Downing Street. Live coverage throughout the afternoon right here on Sky News. I think we're going to leave those shots now and talk about the financial and economic situation with our business correspondent, Ian King. Uh, Ian, um, we'll stay on, the, stay on the shot there as we see an aircraft leave an airport. Um, tell us, Ian, about this package. As I've laid out there, we're thinking the price cap for consumers around about two and a half thousand pounds. Obviously, as our business presenter, you're hearing from many, many businesses. What about us? What are we going to get? Because uh, we are passing on these huge increase in costs. We're passing it on in the form of inflation to consumers. Absolutely, Dermot. And that is a uh, key concern, really, with this package. Now, there's been a lot of briefing overnight as to uh, what form it may take, whether this was going to be uh, simply loans made to the energy sector that would be guaranteed by the government and then would have to be repaid over the next 15 years, a form of uh, higher taxation, if you like. It appears that the government has ruled that out and is going to go for a straightforward increase in public borrowing by which it's going to keep the energy price cap at around the current level, which is, as you say, it's £1,971. Now, the overall figure uh, that's been quoted at is £2,500, but when you take into account the fact that the government is already committing to a flat rebate per household of £400 this autumn, there's also talk of doing away with green levies. That would keep the energy uh, price cap roughly at the same sort of level that it is right now. And as I say, the suspicion is, and uh, our colleague Sam Coates has been reporting this this lunchtime, is going to be uh, funded out of general borrowing. Now, that is a big increase in public borrowing, probably around £100 billion or so. And as you say, there are concerns in the financial markets about an increase in government borrowing. And you've actually seen that reflected over the last six weeks or so with government bonds, UK government gilts, government IOUs, and the implied uh, borrowing costs on those gilts has risen quite significantly. At the beginning of August, uh, the 10-year gilt was uh, yielding 1.7%. It's currently uh, just under uh, 1, uh, 3%. So a big increase in implied government borrowing costs. But it's not necessarily clear that the government would be punished by the market markets for this. If investors can be convinced that this is going to stave off a recession, potentially help the UK to resume growing uh, reasonably quickly than it would have been otherwise, then uh, that may go down reasonably well with markets. And it's worth pointing out, actually, Dermot, that today uh, there's been a gilt auction and uh, there was plenty of demand. The uh, cover was uh, two and a half times. There were two and a half times as many bids for gilts that were actually being auctioned. And that is something that the government will take comfort from. But it is worth pointing out that there are critics of a blanket uh, freeze in energy prices, not least from the Independent in Institute for Fiscal Studies, which has pointed out that basically if you do this blanket form of relief, you're going to be helping a lot of households, well-off households, who don't really need this sort of support from the taxpayer. That's one concern. The other is that you take away the uh, incentive for households and businesses, because we think that there's going to be support for businesses too, something that Boris Johnson's government didn't do. And uh, that is potentially going to take away the incentive for households and businesses to save, save energy. And that is something that other governments, particularly in Germany, for example, have been looking at in their response to higher energy prices. And there's one more concern that is well worth reporting as well, which is how the Bank of England would react to this. Because, make no mistake, this would represent fiscal stimulus. And that is something that, at a time when uh, the Bank of England thinks there's excess demand in the economy anyway, well, it would probably have to raise interest rates in response to that. So that is uh, something else that will be worth uh, considering. Also, worth pointing out, actually, Dermot, you mentioned there Kwasi Karteng, likely to be the incoming Chancellor. Well, he had an uh, editorial piece in the Financial Times yesterday, in which he was clearly trying to signal to financial markets that uh, Liz Truss would be responsible with the, uh, with the public finances, that there wouldn't be some hell for leather uh, increase in public borrowing, although uh, clearly there is, uh, it's implicit in this government response that we're hearing. I should also say, by the way, given that we've been talking a lot about uh, energy prices, the uh, price of wholesale gas has actually fallen back today on uh, commodity markets. Obviously, yesterday we had a big, big increase in the price of wholesale gas, which reflected uh, the uh, decision of Russia to cut supplies through Nord Stream 1 pipeline into Europe. Well, actually, the wholesale gas price has come off pretty sharply today, and it's back at levels that it was on Friday afternoon.
Ian, I'd be really interested in a quick take on you on the other parts uh, of Liz Truss's spending agenda, and this is the issue of cutting taxes to get growth. Now, there isn't a government in the world that says that it doesn't want to have higher growth. What is Liz Truss's magic formula going to be that no one else has found? Well, the two key things, that the two key campaign pledges that she made, Dermot, one is not to go ahead with the big increase in corporation tax in the next financial year that Rishi Sunak was. That was going to take the rate of corporation tax from 19% to 26%. Now, she actually hasn't... Uh, that increase hasn't come through yet. Liz Truss saying that she wouldn't go ahead with that. The other, of course, is to reverse Mr Sunak's increase in national insurance contributions that went through earlier this year. Uh, that was one and a half, uh, quarter percent for both M employers and is often for, uh, employees and is often forgotten for employers as well. She's promised to reverse that pretty quickly. That would amount to a big piece of fiscal stimulus. Rishi Sunak was looking to raise a lot of money from that measure, although it's worth pointing out that when he subsequently came in with other measures to support households with the cost of living, he actually uh, effectively unwound uh, that increase for anyone uh, earning less than £50,000 a year or so anyway. So it looks effectively like a potentially a quite a big handout, a big piece of fiscal stimulus. And as I say, that is the sort of thing that uh, may concern the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee. Fascinating. Ian, many thanks. Ian King, our business presenter. I want to talk now to the Conservative MP and Liz Trust supporter, Alec Shelbrook. Very good to talk to you, Mr Shelbrook. We're uh, not looking at you at the moment because we're staying on those pictures of your new leader aboard her aircraft about to depart for London and Downing Street. And tell me this, so you've talked before about just how terrified voters are, how terrified consumers are about the challenges, the economic challenges facing them. How terrified are you about this new government and this new Prime Minister's ability to deal with them? Oh, well, good afternoon. And I think that um, what you've seen um, being said over the recent hours and yesterday evening is exactly why I've always been such a firm supporter of Liz Trust because she never ruled out um, anything during the leadership campaign. There were comments made, but nothing was ruled out because ultimately the Prime Minister is somebody who looks at the policy, looks at the pragmatic solutions that need to be taken and turns around and says, this is the best route forward. And I think it's also important to note that the Prime Minister hasn't just been talking about um, how we help people with their bills. She's also been talking about supply side reform, energy security and that storage facilities. Yeah, well, a lot of that is long term. We're talking about immediately the here and now, the right now. People this very day and tomorrow and for weeks and months to come who can't afford to put enough food on their yeah. table, who when winter really hits hard, can't afford to heat their homes. Yeah, I mean, certainly um, when we await the full details, but certainly what you're seeing is immediate action, as she said, within the first week of um, becoming Prime Minister. Because, as you quite rightly um, outlined, I, I said this um, back in May, April. In fact, it was stuff I was picking up on the doorstep uh, in the first part of this year, that people had genuine fear about how they were going to pay their bills. And since then, um, the, obviously the price cap has gone up to where it is today. Um, obviously, the previous government have... Um, put in a lot of fiscal support, which as I understand it's going to remain. And so what we're now saying is, is what the Prime Minister appears to be saying is, is that it's not going to get any worse um, and that there's going to be the step into that. And I think the important point of this is, is that when I was listening just a moment ago to um, Ian King I th and, and the markets, I think the important point is, is that will allow people to plan their finances far more um, strategically. Um, if you take um, my situation, I can pay my bills, but I'm doing that by taking money out of the retail economy. And I think that the more we have to take out of the retail economy to pay our bills, the more chance of recession, the more chance of job losses, the more chances of a lack of income tax and taxation coming in. And so one way or another, the government's going to be faced with extra borrowing. That's a very, very good point. I want to concentrate now, though, on the internal workings and the healing that has to take place within your own party as we look at that aircraft about to carry Liz Truss, the new Prime Minister, back to Downing Street. We know that she's already put in place uh, a lot of her cabinet, a lot of those positions already filled. She's got a lot more work to do, though. She goes down through the ranks, those ministerial and uh, junior ministerial roles. Does she have to show in what she does there, who she appoints and where she appoints them, that she is addressing the whole party? Because we know amongst UMPs that uh, many of your colleagues did not support Liz Truss. 
But I think fundamentally the Prime Minister's support from day one came across all wings of the party. Um, I was the first public backer of, of hers and, and the second public backer was Deanna Davidson, a good friend, a good colleague of mine. But we are on different wings of the party. And if you look at um, the Prime Minister's key supporters, they came from all wings of the party. So this isn't so much a conversation about Sunak supporters over Trust supporters. It's a conversation about will she bring in all all aspects of the Conservative Party, which is a wide coalition of the right, to try and ensure that the best um, job's done for the country. But be under no illusion, what will drive the Prime Minister more than anything else is can the Minister's I appoint deliver on the agenda we have to deliver? That is the point, that is the question, and uh, we await to see the answer. Alex Shalbrook, always good talking to you. Thank, Thank you, you very much indeed as uh, we continue to concentrate on the aircraft, on the tarmac there, waiting clearance to take off in the Merck. Not as murky as those when it landed, as uh, James Matthews, our correspondent there, was telling us uh, aboard that plane. Prime Minister Liz Truss, her husband and her entourage, uh, as I say, awaiting clearance to make their way back to London and to Downing Street, where she's going to make her first speech as Prime Minister. Our deputy political editor, Sam Coates, is here with me. And uh, Sam, talking about, I talked to Alex Shelbrook there about the process. We already know a lot of that has been completed, it hasn't been confirmed, but certainly in terms of her, her key lieutenants, her, her top team, many of those appointments in place. Yes, she'll be wanting to get her government uh, off the ground a little bit faster than the jet that we're looking at that's still on the tarmac. Um, I think that uh, her plan is to try and get most of the cabinet done today because she had that two weeks at the end of August where essentially she knew she was going to win. Allies of Liz Trust tell me that she's got a pretty much worked up plan for government and as a result she's going to be able to do more than some of the incoming prime ministers that we've seen in the last five or six years. There have of course been a few of them. Uh, she's going to be able to get those appointments out of the door um, uh, and so while the top names, I think, have been in place really actually uh, for more than a week. Kwasi Kwarteng, James Cleverley, uh, Suella Breverman for the uh, Treasury, uh, for the Foreign Secretary job and uh, for the Home Office. Uh, I, I think there's still just a little bit of work going on uh, down at the lower end of the Cabinet table. The Times reporting uh, there's a bit of a tussle over the Attorney General job uh, at the moment uh, and, and, and right down to the sort of final positions there to be filled. Uh, I think that's the conversa kind of conversation that's going on at the moment. Now, Alex, Alex Shelbrook, when you were uh, was talking to him was talking about how Liz Truss comes from a sort of, uh, has been trying to bring together a wide breadth of support in her team. And I think she's actually done that. Uh, the question is whether or not actually those people in the Sunak team uh, feel sufficiently like she's reaching across to them. Some of them worry that she's being a little bit petty with the way that she's going about some of these appointments. But... Whilst I do hear some grumbling from Tory MPs who back Rishi Sunak, who are not willing to say so publicly, but are willing to say privately that they're uh, unhappy and a bit uh, nervous about the direction of travel, it is a minority. And I would expect at this stage things uh, to be relatively calm within the Conservative ranks. I think that the kind of conversations I was having uh, at lunchtime today with Tory MPs, perhaps who weren't natural bedfellows uh, of Liz Truss, much more sound centred around whether or not the administration that she's going to run is going to be, as it were, uh, ready uh, to, uh, to deal with uh, the massive challenges uh, that uh, uh, everyone is facing. Um, and in particular, Liz Truss has already made one big decision and you can see just there uh, the jet uh, starting to taxi along the runway of uh, Aberdeen Airport. Uh, the big decision that she's made is a bit of a, uh, a restructure inside of Downing Street uh, which kicks out quite a lot of uh, the civil servants, quite a lot of the older, uh, more experienced hands uh, who uh, were advising Boris Johnson. Uh, instead she has uh, opted to bring uh, those figures around her uh, that she's known for a long time, that are loyal to her. Many of them, many of them under 35, uh, so quite young, uh, quite um, uh, with relatively little 
government experience, uh, and they are the people that are going to be in charge of delivering for her at this point where she has so many different challenges. So the one thing that we do know as she starts uh, her journey back to London, her journey back to Westminster, is that effectively uh, she's not going to have as much uh, support from people uh, who uh, are veterans of those uh, uh, of the complexities uh, surrounding pulling the levers of power. That kind of thing, I think, is the thing that's just causing a tiny little twinge of doubt, a little bit of um, uh, a little bit of worry amongst some uh, Tory MPs. But I think that uh, she's got a fair wind behind her in the parliamentary party, judging by the conversations I was uh, having uh, this lunchtime. The Tory party's never in huge hue and cry at the point of a reshuffle. Uh, many Tory MPs still just hoping that the phone call comes from Downing Street, uh, even for a lower-ranked ministerial job over, and, and over, uh, over the next 36 hours. Indeed, as, uh, and then as we watch uh, the plane starting to move, uh, if Liz Trust has a fair wind behind her, she should be back in in Downing Street on schedule and uh, we've just had a flurry of rain here transferred itself uh, from Balmoral <laughs> and uh, if the rain persists we understand that Liz Truss will uh, make that speech inside number 10 if not she'll be out here where we're standing in front of that lectern that a few hours ago Boris Johnson made his final speech as Prime Minister one question I want to put you I mean there's so much facing Liz Truss Sam, and something that's gone away, but we know it will come back. The NHS, and that's a huge task. It's, a task. it's had its winter crisis during the summer. The ambulances piling up, the, the waiting lists, the millions upon millions uh, on those. And yet she's sticking the, the pledge she made during the hustings was to take, what, 13 billion from the NHS, that national insurance rise, and put it into social care. Whoever gets that job of health secretary has got quite a task. And we expect that, by the way, to be her very close friend, uh, Therese Coffey, who could well also uh, acquire the title Deputy Prime Minister. And I think by having a Deputy Prime Minister as health secretary, it shows that Liz Truss is going to make the NHS a priority. The NHS, I think it's fair to be said, despite, those, uh, despite that apparent pledge during the leadership campaign, we didn't hear a great deal about it over the six, seven, eight weeks uh, of the... Uh, uh, of the contest. But here's the problem for the NHS, and actually it's a problem right across public services, which is although you can put more money into the NHS, and, and Boris Johnson did. I mean, that's why he did the national insurance rise that Liz Truss is, gonna, uh, is going to reverse, and budgets have nevertheless gone up, even though uh, we're expecting Liz Truss to reverse that national insurance rise. Even though budgets have been going up for the last few years, inflation has been eating into the ability, the purchasing power of the NHS. So in effect, inflation at 8, 9, 10, 11, 12%, possibly rising to 22%, is going to have every bit the same effect, uh, making it harder for the NHS to do its job. So we're going to get very soon back to a call for the NHS to have more money, get more cash. And you pointed out what Liz Truss said uh, during the leadership contest, which was that actually some of the money earmarked for the NHS to bring down those waiting lists um, will actually go possibly a little bit quicker than expected uh, across to sort out the social care system, which she uh, identified as the problem with the NHS. Um, now, the thing about the NHS is that voters have a personal relationship with it. They understand, they can feel how well the service is doing, whether it's treating them and their family and their friends effectively or whether there are problems. And whether or not that plan uh, survives contact with the very harsh economic realities of the NHS as currently constituted, as currently funded, as it currently works, well, that, I think, is going to be a very big task. Because if Liz Truss is going to prioritise growth, then she's not putting quite the same store on, on, on things like public services. Labour, no doubt, they will want to run the next election campaign pointing out all of the failings of the, uh, uh, of the NHS under a Conservative government uh, and the squeeze on school budgets uh, and, the, and, and the problems that uh, social care uh, is facing and on and on and on in public, uh, in the challenges of public services. And it's that inflation that's the thing that's making their and that, budgets... And that's the point, isn't it? Harder. Even if the price cap is bought in and it's held, that doesn't attack inflation. That means people's real wages are falling. We're seeing all this industrial action already. Many in the public sector now, even nurses, threatening to go on strike. There could be, well, maybe not quite a winter of discontent ahead when it comes to industrial action, but some big, big problems there. 
there is an incredibly um, uh, good, strong following win for Liz Truss amongst Tory MPs, hoping it goes well. But there is no doubt that she is taking up into potentially uh, turbulent conditions uh, with all uh, of the uh, challenges with inflation, with industrial action, public sector pay, and so much else that I think will, she will have to there deal with. There we go. So Wheels quickly. up at 14.39. Uh, we'll time that flight back to London as it disappears very quickly. Shows you, <coughs> excuse me, just how low the cloud is. <clears throat> and she comes back to all those troubles. That's right. Uh, and I think that uh, <laughs> I, I think Liz Truss uh, will be glad to uh, now be uh, on the way, underway in her journey back to London. This will be the moment where uh, there are final, final preparations uh, for, uh, for her speech. She'll be putting the final finishing touches to the speech that we expect her to make just in front of that big black door uh, in front of Downing Street uh, in pretty much uh, an hour and a half. Uh, I think that she will be uh, just keeping abreast of some of the uh, tussles going on at the lower end of the cab uh, race uh, of people to stay inside her cabinet, uh, and she'll also be across the uh, energy plans. And it's worth pointing out this massive energy plan, which, as Eric Pickles was telling you earlier, will define her premiership, um, only put together, I think, in the last two uh, or so weeks. Key details only decided in the last week or so. Um, and what that means is, uh, first of all, it's very different from the kind of thing she was contemplating just four, six weeks ago. I think we're getting a very clear impression of Liz Truss as perhaps a more flexible politician than some of her rhetoric uh, would imply. But also, this is the thing that's going to define her and it's done at breakneck speed. So she's got to get it right. And that's going to bring together um, all the expertise necessary from the Treasury, from the Business Department, uh, experts in, in, in industry and those uh, advising her at the moment. So uh, this will be the thing. If she is as good at detail as some of her allies like James Cleverly and Simon Clark claim she is, this is the thing that she's got to get right so that families don't go bust this winter and the markets continue to have confidence in her and her government. OK, Sam, well, let's talk more now then about uh, families, about the effect of the cost of living crisis right now on families and <coughs> how Liz Truss intends to address that. My uh, friend, my colleague, Greg Milam, is in Warrington, uh, so-called Red Wall constituencies. And uh, Greg, tell us um, what the expectations are there for Liz Truss, Truss's leadership. Yeah, good afternoon, Dermot, from, uh, from Warrington. We're in Warrington's uh, state-of-the-art new market, actually. I'm looking at some of those uh, big issues that uh, Liz Truss will face as Prime Minister, particularly uh, here in the north. We've been talking already about NHS and social care, the, the issues facing businesses and the cost of living, of course. But what about what uh, the youth and young people are expecting from this uh, new Prime Minister? Tom Jowett is from uh, Warrington Youth Zone. Um, Tom, thanks for talking to us. First of all, tell us a bit about what you do, because it's quite striking just how much need you've identified in the community here? Yes, yeah, so we offer a state-of-the-art youth provision. Um, so that's across a seven night a week, 365 days a year, uh, where we look at breaking down the barriers for young people in terms of engagement. So we offer 20 activities a night as a standard minimum. That's from sports, arts, music, recreation. Uh, but then we also look behind the scenes of that, looking at young people who suffer from mental health illnesses, um, building up um, emotional health and wellbeing support for young people, trying to break down any barriers that young people have to engage within the youth zone or within society. And we really want to work with schools, with partners, with the council to build on those facilities. You said to me you opened a new centre in July and 5,000 people have signed up since, since July. I mean, that says a lot about the, the need that's there. Yes, yeah, so we've had over 5,100 members um, join our facility since July. So the need for young people to come to facilities like ours is absolutely critical. Now, we're part of a, a bigger... Um, operation um, so we part on side which has 14 um, youth zones within the country they're all around the northwest um, down in london up in carlisle so there's over 50,000 young people um, that we engage with every week um, across all those facilities so it's massive yeah i know liz trust visited one of those sites uh, or has visited one of those sites young people generally don't tune into political races i guess but what have you seen in in what we've heard over the last few weeks about what, what this new Prime Minister needs to do for young people in this country? We just need to make young people a priority. At the end of the day, they're taking our jobs. Uh, they're going to fulfil what I do now, what you, you're doing. So we need to put them at the top of our list. 
the end of the day, we've just had COVID. We've just come out of COVID where for two years they were kind of held back from doing everyday childhood things, um, whether you were seven, whether you were nine, or even up to 15, 16. They've had a really difficult time. So if we can support them integrating back into um, the communities, build up them social skills, and allow them to develop in whatever aspect they want to develop in, then surely that's something that we, we should be all be backing and all be contributing towards because they're the future. Um, we're doing our bit now, but they're going to take over from us. And if we don't look after them, who knows what the future will hold. Yeah, we, we've heard a lot over the years about the, the promises made to communities like Warrington, um, traditionally Labour, that, that went Conservative last time or one of the seats here. What, what have you seen in terms of young people in, in Warrington, in a, in a traditionally northern town, of the, of the kind of needs that exist at the moment? Young people need us more, more than ever. Um, so it's really important that we keep providing those facilities. We've just had a holiday club um, for young people through the summer. Um, and we offer, it's called a HALF project, so that's on the back of the Marcus Rashford campaign, uh, where we provide free um, holiday club care as well as a free meal. Um, that's all summer for four weeks, four days a week, uh, where they come to us. And we've had over 500 young people engage with us within that programme. So the need is real. That's 500 young people who are on free school meals who've needed our access every, all, all through the summer to make sure that they've got somewhere to go, something to do, and that we're giving them nutritious meals and that they're getting involved in activities. So the need is, is absolutely critical. And that's just a, a drop in the ocean of young people that we really want to engage and reach. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's real. It's there. It's something we need to act on immediately. Almost good work. Thanks very much for, no for talking Thank to us. You. That's the, the view of the uh, the youth community. As I say, we're in the new market here. It opened uh, state-of-the-art market that opened in 2020 and is is doing uh, pretty good business. Um, and let's talk to a businessman now. Uh, this is the the deli, which is one of those uh, businesses that uh, made it made its way in. I think we can, if we're allowed behind the counter, yeah. Gary, <laughs> we can talk to you. Um, thanks for talking to us. A, a new prime minister. What are your hopes today? Well, they've got to sort the energy out for us one way or the other. Um, I don't know how she's going to do it, but she needs to get it done. Why they're charging extra on standard charge, why they've tied electricity going through the roof when it doesn't need to, because it's tied to the gas. You've got diesel that's as cheap as anything, but still pay, we're paying through the nose for the forecourts. There's a lot of people making money that shouldn't be, and it's going to the rich again. And I mean the super rich. How is it hitting your bill? Give us an idea well, of what, what's happened to it's you. It's doubled my lecky bill a month. I'm paying uh, nearly £700-£750 a month now. I was only paying £350. Um, that has an impact, and they've already told us that in April, we've, luckily we're capped till then, or we're, we're safe, uh, it's going to double. So that's £1,500. I couldn't support that. And I know lads that have got chip shops and high energy users, they don't know what they're going to do. We're hearing this week there's going to be a promise of help. There's going to be there's going to be a freeze on those things. If if that comes, if if Liz Truss's first act as prime minister is to to solve this problem, what would you say to? Them? Thank you, but they need to look at our energy supply. We've got wind farms, but nowhere to store the energy because they got rid of it. The gas we used to have them, they stopped that. Everything's so short-sighted. We need, like I say, why is the electricity gone up? We've got wind farms. We built them. They're there. It's only going round, they're not costing anything to run. So why are they charging us so much? And this is all we get is they're gonna reinvest in the, the, the structure. But how many times have we heard that when the prices have gone up? They need to be capping. If your bill if I was giving you an electricity bill of hundred pounds and I was making ten pounds, fine. It's now jumped to two hundred. I'm making twenty pounds now. What was wrong with making the ten pound? They're making it easier for everyone. They're still making the money, still plan for the investment. What more do you want? Well, we'll see what happens later in the week. Gary, thanks Thank for you. talking to us. That's a view shared by many inside uh, the market here. And of course now it is Liz Truss's problem to solve. Greg, thank you very much indeed. Greg Milam live there in Warrington. Well, Liz Truss will uh, arrive here this afternoon. We just saw her plane take off from Aberdeen, so it won't be long. Facing some of the most serious challenges that uh, a UK Prime Minister has seen outside wartime. And she's expected to draw up plans to try to tackle the crisis, including, of course, a freeze on energy bills that could cost something like £100 billion, maybe more than that. Well, joining me now to discuss this more is the chief executive of the New Economics Foundation, Miata Fanbula. Very good to talk to you, Miata Fanbula. Well, it seems from 
from what we're hearing and have been hearing for a few days, we're now getting more details about it, when it comes to an energy cap price freeze, they're more or less going to steal Labour's clothes. I mean, yes, they are. Um, and it's a big intervention. It's being briefed that it's not just for six months, as Labour proposed, but it's potentially for 18 months, which is a huge, huge intervention, a very expensive intervention as well. And I think the question for me is who pays? With Labour's pro proposal, it was very clear that they were going to turn to energy giants that had been making excess profits in order to tax them, in order to pay for this. At the moment, it seems like the proposal is that we, the consumer, will be paying paying this through bills that will be higher for the next 20 years. And that doesn't seem fair when, again, there are profits that can be capped in order to plug the hole for this. You are, of course, I, I understand me, at, uh, uh, applying to be or have already been accepted as a Labour candidate for the next election. Correct me if I'm wrong. So, so just how much further would Labour go? So, I mean, I think in terms of... Labour, they've got to sort of decide where they want to take this. They've proposed a six-month cap, which is where the government is. The idea that we are trying to push at the New Economics Foundation is to um, essentially uh, put in place free basic energy, where you say to people, for the first slug of energy you use, everyone, that's free, and then you pay more if you use more energy. And that does the job of protecting people. It ensures that everyone basically has energy to afford the basics. It protects low-income households that tend to to use less energy, but it also incentivizes us to use less energy. And then you combine that with a big national effort to reduce the energy we use by insulating our homes. That, for me, feels like a package, which, by the way, is a fraction of the cost of the price freeze that the government's talking about, that would be something that we could have in place for the next two, three years, but potentially something that we could have in place permanently. That's a very interesting point. I mean, are there any countries where that operates, where you get your first slug of energy free and then you pay more depending on how much you use and is it difficult to administer so India has it. Um, Italy has a similar version, but with less subsidy um, from the state, because there would be about a £14 billion subsidy there. But there are countries that have this, uh, particularly countries that are poorer, where essentially you're having to insulate people um, against the cost of something that is an essential good. But for us, we sort of compared this with the idea of freezing energy bills for the medium term. We actually think it's a more efficient proposal that does the job of protecting people, which you absolutely must do, guarantees everyone access to energy to do the basics because you don't want to have to choose whether you heat your home or feed your kids because you can't get your cooker on. But critically, if you use more energy, it incentivizes you to get your home insulated in order to reduce the demand. But just um, let me go back to that point you made about... Um being unable to feed your kids. And, you know, the, part of the cost of that is not just about the energy to heat that food. It's getting your hands on the food in the first place. And this is where soaring inflation comes in. It goes way beyond a fuel cost crisis. Inflation seems to be baked into the system for the moment. Some economists predicting it could hit 20 22% later on. Is there anything that any government can do about that? So I think in the short term, we've got to buckle down uh, because inflation is going to be tough and you've got to protect people. And for me, you know, there is a piece around a universal payment, a cost of living allowance. If, for example, you were to introduce a much tougher windfall tax on energy producers, we think you could raise about 22 billion. That would essentially allow every household to have 750 pounds to cover the wider cost of living. And so for me, something like that product provides short term protection whilst we ride this period. You know, if you do things on energy, that will help people. And then you do things to kind of deal with the wider cost of living crisis that's been driven by the aftermath of the pandemic, it's been driven by the fact that we've got constraints around grain, and that hopefully provides protection for families in the round. There are concerns, though, aren't there, about the scale of the borrowing that this all might take, because this is open-ended. No one knows how long energy is going to continue to rise or even stay at these levels. And, of course, as we just discussed, where inflation is going. 
Yeah, so look, this is a challenge. And, you know, my view is on this, uh, it seems that the Trust Administration probably has it right, which is this is a major crisis. It is akin to the sort of crisis we had in the pandemic or in 2008 or indeed a war. It is the sort of thing that if you don't grip will be absolutely catastrophic for families, but critically will completely cripple our economy. And for me, staving that off in the long term will be far more cost effective than saying we can't do anything, we won't borrow, we'll just let it happen. So yes, there will be a big hit, but you know, interest rates are still relatively low, particularly when you compare it to where we've been over the last 20, 30 years, the cost of borrowing is still relatively cheap. So you do have headroom in order to do that, in order to protect people in the short term and insulate the economy in the long term. But the critical thing is, whatever the government does, it can't just be about short term relief. It's got to drive long term structural change. So, you know, if you freeze bills for the short term in the energy market, you've got to combine it with energy efficiency. You've got to combine it with energy security and getting to a world where more of the energy we own is actually produced and is done at affordable levels rather than what we're seeing at the moment where there is huge, huge profiteering off the back of an essential utility. OK, Miat Panbrula, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we're coming back to me live here in Downing Street because uh, one of the new cabinet we expect is just arriving in there. Prime Minister Therese Coffey? That was, uh, of course, Therese Coffey, as you heard, our very experienced shouter, I'll call him. Our deputy political editor, Sam Coates, is here with me. Therese Coffey, one of the key allies and friends of Liz Truss, widely tipped to have a senior role in the Cabinet, perhaps, uh, Sam, as, as Health Secretary. That's right. And potentially, as I was just asking Therese Coffey, no answer, Deputy Prime Minister. Now, they're both Norfolk MPs, Liz Truss and Therese Coffey. They are firm friends. They have been... Uh, Therese Coffey at Liz Truss's side all the way through this campaign. It is that, for that reason, that Therese Coffey has gone into Downing Street before Liz Truss even has returned. Her plane has even landed uh, from Scotland. Uh, Therese Coffey, who is perhaps perceived as being from a slightly different wing of the Conservative Party uh, to Liz Truss, um, and was accompanying her uh, on Monday after it was announced that she was going to become Prime Minister uh, in her first visit to uh, Conservative headquarters. She is the person that Liz Truss likes most to have at her side of all of her colleagues. So she will be incredibly influential, an important figure. Uh, she, of course, was a key cabinet minister under Boris Johnson. So waiting for Liz Truss as she arrives here for the first time as prime minister. What tone does Liz Truss have to strike in that speech? Ambition, uh, reassurance, uh, and a sense that she knows exactly the direction that she's going to take people in. She wants to do a lot of change. She knows she doesn't have a long time to get the tone right and the substance right. It's a hell of, an, uh, a, hell of a task. She's been working on it for weeks. Uh, this afternoon is her first very big moment as Prime Minister. OK, Sam, thank you very much indeed. Much more from you and me to come. Sam Coates, a deputy political editor. You're watching Sky News live from Downing Street. We're staying right here. Much more from here with Prime Minister Liz Truss now in the air on her way back to London after she was formally appointed Prime Minister by Her Majesty the Queen in Balmoral. Much more coverage to come.
This is Sky News live from Downing Street.